Hello everyone, in today's video I will be narrating stories that I found off of reddit. If you enjoyed this video make sure you subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. Before we begin this video I would just like to let you know about my new store page which can be viewed on my channel page. So if you're interested in buying anything and buy something it's greatly appreciated. Thank you. But without further ado, let's get straight into these stories. For a bit of backstory, my mom was dating an abusive guy at the time. We'll call him Ian. Because of Ian and the crazy fights they had gotten into, we couldn't lock up my house at all. He had kicked in both the front and the back door to the house and they never fixed. My mother and Ian were at the bar all day, every day. I told you this so you would know why the house wasn't locked up and where my parents were when this happened. This incident occurred when I was around 12 years old and my little brother around 10. I was a really small girl at this age and my brother was sick all the time so he was very tiny and frail. My mother and Ian were at the bar as usual. When you opened my front door, it put you in the living room and you could see the back door. There was a hallway to the right that led back into the bedrooms, and that is where my brother and I were. We were in his bedroom with the door closed playing something on a PlayStation. It was around midnight or 1am and we were playing and having a good time when I heard a weird noise. My brother didn't hear it and I didn't want to creep him out. I told him that I wanted to go get a drink and told him to stay in the room and I would bring him something. To get to my kitchen, you would have to walk down the hallway in front of both the front and back door because it was behind the living room. I kept hearing strange noises so before I left out of my brother's room, I told him to get into the closet and work on our fort so that it would be ready when I was done getting our drinks and a snack. I raised my little brother for the most part and took care of him. I had a terrible feeling, a sense of dread. I could tell something wasn't right and this was a way to get my brother to hide without scaring him. He frightened easily and had really bad asthma attacks and at this time we had no inhaler or his breathing treatment machine for him. I knew if he started having an asthma attack on top of being scared, it wouldn't be pretty. Anyway, I left the back room and decided to see what was going on. I started sneaking up the hallway as slowly and quietly as I could. I was terrified. I could feel that something was wrong. Before I made it to the end of the hallway, I hear a man. It sounded like he was grunting. I can't explain it, but the feeling that washed over me made me near puke. So I of course freeze. I have no one in this town. I don't know anyone and my dad is living in a different state. My mom is at the bar drunk. I was sitting there trying to gather the courage to see what was around the corner and going over my options when I hear my brother's door open. He sees me and the look on my face and freezes. I remember his eyes going so wide with fear because he must have heard the grunting too. I motion him with my hands to go back in the room and he does. I gathered the courage to peek around the corner and what I saw still freaks me out to this day. It was horrifying. I saw a man, probably around 6 foot 2, sitting on my couch with a grin on his face. By some stupid luck that man didn't see me. I slowly snuck back to my brother's room. I slowly shut the door and started going over my options. My little brother was already horrified because of the grunting noise this man was making. I am so thankful he wasn't the one who saw what was out there. I gathered myself and calmly told him that there was a man that I didn't know on the couch and he needed to be very quiet and I needed him to be brave and keep his breathing in check. My little brother adored me and looked up to me so when I told him that I needed him to be brave, he tried his best. I told him not to move and he didn't. The first thing I tried was the window, but it wouldn't budge. It was completely stuck. I made making myself stay calm for my brother's sake but I know what's sitting out there. So since the window was stuck, I decided to start looking for a weapon. My oldest brother lived here and I knew he had swords somewhere. I don't remember where he was. As I'm looking for a weapon I hear the man saying, I know you're here. My stomach nodded up, the hair on the back of my neck raised and I instantly got a cold sweat. And then I hear it. My little brother had started wheezing. Asthma attack. I hugged him, reminded him about being brave and told him to sit still and focus on his breathing. I started frantically trying to get my window open. but. It it was stuck. I looked around and started moving blankets when I find my older brother's cell phone that he always forgot. I remember thinking that I was lucky and felt a bit of relief. I immediately called the police and told them what was going on, hysterical at this point but still remaining quiet. The dispatcher told me to remain on the phone so she could hear what was happening when the man started banging on our bedroom door. It had been about 5 minutes into the phone call when this happened and I could no longer remain calm. I had lost it. I started screaming. I forgot to mention that our bedroom had the only working lock, so the door was locked, he was trying to get in and banging on the door. His banging got louder and louder. He was screaming to let him in when it went completely silent. Then he did the creepiest, most terrifying thing ever. He started laughing. He then says, you know I could just bust down this door in about two seconds, right little girl? He then starts lightly knocking on the door and asking me to open it. Then I hear the police start screaming at him to get on the ground, put his hands up, etc. I heard him putting up a fight, followed by more yelling and eventually silence. 
After a few minutes, there was a knock on my door, but at this point, I was too terrified to open it. I thought that this nightmare guy was still there. So being in my hysterical state, I started screaming, no, 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 please, over and over again, sobbing and shaking. I couldn't stay brave for my little brother anymore. I was on the floor holding him this whole time, convinced we were going to die. Eventually, I calmed myself a bit, and this time a female officer was at the door, so I opened it. There were about five cops standing in the hallway listening to me being hysterical. I refused to let go of my brother at this point, but we both ran to this female officer and just collapsed, sobbing hysterically. We had been so scared. It turns out this guy was completely wasted and high on drugs. I remember the cops walking me up to him and having me stand in front of him to ask me if I knew this man. I didn't. The man's eyes were completely bloodshot and filled with hatred. My parents were called and investigated for leaving us alone like that and for the doors being like that. My mom is a different person now, doesn't drink and is now married to a cop. She completely changed. I remember asking her about it later on and she told me something that I didn't know. The man had a huge knife, so that's what he was scraping the door with. He also had some rope, tape, and a tarp. I still don't know how he didn't get to us, or why he didn't just bust the door down to get us. It would have taken one half kick from him to kick the door down. It was super thin. So hopefully I will never have to endure that horrible experience again. This story starts around the fall of 2017. I was walking back to work from lunch when I passed this girl and noticed she got up and started walking behind me. She took a different route and didn't follow me. A few days later, it happened again, but this time she was following me. I assumed she wasn't following me at the time because where my office building is situated, you have to go up a set of stairs and pass a few other buildings and she did not follow me up to my building. After a while, I noticed we took the same train home. A lot of the time, she would be watching me. When we made eye contact, she'd look away. Then she'd continue looking when she thought I wasn't looking. There's a Whole Foods across from my office. I went there for lunch a couple times during the week. I started seeing the girl sitting in the window for lunch and she would almost always get up as soon as I left and walk the same way I did. Around this time, I began seeing her more frequently. During lunchtime or when I got to the metro, she was almost always there. After a couple of months of this, I started noticing that she would get off at the same station as me sometimes. Sometimes she would walk the same way as me. Once I got to my place, I live in a condo with my brother. She would always pass by but never follow me up to the entrance. During this time, I started receiving phone calls at work from random phone numbers that, at the time, I assumed was spam. There would either be silence on the other end or the person would hang up immediately. I also started receiving fake Facebook requests from people I already knew or were already on my friends list. December of 2017 comes. By this time, I'm not going to Whole Foods as often. If she gets off at the same station as me, I go into a restaurant or go shopping for groceries before I go home. Around this time, an old friend I went to high school with contacts me kind of out of the blue, said she wanted to follow me on Instagram. We text a couple of times and I accept her follow request. She contacts me again about a month later from a different number, but this time she's texting me frequently. I'm talking about every day slash every other day. I'm not one to be mean or show when I'm annoyed too often, but after months of this when she asks me if she's texting me too frequently, I don't hesitate to tell her that she could lay off a bit. She stops for a week or so, then starts texting frequently again. This whole ordeal should have sent red flags up for several reasons. During this time, she would ask me so many random questions. Like, what would you do when you're trying to get to know someone? She would ask for selfies, which I declined because I don't like taking pictures of myself. And I would tell her that there are plenty of pictures of me on Facebook. She would ask what I'm doing on the weekends and the names of my friends on occasion, which I wouldn't tell her because I thought it was weird that she'd want to know my friends' names. I only sent her a couple of videos of fun things I'd do, but that's it. August 2018 rolls around. I am still seeing creepy girl everywhere during the week. I get pulled into my boss's office. He says that a few co-workers received fake screenshots from Facebook of me talking badly about them. Now, I never post on Facebook and would never talk bad about my co-workers on social media. I don't have a grudge with anyone, nor do I know of anyone who has a problem with me. I managed to clear things up with everyone involved and still had my job. Of course, my friend is still texting me fairly frequently and I tell her what happened a couple days later when I got home from work. I tell her I don't want to get much into it, but she keeps pushing for details. I finally told her I was going to go to bed and she got the message. The more I thought about all the time she texted me, the more uneasy I got. Some things that she said just didn't make sense, especially from the way I remembered her. We had kept in touch over the years, just not as frequently and we hadn't touched base for a while before I heard from her in December. A couple of weeks later, I decided to reach out to my friend on Instagram. 
but the Instagram she last messaged me through wasn't there. However, there was still an Instagram for her I followed and that follows me back. I reach out to her and ask what her phone number was. Phone number is completely different and it turns out that she was never the one texting me nor did she request following me on Instagram. I track the number and it turns out to be one of those fake phone number apps. I request to be blocked from the service and I never hear from my friend again. After talking about it with my brother and a couple of friends, I'm almost 100% certain it was the girl that's been following me. These things only started after she appeared. The phone calls to my office, the fake Facebook request, etc. A few days before I was pulled aside by my boss, my friend texted me and told me that she had a weird feeling about me and wanted to make sure I was okay. I just thought that she was being weird at the time and didn't think much to it. This whole ordeal is really scary when I look back on it because I sent videos of myself and my address at one point. My friend even confirmed a post my brother made with pictures he tagged of me on Facebook. I was texting a stranger for 8 months about my life and they also apparently have access to my Facebook page. She doesn't follow me anymore but when she did see me on the metro, she would always sit somewhere that she was able to make eye contact with me. I'm always careful now if anyone texts me from an unrecognizable phone number. I just hope that she decided to forget me and move on. About 5 or so years ago, I was 23 at the time and had just gotten out of my first and only serious relationship a year prior. That guy was my first love so needless to say when things ended and he had zero interest in trying to work things out, I was heartbroken. After about a year of moping around, I decided to try actual dating. I met this guy Rick on a dating website. He was a couple of years older than me, was an ex-marine, and good at making conversation. After a few days of talking online, he asked for my number and we decided to meet up. I drove to his house and come to find out he lived with a few other guys who looked really shady. Now he actually lived in a good neighborhood, but the way they kept their home and the way his roommates looked was my first red flag that a inexperienced and naive girl would not fit in his crowd but I decided to stay and give it a chance. Once he saw me, he came up, gave me a hug, and handed me a helmet to his motorcycle. Now I have never in my life rode a motorcycle before but I had always wanted to, so I thought why not and hopped on. Now the street he decides to take me up is known to be a very long and windy road that is pretty secluded. It's also important to note that this is the springtime and it's about 5 p.m. when we go on our ride. I didn't realize at the time he had decided to take me on that specific road, but once we got on it, my red flag started to kick in. I began to realize that, one, it is dead silent and there are no other cars on this road right now, two, it started to get dark, and three, yeah, I don't know this guy so what am I doing, and my alarm bells start ringing. Once my anxiety kicked in, I told him that I think we should turn around and go home. He started laughing and asked if I was scared and I said no, I just need to head home because my parents are expecting me for dinner soon. He kept riding forward. More alarm bells ringing. Pictures of me lying dead in a ditch came up. I kept asking can we please turn back and he finally gave in and turned around. The next day comes and I told myself that maybe I was just overreacting and he was harmless and decided to agree on a second date a few days later. We met up at a sports bar for dinner and a couple of beers so we can watch the hockey game. The entire time we were sitting there, Rick has his arm around me and has me literally attached to his hip, constantly trying to make out with me and is acting extremely possessive. At this point I'm completely freaked out because I barely know this guy and all he is talking to me about is our future future and how he would be such a protected boyfriend because he was an ex-marine. At this point I knew I was done with him but unfortunately my car is at his house. When we are done and head home, he insists that I come inside and hang out for a bit. I decide to walk in and stay for 5 minutes. We walk into his room and he immediately pounces on me, making out with me and trying to feel me up. I kept pushing his hands away and kept telling him that I needed to get going but I could tell he wasn't going to give up until he got what he wanted, especially after I realized his little friend was aroused. He told me that he would not let me leave until we did something. I said screw this and was able to bolt out of his door and sped home. After that night he tried to ask me to hang out again and I told him that I think it would be best if we stayed friends. This guy began to relentlessly call me and text me and beg me to see him, then proceeded to call me names because I was ignoring him, then would apologize for calling me said names and it was because he liked me so much, so I blocked him. Then he tried to message me on Instagram, so I blocked him on there, and then on Facebook, and finally on Snapchat. I never gave Rick any more attention and moved on.
This story happened to me about six months ago. I have lived where I lived for three years. It's a nice apartment in an amazing location, but they were built in the late 90s. In the last few years, the city I live in has had a massive population boom and people have been non-stop pouring in. Good weather, amazing economy, cool place to do stuff always. Because of this, I have seen the landlord staff start to do heavy maintenance on the apartments to bring them up to date to attract more people to them. My neighbor lived in his apartment for something like six years before he ended up buying a house and moved. When he moved, the landlord immediately started redoing his apartment as one to bring up to date. The way that the apartment layout is, is that there are two stories. Where my bedroom is, on the direct other side of the bedroom wall is the staircase in my neighbor's apartment. The way my bedroom layout is, has my bed right up against the wall. They were completely stripping this place clean. It was one of the first ones that they did such heavy remodeling to. For weeks, I would always see the workers over there painting and redoing the floors, etc. A few days before this happened was no different. I left and saw them doing maintenance in the kitchen, and when I came home from work, they were gone for the day. Nothing unusual for a single bit. The part that is unusual, though, is what happened one particular night. I was awake around 1 a.m. watching TV in my room when I heard someone on the other side of the wall slowly walking up up the stairs, and very obviously stopping halfway up. Where the person was stopping was directly where my head laid on the other side of the wall. I could feel him listening to me breathing. I immediately turned the TV sound off and sat there extremely quiet and still. I heard nothing for a few minutes, and then after what felt like an absolute eternity, I heard the person start walking the rest of the stairs to the second floor. It was very obvious that someone was on the other side of that wall listening to me. I also knew that it was only a few days before this happened that I saw the maintenance redoing that apartment's kitchen. I knew that there was no way someone already moved in that fast. I quietly got out of bed and went to a room where I had a better view of the outside of the apartment. I obviously couldn't see if there was movement in there from the window, but I had a good angle to see if anyone walked out. I sat there for around 15 minutes just staring outside to see if I saw anything at all, nothing. I went back into my room and laid down in bed again. I didn't play the TV, I just sat there waiting to hear something again. I was messing around on my phone for around 20 minutes in silence until I heard movement in the stairs again. This time though, the movement didn't start from the top or the bottom. The movement started in the middle of the staircase, meaning that the entire time I was sitting there in silence, this person was just on the other side of the wall listening to my every move. This terrified me, so I called the cops. I gave them all the information of what was going on and they informed me someone would be out very soon. I went back to the one room and watched out the window again. Only a few moments later, a police car pulled up and a cop got out to examine the building in the apartment. Only a few moments later, a police car pulled up and a cop got out to examine the building and the apartment. He was looking around and shining his light in the windows. I heard him knock on the door and shortly after could hear him talking to someone, but couldn't make out what they were saying. I was totally puzzled by this. The officer walked over to my door and knocked. I went downstairs and he informed me very nicely that someone just moved in there. I laughed and was completely embarrassed. I even said to the cop that it was a heck of a way to meet your new neighbor. I felt embarrassed, but more importantly felt very relieved about the entire situation. I brushed off the whole thing as it just being late and my mind playing massive tricks on me. The next day I went to leave my apartment when I saw something that made me stop dead in my tracks. I went outside and only took a few steps towards my car when I saw maintenance over there carrying out the old refrigerator. I was puzzled. I walked over to the apartment and I looked in the door that was wide open. The kitchen was still being worked on and not a single piece of furniture could be seen. I was legitimately speechless. I walked over to a maintenance man and said, didn't someone move in here? And he informed me no and that the apartment wouldn't be ready for showings until at least three weeks. I ran back upstairs into my apartment and called my landlord. I asked her if someone is staying there and she said absolutely not. I told her about what I experienced the night before. She was floored. She told me that they would change that apartment's locks immediately. She also suggested that I call the non-emergency line to the police department and inform them that no one lives there. I did just that and they asked me to come down to the station. I told them all of the information and detail of what happened. They were able to quickly figure out what officer came out to check out the situation so he could help identify the person who answered the door. The officer described the man in detail and I confirmed that I had never seen him around 
the apartments before. There was a search around town for a few weeks until the whole thing just sort of fizzled out and I stopped hearing about it and started seeing less and less patrol cars randomly in the parking lot. After that night, I never heard another thing in that apartment. Around a month later, an older couple moved in and they are very nice. When I saw the moving van pull up, I went out to introduce myself to them. But to be completely honest, the only reason I went out there was to see if any of them matched the description of who the cops saw. Not even close. I'm certain that the person who was in that apartment got away with it. I had an extremely hard time sleeping the following weeks of that happening to me. I actually ended up moving my bed into the smaller second bedroom because it bothered me so much. I have zero idea of what the intentions were of the person or what they were doing on that staircase. I am a proud Floridian. At the time of this story, early 2000s, I was going to college in South Florida and lived with my family in my hometown in the Florida Panhandle. It's about a 7 hour drive up through Central Florida to get between the two places, so I mostly only went home for the holidays. It was the Thanksgiving in my junior year, and I was excited that I had managed to rearrange my midterms to be able to leave campus three days ahead of everyone else. I was expecting to beat the masses of traffic and was hoping for a quick trip back home. My roommates wanted to have a last meal together before we all left for break. So I ate in the campus dining hall around 4 p.m. and I set off on my journey around 5.30 p.m. Around 10 p.m. I had just passed my two-third mark, where I always stopped at this little mom and pops type of diner by the side of the highway to grab a snack, use the restroom, and called my dad to let him know I was okay, I didn't have a cell phone yet. Well, I hadn't been there since summer and the place was out of business, so a little bummed out that I wasn't getting my chocolate pancakes. I just kept going. There really wasn't much built up around there at the time, so when I saw signs for a rest stop in, of all the places on this green earth, some town called Alachua, so I went for it. So I went and parked directly under the street light for safety and used the facilities, called my dad, etc. I didn't see anyone else there, except for a very exhausted looking woman who approached me asking for directions, saying she was with her husband and two small children from Virginia and they had made a wrong turn trying to get to Disney. So I left the rest area and was walking back to my car when I noticed a beat up, unmarked, grey or bluish work van parked very close to the driver's side of my 95 Honda Civic. Yeah okay, I thought that's pretty weird. It had Florida tags on it so it couldn't have been the ladies I talked to in the bathroom. I distinctly remember she said she was from Virginia. I turned around and hightailed it back to the rest stop, promptly running into some random middle aged guy with two little boys. Getting to talk to him, it turned out it was his wife I had spoken to as she emerged from the bathroom a second later, and I felt comfortable speaking to him. I told him what was going on with the van and how I didn't know what to do. He said he'd go check it out, so he left the kids with his wife and strutted up to the driver's side of the van. He stood there for a moment before speaking, his voice awkwardly quivered, but we could hear him yell it from where we were standing some 100 feet away. Excuse me gentlemen, we already called the police so I'm gonna have to politely suggest that you get out of here. And then he ran back to us, grabbed his wife and kids, pointed to me with a swift you, and said come on let's all get in the car now and we ran together. So here I was confusedly sitting in the back of the stranger's SUV while he went and used the payphone to presumably call the police. Meanwhile the van peeled out of there. Like I have never seen someone get out of there quite like they got out of there. They ran up on the curb on their way out. They burned rubber. It was almost comical. The cops got there and I found out what happened. The man went to go check out the van and he could see in it pretty well because I had parked under the street light. The first thing he noticed was that all the seats except for the driver's seat had been removed. There was a guy sitting in the driver's seat and a guy sitting in the back. A tarp laid out in the back and a bunch of other random items back there he couldn't immediately identify. Neither of the guys were reading a newspaper or a map or anything. They were apparently both just sitting there. I'd say I was around 8 at the time this took place. At the time, we had to get mail from the post office in town, and so seeing my mom get the mail, my brain decided, wow, I want to be cool and get the mail like mom. That childish need to prove that I was mature. Eventually, after time and time of begging, my mom let me get the mail. I'd guess it was a weekend as the post office was closed, but you could still grab mail, just no people that worked there were there. I asked my mom if I could grab the mail as we slowly pulled up outside the post office. She nodded and gave me the keys that had the mail key and a few others. I jumped out of the old van and ran up the ramp to the building, avoiding the stairs completely. I opened the door and saw a lady and a man getting their mail, but turning to my side, I saw an older man sitting in the corner staring at me. He gave me weird vibes even as a kid, but still I gave him a quick smile and wave. Bad move. 
The man smiled back, revealing his stained teeth. I walked past him and went to the mailbox. Me being me though, I forgot what key was what and began fumbling awkwardly as the others grabbing mail left the building. After maybe 3-5 to five minutes of trying and failing, I finally unlocked it. I was so happy that I disregarded the man staring as I grabbed the mail. With a quick click of the lock, I closed the box and began to walk away. I found the gaze of the man as he looked at me, a crooked smile across his face. I put my open hand against the door and began to push when a pair of arms reached around me. One hand forcefully pulling the door shut and the other around the upper part of my chest, like my collarbone, pulling me into a tight, unwelcome and horrible hug. I froze. What was I supposed to do? I was always taught to respect adults and I did. He had a strong scent of alcohol on him, so much I think I coughed a few times. He began to speak after a moment of just holding me there. The words he spoke scared me really bad. He then said, Man, hey, where are you going? He spoke almost passive aggressively. Me, oh, I have to go. My mom was waiting for me. Man, oh, okay. He sounded defeated and began to let me go. Before I could break away, he held me tighter again, tighter than before. Wait, wait, wait. I have a dog you know, he had a grin on his face. Me, oh that's cool. Man, yeah, and you should come with me and you can play with him. I almost went with him at that moment, but luckily something told me not to. The next maybe eight minutes he had let me go and pulled me back hard into him, his dirty coat brushing against me. He kept telling me to go with him. Finally, he seemed to snap. Man, alright, you're coming with me. Me, what? But I need my mom. I have her keys and she's waiting for me, please. That was still my priority, her keys and mail. Man, nope, you're coming with me now. He opened the door and began to pull me out. In a moment of his weakness, I broke away, running to my mom in her car. I slammed the door shut, scaring my brother and my mother. I began shaking and crying, dropping the mail on the car floor. I picked it up and handed everything to my mom as she demanded to know what happened. I told her everything and she looked pissed. I was so glad that she was on my side. I looked outside, tears still streaming down my face, and noticed the man look at me through the car window from the top ramp of the building. I began to cry harder and panic as he started coming over. My mom stopped me as she noticed him coming. He fell at the bottom of the ramp and tripped. My mom laughed at the creep and started driving away, while she tried to comfort me saying things like, he was a harmless old drunk man and he didn't hurt you. I'm pretty sure I knew what his intentions were towards my younger self, and I'm just glad that I was able to get away from the man. This happened in 2015 when I was 16 and still living in my hometown, a forgotten little beach town in the middle of nowhere that's so remote it's probably not even known by surrounding areas. Basically, there's three things you can do there as a teenager. Go to the movies, swim, or go to this pathetic little place called Miller's Fun Park. It's relatively similar to a lot of fun park type things, only a whole lot worse. There's a crappy arcade with broken skee-ball machines, batting cages that probably haven't been used since the early 80s, a pathetic mini golf course, and the most dangerous dangerous go-karts you've probably ever seen in your life. Miller's Fun Park is on the edge of a field. On the opposite side of the field, about three miles down is the beach, and across the single street are woods. If our town is in the middle of nowhere, Miller's is practically on the moon. My cousin Emma and I decided one summer night that we wanted to go go-karting. It was around 10pm, so we knew it'd be almost deserted, but that was the way we liked it. I picked her up from her house and we made the long drive down. Once we had arrived and parked in the nearly empty parking lot, we hopped out of the car and paid for some go-karting tickets. The same people had worked there forever. There was no one there except for a few boys in the arcade and a guy who looked to be in his 60s sitting on a bench near the batting cages. Emma and I paid him no mind and went to the go-kart track. Like I said, these carts were incredibly dangerous, so I was focused on nothing but making sure I wasn't going to skid and flip as we raced way too fast around the windy track. This is why I didn't notice the guy walking over to the fence and why I didn't notice him watching us until we pulled into the lanes after our last lap. He was standing on the other side of the fence, right where I parked. He stared at me with the most unsettling expression, a weird smile with dark eyes. I managed an uneasy smile back, handed another ticket to the guy running the go-karts, who was obviously higher than a kite, and Emma and I went off again. This time I couldn't focus. The dude gave me the worst type of feeling. My eyes were constantly finding their way to the metal fence where he stood, unmoving and watching us every time we were in his view. And the thing that was bothering me the most was we only had bought three tickets. We were on our second to last run and he was standing directly next to the exit 
Lisa gate. I was just praying that he'd move before we were done, but of course, no such luck. Our last go came and went, and I had no choice but to pull in next to him, unbuckle my seatbelt, and get out of my go-kart. I glanced over at Emma a few feet away as I opened the exit gate to see if she was as scared as I was, but she didn't seem to notice as she bounced over and bragged about how she had beat me the last two times. I was barely listening. I opened the gate, and the guy stepped in front of me just as I was leaving. Hey there, he said. His voice was dry, and he smelled of cigarettes. What are you girls doing all alone here? My eyes darted over to Emma, who was looking at the dude with both confusion and annoyance. Uh, what? She said, pushing past the gate so she stood beside me. It's so late. His tone was as hungry as his eyes, and he reminded me of a snake. Do your parents know that you're out? Yes, I answered quickly. They're waiting for us, actually. We need to get going. This was a lie and probably sounded like it from my tone, but I tried to push past him anyway. It didn't work. He grabbed my shoulder to keep me in front of him. Nonsense. I saw you girls pull up alone. My heart dropped to my stomach. He had? Are you heading out? Why don't I walk you to your car? He starts inching towards me and I look to Emma for help. With one swift movement, she pulled me halfway behind her and started sizing the guy up. This was pretty dumb as we're both small, and though she's a few inches taller than me, neither of us are anywhere near his size. This guy clears six foot too easy, but she doesn't seem to care. Actually, we were just headed to the arcade, she says harshly. Her boyfriend is going to meet us here. I did have a boyfriend at the time, but he wasn't coming. He wasn't even in town, and I knew that she knew this. The guy's face immediately changes. His smile disappeared, and he now was glaring down at me with a look of annoyance in his eyes. I felt myself start to cower. Boyfriend, he says roughly. Emma didn't give me time to say anything. She grabbed my arm and tugged me behind her into the arcade. The boys from before had already left, and the usual girl who worked in there was nowhere to be found. Still, it felt safer than outside. We ran to the back and hid behind the claw machine. What do we do? I left my phone in my car, I whisper shouted. There was no way I was going out there alone, and the go-kart guy had already disappeared into the small ticket shack. I don't have mine either, I left it charging, she said, face palming. We're just gonna have to make a run for it. Are you crazy? He's probably waiting for us in the parking lot. What about the guy who runs the go-karts? We could get him to walk us out, she said. I just shook my head. He's as high as Mount Everest right now. I don't want to risk running all the way to the ticket stand for nothing. Then we have no choice. She stood up pulling me with her. Let's go. I swallowed hard wanting to cry. I'd never been that scared before. There was something so wrong about that guy. We made our way out of the arcade, looking around to see if he's nearby. The park was now absolutely deserted. Emma practically had to drive me to the exit. I was looking every direction every second, waiting for the guy to come out of the woods or something and pounce on us at any second. But he didn't. Everything was still. Get your keys out, Emma instructed, and I pulled them from my pocket. We were about 20 feet from my car when I stopped dead in my tracks. What, she whispered. I stared at the car keys in hand. I had never locked it. I never locked the car, Emma. What? I didn't lock it. What if? I trailed off, but she knew what I was saying. She started inching towards the car, and I grabbed her arm to stop her, but she pulled me away. I'm just going to peek. If I say run, you run. Her voice is quiet. I nodded shakily. She eventually made it close enough to see inside, but by the way she was squinting, I knew it was too dark to make anything out. My heart was beating out of my chest. What if he's in there? All these thoughts almost drown out. The unmistakable sound of shoes slamming against the pavement. My head whipped around instantly and there he was, sprinting at us at full speed out of the woods. I screamed bloody murder and broke for the car, jiggling the handle as I realized I had locked it. Emma was already on the other side, screaming at me to unlock it. I fumbled with the keys but managed not to drop them as I unlocked the door, flung it open, and practically threw myself inside. I just managed to close the door when he was there, slamming his fists against the window and shouting incoherently. I was sobbing at this point and barely managed to lock the doors as he goes for the handle and yanks on it as hard as he can. Emma was screaming at me to go, and through my tears, I shoved the key into the ignition and flew into reverse. He was still chasing us and yelling as I veered backwards out of the lot and turned as fast as I could while slamming on the gas. I was driving like I was still in a go-kart, but I didn't care. I could barely see the road through the flood of tears, and Emma had to grab the wheel several times to keep us from crashing before I regained some composure. Though obviously shaken up, she managed to keep her tears and be the same one out of the two of us as we drove at least 30 miles over the speed limit the whole way back to my house. We kept this encounter a secret between us for a long time, but me and Emma decided to tell this encounter we had experienced on here. We didn't talk about it until months after the horrifying encounter. Safe to say we never went back to Miller's Fun Park after that. I urge all of you to be extremely careful when going out at night. I just hope that me and Emma never have to see that lunatic again.
This story is about an event that happened to my mother around 1972 when she was 8 years old. To set the scene, both of my grandparents ran a restaurant slash gas station in our hometown. They have always run a business of some type since the 50s. This means that a lot of days my mom would take the school bus home and stay by herself if my grandma had to stay and help run things, usually no more than an hour or two. My uncle, her older brother, would usually come home on the bus with her but he was a little older and sometimes had football practice. So was the case in the day of the event I'm getting to. So my mother arrived home on this day, let herself in the house, and put away her things. She had just recently received a new puppy and knew the first thing she needed to do was take the pup out to the yard to use the restroom. She wrapped the dog in a white towel, this is important, and walked him outside. As she put down the dog, she shook its hair out of the blanket, flailing it about the wind. It's then she noticed the neighbor's son was staring at her from across the street. This guy was in his late 20s and was known to be very strange. My mom said he always creeped her and everyone else else out. She said he would stare at her when she would play outside and made her feel generally uncomfortable. She said he appeared out of nowhere in his yard that day and as she took out the blanket he began grinning and waving. Feeling more than a little shook, she picked up her pup, went inside and locked the door. She began to do some homework and after about 5 minutes of work, she heard a loud knock at the door. She slowly walked to the window to see who it was. She knew it wasn't my grandparents because of course they had keys. As she opened the blinds, her eyes locked with those of the creep from across the street, like he was already looking in the window. She jumped and said she screamed a little as she shut the blinds. She walked to the door and made sure it was locked. She said he just continued with the slow continuous thud on the door, almost in rhythm knock 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 then she really got terrified as he began speaking to her through the door hi sweetie i saw you with your doggy let me in to see him she was in shock come on and let me in sweetie please i want to see your puppy in full freak out mode my mom screamed you need to leave now you need to go back to your house i don't know you he kept knocking knock 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 i can see the fear in my mom's eyes when she describes that part he said let me in i saw you waving your flag of surrender i kid you not the guy thought my mom shaking hair from the blanket was a flag of surrender and and a sign for him to come over. My mom screamed, I'm calling my dad and the police if you don't leave now. With this, the knocking stopped. She tried to catch her breath and shake off her fear. She then got up from the door and ran to the basement level of the home. It was an old house so the kitchen and the rec room were down there along with the only phone in the house. She made it to the phone and began to dial 911. All of a sudden, she heard a shatter from the next room. She looked over to see the crazed neighbor attempting to crawl through the kitchen window. He was ripping down the curtain as his upper body got through and my mother screamed, what was happening to the police on the phone. All of a sudden, he was bleeding from the abdomen where the window glass had cut him as his lower half couldn't squeeze through. Then my mom began hearing my grandmother's screams, what are you doing? And then the guy yelling in pain and squirming out the window as she hit him from behind with some tool that was laying in her garden on the side of the house where the entrance to the window was. He managed to get out the window and bolted to his house. The police came, grandma called my grandfather, and he arrived as well after shutting down the business as soon as she told him. They arrested him for breaking and entering. On the day of his court date, he told them the white flag of surrender story, but this was the final nut on his crazy cake as they put him in a mental institution that day. He may have gotten out but went back because my mother said he later died in an institution. Outside the courthouse, the crazy family of the creep tried to blame my 8-year-old mother and the man's father called my mother a harlot. We always can't help but wonder though, what would he have done to her if my grandma didn't come home at that moment? This took place when I was about 16. My aunt was in town visiting and we were coming back from the grocery store. We were driving back to my mom's house, my parents are divorced, and she lived way out in the country. Like, it's a 10 minute drive from anywhere. We pull up at our driveway and a red car pulls in behind us. My aunt and I stay in the car and the man approaches the driver's side door. I can't rightly tell you why he looks like a creep, but he looks like a creep. Very pasty skin, eyes that were staring down too hard, just overall weird. He claims he is lost and looking for his way to a fitness center in the town next over. The exact fitness center that is about a minute away from where the grocery store is, i.e. the opposite direction of where we just came from. Super odd, but I give him directions. He thanks me, but continues to stare at me. He asks if we know each other and I reply no. He gives me his name and I again repeat no, I do not. A couple of seconds of awkward staring and he asks me what my name is. Well, being an idiot and feeling anxious, I tell him that was a mistake. He confirms we don't know each other, oh really, and heads back to to his car and we watch him leave. 
My aunt and I agree he was very strange, but shake it off and take the groceries in. From where we were parked, you have to take a little windy path up behind the house to the back door. My aunt goes outside to grab the rest of the groceries, and I settle on the couch in the living room and look outside. Red car in the driveway. My aunt comes upstairs and said the guy was almost to our door and claimed he forgot the directions. My aunt curtly told him right, left, right, and told him to leave. The directions were truly that simple when following the main roads. I'm freaked, she's freaked, but we never see him again. A month passes and I'm chilling at my dad's and posted something like, I'm bored at my dad's house, who wants to chill on Facebook? Guys, always set your page to private. Several minutes later, I get a message from the same guy asking if I wanted him to come over. I'm home alone and understandably terrified. I immediately block him and tell my dad, who goes to one of his cop friends to see if they know anything about this guy. Well, this man was kicked out of a local university for stalking, and had two other counts of stalking on top of that and a restraining order. Another month goes by and I'm in study hall with a friend and he is telling me about this guy who was stalking his older sister. I don't remember the specific details, but it was definitely the story of someone being stalked. The craziest part was the stalker almost drove this girl's brother off the road in an attempt to get him to pull over. Once pulled over, stalker jumped out and was making his way to my friend's vehicle when my friend noped right out of there. I'm sure you guessed it, but the stalker and the creep I ran into were the same person. I was always the weird kid growing up, so making friends was never easy for me. I was a bit of a punk in high school, so living in a preppy, religious town was not my ideal place. Eventually, I met this boy, Sean. I was so happy to finally have someone I connected with. We quickly became best friends and hung out almost every day. He was odd, but so was I, so I just looked past it. Most of the time we were hanging out, we were also on drugs, so I figured some of the stuff he said was just the drugs talking. But one day he said, I'm gonna stab someone this week. For Four days later, he threatened to shoot up a place on Instagram. He played it off as a joke when I confronted him about it. His parents took away his phone and forced him to move away for a few weeks to let the air clear, but we kept in contact. At this point, my dumb self realized I was in love with him. I did everything I could to clear his name. I even got into arguments with parents on Facebook. My parents begged me to stop talking to him, but for some reason, I truly believed he was good. I didn't want to believe he was capable of hurting anyone. The whole shooting thing never really blew over. When he came back to school, students Students would run from him in the hallways, people were sending him threats, his reputation was ruined. After all of this, something in him changed, he was angrier. We would be talking and joking around about something, and he would start attacking me with words. If I made a new friend, he'd go out of his way to ruin my new friendship and for some reason, I saw this as him being protective. About a year went by after this, the verbal abuse continued, and I continued to do nothing about it. I was still in love with him, but I didn't act on it since he was my closest friend. To keep my mind off of Sean, I started dating a boy named Alex. Sean hated Alex, not for any particular reason, he just didn't like that I spent time with someone that wasn't him. Alex was also a weed dealer, and Sean knew this. Sean asked if Alex would front him some weed since he knew we were best friends, and Alex did. I don't remember the exact exact amount of weed, but it was a decent amount, enough to be mad about if you don't get paid for it. Sean never paid Alex. Alex tried to talk to him about it, but Sean always put him off and avoided him. After about a month of this, Alex saw Sean's car in a Taco Bell parking lot and pulled up. He saw Sean in his car and began to get out. Since Alex had anger issues, he also pulled out his baseball bat. Sean saw him and freaked out. He pulled out of his parking spot quickly, drove off, and called 911, calling it a drug deal gone wrong. Alex was then arrested for assault with a deadly weapon. Three days later, when Alex got out of jail, he was driving to his friend's house, who lives in Sean's neighborhood, when he saw Sean standing in his front yard. Alex rolled out his window and called him a coward, then drove away. Sean called the police again and Alex was arrested for stalking. Around this time, my parents caught me smoking. I didn't want to lie anymore, so I was honest and told my parents everything. Obviously, they were very mad at me for getting myself into that situation, and I had just told them I was smoking weed and dating a drug dealer, so I was in a decent amount of trouble. My parents took my phone as soon as I got home from school and I wasn't allowed to see Alex when he got out of jail. They took my paycheck so I didn't have money to buy weed and they made me download a tracker on my phone so they could make sure that I was home when they weren't. They contemplated calling Sean's parents and telling them we had been smoking together. I knew that if Sean got caught smoking again, he would get kicked out of his house. So I snuck my phone and texted him that my parents might call his parents and he was pissed. He called me horrible names and said he wished he had never met me. I finally had enough and told him not to talk to me anymore. My parents never called his parents. We didn't talk at all. I asked not to be scheduled with him at work and avoided him at school. We didn't have any classes together, so it wasn't too hard, but hearing the stuff he'd say about me made it a little difficult. He had started rumors that I was addicted to coke and I was selling my nudes. This is when the text started. 
He began texting me constantly, so I blocked his number. Then he'd use someone else's phone to text me, so I'd block that person's number. Then he'd use WhatsApp or group me to text me since we use those for work, so I just block him on there. He eventually got fired from our job because he had been writing tips on receipts if people didn't ask for a copy of their receipt and left the tip line empty. The continuous messages went off for a few weeks, and I just continued to block anyone he was associated with. I didn't want to be in contact with him whatsoever. He kept making new Instagram accounts to message me on, and all of his attempts to contact me failed. One day, I had a late lesson at School of Rock, where I took guitar lessons. My teacher had stayed late for me, so I was expecting his car to be the only car in the parking lot, but it wasn't. There were two cars in the parking lot, my teacher's and Sean's. To this day, I don't know how he knew I was going to be there. I quickly parked, locked my doors, and thought about what to do. I then realized he wasn't in his car, so I calmed down a bit and called inside to ask if he was there, but he wasn't. I cautiously got out of my car and got my guitar, then walked inside with no problems. After my lesson, I came out to see that he was now parked right next to me, waiting for me to get into my car. When he saw me, he began screaming profanities at me. I was paralyzed. He just sat there, screaming at me. I quickly climbed into my car from the passenger door so I didn't have to walk next to him, and then drove home as fast as I could. He began asking people to ask me to talk to him at school. Of course, I didn't. Each time someone mentioned his name to me, it caused me to have a panic attack so bad, I'd have to leave school. I ended up missing the entire month of November, and then switching to online school. A month after I switched to online school, I was driving with a friend to pick up food for my mom. As soon as we pulled into the drive through the car behind me begins to flash their brights at me. I look at my rear view mirror and see Sean's car. He has a sticker across the top of his windshield, so I knew it was him right away. I look over at my friend in fear, and she said, I didn't want to scare you, so I didn't say anything, but he's been following us since we left Target. I panic and just pretend to not notice him. He then pulled out of the drive through and parked right next to it by the exit. As soon as he pulled out, so did I. I sped to my friend's house, dropped her off, and went straight home. At this point, my parents thought going to the police would be the smartest thing to do. An officer came to my house and took a statement. I showed him screenshots of every message he had sent me over the months, and my friend that was in the car with me in the drive through talked to him as well. We decided not to press charges, but to just file an incident report. Days go by and I don't hear anything from him. I thought that maybe it was over and I could move on with my life, but my dad told me Sean had messaged him on Facebook. He had said I was addicted to pills and that I stole money from him to buy more. I've never done pills in my life. I stick to natural drugs. My parents know this, so they screenshot the messages and send them to the police. The police go by his house and tell him to stop contacting me. I continue to get messages from random Instagram accounts, and I sometimes saw his car behind me, but each time I just wrote down the location, date, and time I saw him. At this point, I started to work with Alex's lawyers to prove that Sean was not an innocent victim. Eventually, Alex's charges were dropped. Sean was proven to be unreliable since I came forward with my story. I wish I could say I had an ending to this story, but I don't. I still get random messages, but I don't bother to screenshot them anymore. Since I switched to online school, I was able to graduate a year early, and because of that, I moved away for college so I don't have to worry about him following me anymore. The last I heard about him was that he got arrested a few months ago. I went on a Tinder date some time ago while I was adjusting to a new city I had moved to. I didn't really know anybody there, so I used some online dating apps to see the dating scene around town. I landed one from a girl that seemed just like a chill person. We had a few exchanges through the Tinder app and then decided to meet up for a drink. I picked her up at her house and she greeted me at the door and gave me a hug. She said the name of a local bar she wanted to go to for us to chat and get to know each other. I told her I would drive and proceeded to my car. The first red flag I noticed was when I walked to my car and opened the door. She had just followed me to the driver's side and was standing behind me staring. I looked at her blankly for 15 seconds and asked her if she was going to get in. She said, sure, I would love to, and went the long way to the passenger's side around the back of the car. Since I had just met the girl, I figured she had just maybe smoked some weed or something, as I had kind of got the vibe she was a bit of a stoner. As I was driving to the bar, she talked in a very low voice, almost as if she was trying to whisper. I am not hard of hearing or anything, but I had to ask her to repeat herself several times just so I could make out the full sentences she was saying. When we got to the bar, I made sure we got a seat closer to the back away from most people, just so I could have a little quiet in order to hear her. The conversations honestly carried on as normal from this point and it was actually a fun time for the time being. We talked about different things we were interested in, and she did bring up she did, recreationally use weed, and a few other tripping substances, like shrooms and such. I am not much of a fan of these, but it at least made me relax in the back of my mind to think maybe she was just high off marijuana, and that rationally 
explain some of the out of their behavior. Granted, I had a few drinks at this point, so I was honestly not thinking straight. I asked her if she wanted to go to my place after drinks and she agreed. When we got to my place, we had a few more drinks, then she started talking about her jewelry. This is where it gets weird. She told me her jewelry was her big secret and it defined her. When I asked her why it was so important, she said, I'm actually Anastasia, and I was never killed in Russia. My jewelry is my link to my past. It was hard for me to take that serious at this point with how much I drank, so I kind of challenged that statement using the little bit I knew about history. At this point, she freaked out and started yelling at the top of her lungs about how I don't respect ancestors in history. And then she got quiet and tiptoed right up to me, grabbed me by my neck. She then brought my face eye to eye with hers while still holding my neck. She says at this point, I am a shaman and I will curse you. My ancestors have destroyed many people and you do not respect that. You are from oppressive ancestors and they will be punished. And then she put her hand in a whiskey glass and made a cross on my face and kissed my forehead. At this point, I started to sober up a little. I talked to her to calm me down, telling her I was only joking. Then she slowly started getting back to normal. Then she started talking about her cats. She tells me she has a list of people who she tames to act as cats. I am not about judging people on their interests, so I listen in. She then tells me all the things she does to them and starts acting like a cat in my living room. My red flags in my head were tingling like crazy at this point, so I just listened to try not to set her off. She noticed sage on my kitchen counter and asked me to let her light it and bless the house. Side note, I use sage to make my house smell better occasionally. It's kind of a ritual I like to do, but it's mine and mine alone. Something I take very personally and I like to do myself. I tell her no, she can't light it and that it's my thing to do on my own. Then she freaks out telling me I am a horrible human being and screaming all over the place. I tell her I can take her home now and she runs to the door and goes outside. As I get outside, she is screaming at the top of her lungs that I am a horrible person and I should go die. I tell her she can walk herself home then and I go back to my place and lock the door. She then starts banging on the door hard and about 10 minutes saying she left her phone in there. I grab her phone off the kitchen counter and open the door to hand it to her. She tries to barge inside and I block her with my forearm. She then acts like she's about to punch me. I just hold my ground and tell her she is not coming in. She screams she wanted the whiskey bottle we were drinking from. I told her no because I paid for the thing. I slam the door at that point and lock it. I hear her bang on the door for a minute. I then hear her footsteps going down the stairs. I I waited about an hour and then went walking outside to see if she was still hanging around. I didn't see her, nor did I ever see her again after that. So a few months ago, I was out hiking with my friend. We live in the mountains of western Maryland and we were about 6 miles into an 8 mile loop we have done frequently when we decided to take some pictures and eat a snack at a summit. This area of the trail had a park, benches and tables, and a parking lot. We were sitting and talking and I noticed a man just walking around the parking lot alone. He was walking aimlessly and staring at his feet. What confused me was that he was in jeans and a button down shirt, not exactly hiking attire. We decided to set off on the last 2 mile leg of the loop. This park goes downhill to the headquarters of the park and is cut out of the mountain slash bank. The end of that leg is the parking lot where our car is. You don't have a lot of visibility from the trail and you have to walk single file. I was walking in front and talking to my friend. I turn to look at her and I see the same man right behind her, following at a rudely close distance. I immediately got a gut-wrenching feeling. I noticed that he didn't have any pack or hiking gear and was not even wearing boots. Something about his eyes really spooked me. So a bit more walking and he continues to fall very close. I say to my friend that I have to tie my shoe, as a reason to step off the trail and let him pass us, in case he is only following closely because he wants to go faster than we are. She immediately catches on to what I'm doing and we pull over. He looks startled and she says hello politely. He just stares. This is when I notice that he is carrying a stick. As I'm fiddling with my shoe, she stands between us and he passes us. We wait to give him some distance ahead of us, but he immediately slows down. We wait for a bit longer and he gets to the furthest part of the trail that has sight lines to us, and he turns around looking up at us. We decided that something feels too wrong about this guy, and we don't want to have to pass him again. So we turn around and walk back up the trail towards the park with the tables and parking. A few minutes of walking up the trail, I look back and see him walking up the trail too. He's following us. I tell my friend to walk faster. We book it up the trail and get to the parking lot area we were at before. We start to strategize and wait, deciding that we will wait to see if he comes back up the trail to the lot. There are more people around, so we felt safer 
were waiting and out. About 20 minutes go by and nothing. We are talking about how that could mean that he kept going on the trail and is long gone, or is waiting on the trail where it is more deserted. We see a couple come up from the trail where we were, presumably taking the loop in the opposite direction that we are. We approach them and ask if they saw anyone on the trail between the slot and the next. They tell us they saw a young man sitting on a rock about halfway down. They describe the man who was following us. We explain our interaction with him to the wife and get into a conversation back and forth about whether or not he was a threat. The husband finally interjects and says we need to call a ranger. He wasn't just sitting there, he had a knife and was carving that stick. Needless to say, we called a ranger. The nice couple walked that last leg with us to make sure we got to our car safely and then even gave us their numbers in case we needed anything. The rangers then walked the trail but there was no sight of him. I wish I knew where he went and what happened to him but I'm glad to know that my instincts are legitimate. The events of this story happened 13 years ago and it still messes with me to this day even though I'm not in any sort of danger. When I was in college, I got super depressed and stressed out near my junior year. I was always super into school and just started slipping near the end of my college term so it threw me off bad. Never experienced failing at subjects before and it threw me into a ridiculous stress. I graduated and I figured everything would go away with that, but I found myself still very, very mentally foggy. My sister knew how bad off I was from the last few years of school so she hatched a plan to surprise me. I always wanted to go to Miami growing up. I know how lame that sounds, but being a girl who grew up in the Midwest and even went to college there, it was always super exciting looking to me. Up to this point I traveled but never went anywhere as lively or big as Miami always seemed. My sister planned a 5 night vacation with me as a way to get me out of this mental fog and also celebrate in our own way me graduating college. I was super excited. The few months passed and it was time for the trip. We get there and the first few nights were incredible. We hit up the restaurants I had on my little list of places to try and spend many hours by the ocean. I was never a big party girl. Up to this point in my life, I was drunk maybe twice. My sister was the opposite who was at every party that happened in our hometown. She got bored of going back to the room so early every night and convinced me to go to a nightclub with her for the first time. I fought it a bit but let my guard down because I was feeling great for the first time in a long time and was ready to try new things. It was a Saturday night downtown in the middle of summer. We we get to this nightclub and the line is legit wrapped around the building. It was massive. We waited in line for what felt like forever and were let in finally. I walked to the door and felt like I got shot because of the loudness. My sister dragged me to the bar and ordered some shots of some drink with a funny name. Again, I decided to just let my guard down and try new things. As more shots went down, I decided that would be the theme of the night, trying new stuff out. I was aware how boring I was and was, in my opinion, in the most exciting place in the world. Around 45 minutes into dancing and drinking, I became very drunk borderline blackout. I was very sloppy drunk and was aware of it. I found myself laying on a couch thing in the upstairs area overlooking the dance floor as my sister was dancing with some guys. As I stayed there trying to consciously sober myself up, I realized how badly I had to pee. So I brought myself up to a sitting position on the couch to stand up and walk to the nearby bathroom. As I sat up, a massive man quickly sat so close to me I could feel his leather pants pressed on my leg. Absolutely over 6 feet tall and looked like some sort of bodybuilder. Admittedly, he he was very good looking, but I was so drunk that I wasn't even trying to flirt and just get up to find the bathroom. He smiled at me and yelled over the music something like this, leaving so soon. I remember nervously laughing and attempted to get up but he grabbed onto my dress and pulled me back to a sitting position next to him. His smile went away and he said in a very deep tone, I don't remember telling you that you were allowed to leave. Even though I was very drunk leading up to this, I felt like I sobered up within seconds. I never had anything like this happen before, but I wasn't going to just allow this guy, no matter how much bigger than me he is to do that to me. I attempted to stand up again and he did the exact same thing, but much more aggressive. I thought it was insanely rude, but I wasn't afraid because of how many people were around me. He tapped my heels with his big yellow leather boots and said, I couldn't help but notice how much I want to screw your feet. My fight or flight kicked in. I slapped him in the face and stood up to walk away. I was very uncomfortable, but I still wasn't afraid just because of the amount of people around. As I was walking away, I heard him laughing and he yelled to me, I'm trying to decide if I want to keep your feet after I cut the rest of your body up into little pieces. I walked away very quickly as I attempted to search for my sister on the dance floor from above. I couldn't find her, so I decided to take my phone out to text her just to see I had missed a call from her. I was out of eye shot from this dude and cut away into the bathroom so I could call her back. It was still pretty loud in there, but it wasn't loud enough to where she couldn't hear me on the phone. I went into a stall and called her back. As I was in the stall, I heard the bathroom door open and someone went into the one directly next to me. I was 
waiting for her to pick up when I looked down underneath the stall and saw the same guy's very distinct yellow leather boots. He was just standing there. I felt like I was about to die. I knew he knew I was in there. I held my breath and hung up on the phone just staring at his shoes, not moving a single bit from when he shut the door. I heard the main bathroom door open again and I immediately ran out the stall, out the door, and straight to outside the club without slowing down once. I was terrified. Just so happens my sister was close to where I came out trying to call me to ask if I was ready to leave. I told her we needed to get back as soon as possible. We got back to the room safely and I told her everything that happened. She suggested calling the police but I was just ready to drop it. We changed up our flight and the next night flew back home. Home. I searched for a few years pretty actively online for arrest in the area to see if he would ever come up. He never did. After a few years, I moved on mentally and got over it for the most part. I don't know who this guy was, if he was trying to say things to scare me, or if he was serious. This story begins when I was in 4th grade, so I was about 9, as I was a bit young for my grade. Because of me being younger than the other kids, I didn't get along with them very well. So whenever we would go out to recess, I would make sure to bring whatever book I was reading at the time. I had my own special place I liked to sit and read. It was a little corner of the playground where barely anybody went. It was a large patch of clovers and other overgrown plants and had a large bush with a gap between it and the fence. I used to love to sit there. One day, I went over to my normal spot and sat with my back facing the bush. I had been reading for a while when I thought I heard a rustling sound behind me. Sometimes squirrels and chipmunks would hang out in the gap between the bush and the fence so I didn't think much of it. That was until I heard heavy breathing and something tugging on my hair. Surprised, I whipped my head around thinking my hair had gotten caught on a branch or something. But instead, there was a boy. He was sitting hunched in the gap between the fence and the bush, leaning forward between the branches with his face mostly obscured by leaves and his arm outstretched, trying to grab at my hair. I screamed and bolted for the picnic table area where the supervising teachers were. I was very shy back then, so I didn't say anything. Instead, for a long time after that, I sat and read by the teachers during recess. About three quarters of the way through the school year, I made a friend who we'll call Matt. Matt was also a bit of an outcast, and when we got assigned to be in a reading group together, we became fast friends. He was nice enough, but even my nine-year-old self could tell that there was something off about him. He was way too clingy, barely ever leaving my side and constantly coming up with excuses to touch me. I of course didn't have any other friends then, so I ignored it. However, one day he told me that he liked me. I had no idea how to react to this and just said nothing. He apparently took my silence as a yes because he called my home phone later that night. My mom handed me the phone saying that a friend was asking to talk to me. Since my parents were watching TV downstairs, I decided to go up to my room so I wouldn't bother them. It was Matt. I could barely even say hello before he started saying some seriously weird stuff. He started saying things like, like, what do you want to name our kids? When we get to high school, let's run away and start a family. I bet you look really cute when you're asleep. Now, this would be creepy for anyone, but I was 9. I had no idea how to handle the situation, so I just stayed away from him. He was not happy about this, constantly glaring at me and just being all around super creepy. A year later, I was halfway through 5th grade and had a serious bully problem. But that's a story for another day. It got so bad that my dad decided one day to not wait until the next school year and instead switch schools the following Monday. Fifth grade at my new school was great, and starting in sixth grade, my parents got me my first phone. Of course, I called up Clara, who became my friend after the Matt incident, and let her know about my new phone. A couple more months passed, and one night, I got a call from an unknown number. Picking up the phone, I froze when I heard Matt's voice. I still vividly remember what he said. Hey, I missed you so much. Why'd you leave me? Not even a second after he said that, I hung up, blocked his number, and called up Clara, as she was the only person at my old school who had my number. Apparently, Apparently, after school, he had asked to see her phone to call his mom, as he had forgotten his at home. She handed it over to him, as she was a very kind but quite gullible girl. Soon, she noticed that he was taking a while and that he had a pen out and was writing something on his arm. She yanked her phone away and he panicked, sprinting off. Looking down at her phone, she saw that he had opened up my contact info. I was freaked out but felt safe, as I had blocked his number. That didn't stop him, though. He would call me every single week from a different phone, leaving at least 10 messages every time. Every time I would block one number, he'd send a call from another one. When I got a new phone, the call stopped and I forgot about it until freshman year. At my high school, there were a couple of kids from my old school, and I suddenly remembered Matt. I asked one of the boys, Harry, if he knew what happened to Matt. According to Harry, he got expelled. Teachers had caught him smelling and touching girls' hairs, touching female students, and trying to sneak into the girls' locker room. The realization hit me like a semi-truck. Smelling and touching girls' hair. It was Matt from all of those years ago when I was reading at that tree.
I'm a 24 year old woman and I once worked at a pharmacy store for about a year as a cashier. I had many weird encounters because people were sometimes behind in their medication doses when they came in to pick them up, mostly harmless. The shifts were usually just one cashier and a supervisor, with the supervisor in the back of the store and the cashier alone up front. This happened close to Halloween at about 9am on a sunny, innocent day. I was just chilling at the cash register waiting for customers when a man came in and stood in the aisle across from the register and just stared at me for a good five minutes. I didn't realize that's actually what he was doing until he made eye contact and he didn't look away. He was tall and reminded me of Tyler Labini's character in Tucker and Dale vs. Evil, just not the least bit charming. I immediately called my supervisor up front over the loudspeaker and the guy walked down the aisle towards the pharmacy. When my supervisor appeared, I told her what happened. She downplayed it, didn't look for him, and said just to call her if he did anything. Comforting. When she was gone, the man made a loop around the store and came right to my register with a bag of Halloween candy and nothing else. I tried ringing him up quickly, but he started asking me ridiculous questions about our savings card program and insisting he sign up. I slid him a pamphlet to fill out his information because I did not want to speak to him more than I had to. He just stood there holding the pen and staring at me, then suddenly asked if I knew how trick-or-treating originated. I didn't have time to answer him before he started describing how, back in the day, the men that ruled the country would go house to house every year on Halloween and demand the daughters of every age to be handed over so they could, you know. That was trick-or-treating in his mind. As soon as I heard that, I said, get away from me, and walked to the other register and called my supervisor loudly over the speaker because he was blocking my way to the back. He didn't flinch as he followed me to the next register and started talking about how all women are bad and are meant to serve men. He noted my wedding ring and said my husband could also rent me out because it was his right end on and on. I was considering jumping the side of the register to put some distance between us so I could run. Luckily, the male pharmacist heard the panic in my voice and rushed over to the front of the store. He saw the man and shouted, Jake, get out of here. The man, Jake, just stared at him as he calmly walked out and it was so scary and stupid at the same time. Turns out that Jake had been a regular customer until he stopped picking up his medication. Instead, he would just come in and harass female workers and he'd been on a police enforced ban for over a year. My savior Mr. Pharmacist called the police and the store manager to cuss her out for still scheduling girls alone after everything Jake did in the past, such as ripping a toilet seat off of one of our toilets and threatened to beat a girl with it who used to work there. I quickly transferred to a different location because I just could not get over it and the manager kept scheduling us alone. The police only watched the store for a week. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I'm going to tell you the story of a terrifying old creep that had stalked me since I was 16 years old. I'm currently 20 years old. I worked in a restaurant which was inside a bigger shopping center. My stalker, an old man named Eric, worked for the actual shopping center itself and not a store inside it like me. I had one other friend at my job who was my age and her name was Jessica. Jessica had worked there for longer than I had and one day she asked if I heard of this guy who worked in the shopping center called Eric. Jessica described Eric as very strange she didn't describe him as frightening or unsettling, or even someone to be afraid of, just as a very eccentric man. Jessica has also told me that Eric had brought her a present on Valentine's Day, chocolate. Anyone would think this was friendly behavior or harmless flirting. If he wasn't a 50-something year old man bringing chocolates to a 16-year-old girl he barely knew, I began to see for myself that Eric wasn't just an innocent old man with a slight crush. He had other intentions. The first time I remember Eric approaching me was when I was filling up a machine near the entrance of my work. This machine was out of the view of all the other employees and the restaurant was empty. Eric wasn't supposed to enter my place of work when he was working at the shopping center, so he had deliberately gone out of his way to come and speak to me. To describe his appearance, he had gray hair with bald patches and had beady little eyes which he never adverted from yours. Eric must have sneaked up on me as I looked up and he was standing right next to me, a little too close. My name is Lucy. Eric asked me, Lucy, are you married? He almost laughed after he asked me this. He had a smirk on his face. Eric liked to ask me questions that he already knew the answer to, just to see my reaction. I began to clock on to the fact that Eric had been going a little further than just approaching me at work, and instead stalking my social media accounts in the weeks following this first encounter, such as Twitter and Instagram, when he began asking me very specific questions about things I had posted about in the days before. For example, I had posted on Instagram about a tattoo I got, which was in homage to my favorite band. I was serving a customer one day, only to be in 
interrupted by a shrill but quiet voice. It was Eric. His eyes were huge and he had a look of pure excitement and menace on his face. He had yet again entered my workplace when he wasn't supposed to, just to talk to me. He asked me, Lucy, what's your favorite insert band here song? I felt creeped out. The tattoo I had gotten was covered by my work uniform, so the only way he could have seen it was going through my Instagram page. I forced myself to forget all about it and carried on working. Over the course of a few months, Eric would come into my workplace more and more frequently, asking me bizarre questions and still reciting back to me things that I had tweeted about or posted on Instagram. Every time I would see him, I would get visibly uncomfortable and he liked it when I got uncomfortable. All while this was happening, Jessica approached me let me know that Eric had followed her in his car on her walk home from work, slowing down to ask her where she lived. I had also been told other disturbing news about Eric from multiple different people. It seemed as if he was becoming more invested in whatever his intentions were towards me and Jessica. News had traveled to one of my managers about Eric's unsettling actions towards me and this manager informed me that a few years ago, Eric was rumored to have followed a young girl who used to work for our restaurant into a toilet. Things didn't quite make sense to me. He was known for being a creep yet still employed at the shopping center. On one hand, I was glad to know I wasn't just creeped out for no reason, but on the other hand, I was frightened as he'd been doing this for years yet no one had stopped him. There was a woman who worked at the same place as me called Rebecca, and she had some sort of disability which caused her to befriend and be trusting to people without knowing anything about them. It seems that Eric took advantage of her, as he had asked for her phone number and she gave it to him. Rebecca had shown me her text with Eric. He had texted her things like, Rebecca, are you alone? And Rebecca, are you sat on the bus alone? But the most unsettling part of it all was the text from Eric that read, Rebecca, could you please let me know any information on the girls that work at, insert restaurant name here. I was stunned. I was constantly questioning why this old man was so bent on finding out everything I do in my life. He had gone out of his way to source information about me through a vulnerable person I worked with, and I was scared he was going to go further. One night, I was watching the movie Grease with my family, and I tweeted something stupid like, Grease is my favorite film because it's a great film, right? Anyways, the morning after my tweet, Eric approaches me in his usual way and utters, Do you like the film Grease, Lucy? The same usual smirk lit up on his face. I try to carry on with my day, but spent the entirety of my shift feeling a little shaken up. The very second I clocked out of work and got into my car, my phone went off. This was a notification for PayPal. I clicked on this notification to see that I had received three pounds from an Eric, and the note attached to it read, To Lucy, Grease is the word from Eric. He literally found my PayPal and sent three pounds to it and quoted the movie Grease. If this wasn't crazy enough, in the days following, I received a string of anonymous and incessant calls, one after the other. My phone rang all night, I had to turn it off to get away. Even when I turned my phone back on, the calls continued. The phone calls that I did answer were just someone breathing down the phone, making a point to breathe heavy. I had no proof that this was Eric, but it wasn't hard to put two and two together after all the links he had gone to in order to track down my personal information. If he had found out my PayPal address, my phone number, and all of my social media accounts, what was stopping him from finding out where I live, breaking in, hurting me or my family? I reported Eric to my managers and they passed my complaint on to the managers of the shopping center. At this point, I was genuinely scared for my safety. Multiple girls added to my statement and added details of times they had witnessed Eric's unsettling behavior of times he had been inappropriate with them too. Eric had been cautioned by the shopping center's management yet nothing was done, except the fact that he was warned not to talk to me. Eric found ways around the no talking to Lucy rule. He would make animal noises at me when he would see me, like a monkey or a dog or any bizarre noise that would get my attention. I think he just wanted me to think that he outsmarted me and found a way around the rules. After this, I stopped working at the restaurant as a full-time job and saw Eric less and less, which was obviously great for me. I moved city as I went away for university and made new friends which distracted me from my old life in my hometown. After moving away and starting my new life, I forgot about Eric. I was soon going to remember though. On Christmas Day, I was back home in my hometown with my parents. My phone buzzed with a notification. I received a notification from PayPal and it was the exact amount of three pounds, only not from Eric this time, but from a girl whose name I didn't recognize at all. I opened up the PayPal app only to see a note attached to this payment I had received. The note read, sending on behalf of Eric. I had forgotten all about Eric and now he was antagonizing me through other people. I threw my phone down on the couch and spent the night drinking with my family until I forgot about the notification. I since haven't seen or heard anything from him and I wanted to stay that way. I'm not sure if he still works at the shopping center but I don't go there anymore so I don't have to find out.
So this was back in 2011. There were four girls living in the house, including myself. Parents place and I would sublet rooms. First girl was a child friend who moved in to get away from an abusive ex. Second girl applied via online ad and was normal enough except for telling everyone her daughter was actually her niece. Party girl. Third girl was a run-of-the-mill insurance claim processor and quiet type who kept to herself and usually declined any invitation from the rest of us when going out or socializing. Quiet girl. So party girl and I buy tickets to go to a concert at of town. Childhood friend can't get the time off of work and opts to stay behind as does quiet girl. No surprise there. So party girl and I leave on our trip and spend the night dancing away. Meanwhile, childhood friend comes home from work to find quiet girl sitting in the shower screaming slash crying with the bathroom door wide open. She asks if she's okay and calms her down. Quiet girl says she wanted to make dinner for all of us and party girl and I have ruined her cosmic plans. Childhood friend sees spoiled chicken breasts in the sink and thinks, oh she just wanted to do something nice and offers to go out to dinner together as party girl and I will be back tomorrow night and we can all do dinner then. While at the all-you-can-eat Chinese food restaurant, childhood friend notices quiet girl is stuffing her purse with food. This is odd. She's not wrapping it in napkins, just shoving it in there. When they get home, quiet girl started talking all this crazy stuff that made no sense and childhood friend gets a little nervous and goes to bed early, locks herself in her room and nopes out for the night. When party girl and I get home the next afternoon, we notice a few things. Childhood friend is already at work, but quiet girl is sitting on the living room couch completely naked and has covered her body in the stuffed animals that belong to the rest of us. Rotten chicken is still in the sink and smells strongly of bleach and other chemicals. Knives are laying around it. Pictures have been removed from the walls. I go to my room and see all the pictures of my dad have been piled up in the middle of my bed. I ask quiet girl about this and she explains I need to be reunited with my father. He died in 2003. Party girl emerges from her room wondering why her underwear is piled up in the middle of her bed and several other possessions have gone missing. Quiet Girl says she needed them for the ritual and explains we can find what we are looking for in the backyard. We find the charred remains of our things in the smoldering fire pit. We are both angry at this point and demand she explain this behavior. This is where she goes full crazy and explains that her souls are all linked and only through death can our bonds be truly realized. She explains that her and my cat are one soul and that he has been telling her about all of our sins and bad behavior. Also that it's actually her cat. She then full on threatens to end our lives as soon as the last member, childhood friend, has arrived. I grab the largest knife I own while party girl and I barricade ourselves in my room in the basement. She calls childhood friend telling her not to come home as it isn't safe and I call 911 as my life has been officially threatened by someone who has clearly lost her grip on all reality. Cops arrive within minutes and ask quiet girl her name. At this point she just starts screaming her first, middle, and last name repeatedly. Over and over again. Will not stop. My cat is trying to sneak out the front door and I ask one of the officers to grab him. She begins to scream that it is her cat and not to touch him. I am in tears and offered to retrieve his adoption papers. I am terrified. I don't know what to do. Party girl is hiding behind me. Then quiet girl loses her mind, jumps up and attacks the officers. It took three of them to pin her down and arrest her. Once she was removed, I wrote up a letter of eviction and we began bagging up her room. That's when we discovered that she was a schizophrenic who was offered schizophrenia medication. Her boyfriend came later that day to collect her things as I had called him to notify him of the situation and he was totally clueless. He accused the rest of us of running a drug ring party house and driving her insane. Not true at all. We changed the front and the back door locks that night and put new locks on each bedroom door as well. She later tried to serve me papers and sue me for wrongful imprisonment. Pretty sure the cops made that call, not me. Nothing ever came of it, obviously. I have not had a roommate I wasn't related to since. This happened about two years ago when I was 22. After work, I stopped at a local convenience store to buy beer. The cashier looked familiar, but it's a very small town, population of 6,000. He acted odd. I asked how he was doing to make small talk and he just stared at me. I instantly felt uncomfortable, so I only glanced at him a few times before I left. I arrived home 10 minutes later and decided to browse Facebook. I had a friend request. The guy looked familiar. He was a local, so I accepted him. A few hours later, I realized it was the cashier. He got my name off of my ID and added me not even five minutes after I left. I told my boyfriend we agreed it was weird. A few days later, he came into my work. I asked my boss. She'd never seen him in there before. He grabbed milk and initiated small talk with me. I felt uncomfortable. He asked if I remembered him, told me his name, and that we'd been good friends in high school. We never said two words to each other. I was trying to be polite, told him yes, I remembered. After a few minutes, my boss pulled me in the office. She was watching through the window and could tell I was uncomfortable. It was a small farm 
pharmacy and we were all close. He started coming in every few days. If I wasn't there, he'd ask for me. After a few weeks, my boss would pull me in the office whenever he'd walk in. All the managers were briefed and did the same. That was all they could do until something happened. Then he stopped coming in. We didn't see him for a few weeks. I was relieved and went about my business. I was allowed to carry my cell phone on the floor. My mom was very sick, so if she needed anything, the managers were fine with her calling me. I got a text from a random number shortly after. I asked who it was and they replied, you don't remember? You gave me this number. It's my stalker. I'll call him George. My heart started pounding. I sent a polite, short message back. After I work, I checked to see if my phone number was anywhere on my Facebook. It wasn't. George started messaging me daily, calling me babe. I was freaked out to say the least. My boyfriend was working out of town with limited cell reception, so I couldn't let him know what was going on. A few days later, I got a message from an old classmate I still talk to once in a while. Hey, did George ever get a hold of you? He said there was an emergency and needed to contact you. Is everything alright? I broke down crying, finally acknowledging that yes, I was being stalked. I didn't know if he was violent and he knew where I worked, so I sent him something like, hey, I just wanted to let you know that I have a boyfriend. I didn't want there to be a misunderstanding between us. That's when it got bad. He called me a liar, telling me he doesn't know why my ugly self would even think he was interested in me. No man would be interested in your nasty self. I asked him to leave me alone. The insults got worse. I shut my phone off and tried to ignore him. A few hours later, after calming down, I turned it back on. The last message he sent read, I know where you work. I know where your house is. I could kill you in your house. Try to call the cops on me. I'm in New York right now. Do it. They can't protect you. Obviously not as legible. I could tell he was mad and wrote it in haste. I called a friend and explained. Show her, showed her the text. She took me down to the police station where I showed them the text. I filed a report and later got a restraining order against him. Turns out he already had two other restraining orders from girls he'd done this to as well. My boyfriend came back a week later and I told him what happened and had to stop him from hunting him down. Last year he tried getting my number from a friend over Facebook. She blocked him. I haven't seen or heard from him since thankfully. There have been very few times in my life I've been that scared. For some context, I'm a 32 year old female. This happened to me when I was about 25 or 26. I work full time as a researcher at a university, which is where these encounters took place. I'm not a professor or anything, and because of my age at the time, I could have easily been mistaken for just another student wandering around campus. On some days, when the weather was nice, I would prefer to spend my lunch hour strolling around the university grounds outside, or sitting underneath a shady tree on a bench, enjoying the time I was not sitting in a cramped corner of a lab. On one of these days, I was sitting on a bench enjoying the fresh air and a male student walking by asked if he could sit next to me. I'm a pretty shy and awkward kind of person, so even though I really would have preferred sitting alone, I said sure. He initiated simple conversation to which I obliged, but being careful not to be too forthcoming. He mentioned he had seen which department building I came and went from, which slightly alarmed me, given I had never seen this person in my life. But I pushed the thought from my mind. After all, the weather had been decent lately, and I had nearly spent all of my lunch hours for the past week outside. He asked if I was studying within the mentioned department, to which I told him I was not a student, but rather I worked there. He told me he was an engineering student and then followed up with asking me out to coffee sometime. I apologized and told him that I had a boyfriend and would have to decline. We parted ways after that, and I assumed I probably wouldn't see him around again. About a week or two went by, and I was spending another lunch hour outside on campus, sitting on a different bench somewhere, seemingly out of nowhere. The same man from before asked if he could sit next to me again. Admittedly, I don't remember what he started talking to me about at first. My mind was reeling and I was rather uncomfortable having to potentially turn this guy down a second time. Sure enough, he asked me again if we could go out for coffee sometime. I apologized and reminded him that I had a boyfriend and I would not be meeting him for coffee. And again, he left after that. I was feeling rather anxious now, but it still hadn't reached a level where I felt I had to be too concerned. A few days later, I had finished work and was leaving the building to walk to where I had parked my car. The university charges a fortune for parking passes, even if you're employed by them, so I had always opted for free street parking about a 10 minute walk away from campus. My walking route would take me down several quiet residential streets, with minimal car traffic. Even pedestrian traffic was pretty sparse on the busiest of days. It wasn't until I was about halfway to my car, down one of these quiet back streets, that I noticed someone walking directly across the street from me. But keep 
even a few faces behind. I noticed him from my peripheral vision and didn't want to flat out turn around to stare at him. It wasn't uncommon to see someone else by any means, I was just always trying to be aware of my surroundings when walking the streets alone. I had to make a few turns coming up anyways, and the chance that they would be going the same way as me was slim, but he did. He made all the turns I did, still walking on the sidewalk across from me, a few steps behind. I still did not want to look at whoever this was. I didn't want him to know that I was aware of what I thought he was doing. I quickened my pace to a speedy walk. I was approaching the first of two busier streets before I would reach my car. His pace quickened to keep up with me. That was the moment I panicked, the moment I was sure that he was indeed following me. After that, I started a full out jog across the first of the busier streets. He ran to keep up behind me and was now on the same side of the street I was. I was now nearly at my car. I had to cross the last busy street and get about 100 meters and I would be there. But it was crossing the street that worried me. I often had to stop and wait a good minute or so before it was clear enough to do so. If this were the case, he would catch up with me. As if the stars aligned, as soon as I made it running to the busy street, I had a gap to cross. I booked it as fast as I could, finally turning around once I had made it, to look and yell at the man who had been pursuing me. It was him. I could have suspected, but now it was confirmed. It was the engineering student whom I had turned down for coffee. Stop following me. I yelled at him from across the busy street. Can I just talk to you? He yelled back. I didn't even answer him. I mean, the answer should have been obvious from the start, and I was certainly never going to give my time to anyone who had just followed and then chased me for about one kilometer. I keep moving quickly to my car, so determined to get out of there that I didn't even care if he saw which car was mine. He had given up following me and never tried to cross the road too, to my relief. I got home and broke down. I was shook. I had some anxieties walking to and from work after that. It wasn't long before a co-worker and I would walk most of the distance back to our cars together after work. I even changed where I started parking for a time. A few weeks had passed since the incident, and I had not seen him around campus at all. I had started spending my lunches in the lab instead of outside, but occasionally I would go to the student center to buy lunch instead. This one particular day, the food court in the student center was packed, almost shoulder to shoulder. I was standing in line at a burger stall and I heard a guy try and get someone's attention through the crowd. I look up and it's him again, waving to me and trying to make his way through the people. I panicked and even though I'm terribly shy, I started a scene and yelled to him to leave me alone. His face dropped instantly as people stared at us and he slinked back into the sea of students. My heart was pounding and I was shaking. I don't even remember if I ended up getting food after that. I went back to work and from then on was even more focused on my surroundings than I ever was before. It's been five or six years since then now and I still work at the university. I am so relieved to say that I never saw him again after the food court, and haven't had any other harrowing accounts on campus. I never asked the guy's name, so I couldn't even report an incident to campus police or anything. All in all, I'm just glad I never saw him again, and I can only hope he never did this to any other girl before or after me. When I was in my early 20s, I moved to Southern California with my aunt. Once I had a job established and steady income, I found an apartment that was super affordable at $350 a month, plus utilities, the first red flag because California is not cheap. The other residents in the apartment was a 45 year old male named Zach and a 45 year old female named Tina. They weren't a couple. Tina was a little difficult to deal with, very OCD on a lot of things and we mostly avoided each other. But this story is about Zach and his friend Mike, also 45 years old. Mike and Zach were childhood friends and Mike lived in the same apartment complex as us. So he was over a lot. Every time I would come home from work, they would be polishing off a handle of vodka and then would go out. I wasn't super comfortable in the living situation, but it was cheap. And and I was in school, and I tried to make the best of it. I got along with Zach for the most part if it was just him around, but Mike was just a time bomb. Here are just a few instances that just gradually got worse over time. The first incident. Zach invited me out with Mike and another friend of theirs out to a local bar a couple miles away. I was comfortable around Zach and I got into the passenger side of the truck. I didn't have any negative interactions with anyone until this point. Mike went ballistic in our complex parking lot about how I was selfish and had no business in the front seat because I wasn't Zach's girlfriend etc. It was weird because a man the same age as my dad was throwing a tantrum over the passenger seat, so I just got out and went back to my apartment. My first rent check bounced. I apologized to Zach and discovered that my checks had misprinted the account number. I paid in cash and paid off the bounce check fee and thought all was okay, until I got home one evening and Mike was over as normal, but starts interrogating me on why I couldn't pay my rent. I was only 22 at the time and didn't really want issues, so I was just like, hey, I apologized and took care of it. Even though Mike didn't live 
live in the apartment. He would not let this go. He would just scream at me saying I was lazy, that I should be evicted and on and on. It's also important to note that Mike and Zach both had two DUIs. Zach was a school teacher and ended up being let go because of the DUIs. However, both men continued to drink excessively all the time. I also had to have a key made for the lock on my bedroom door because it would get violent a lot and that was my safety net. A lot of other instances happened, but this one takes the cake and is the point to the story. Zach and Mike had gone out and took an Uber to whatever local bar. I had gotten home and went straight to my room as always. I hear the front door swing open and Mike was pissed drunk screaming his head off about how he lost his new iPhone. This guy starts beating on my bedroom door demanding to be let in because he knew I had his phone. I cracked my door open and he had stepped away from the door with his fist balled up like he was going to hit me. I told him I didn't have the phone. Mike circles back to the one time, months prior at this point, that my rent check bounced and I obviously need money. He demands that he come into my room and tear my room apart looking for said phone. I told him absolutely not and shut slash locked the door. Mike started banging on my door and trying to unlock it, threatening my life, saying he was going to kill me and lots of other gross and scary things. I was told if I called the police that he would beat me to a bloody pulp. This was especially scary because my aunt was my only family nearby and she wasn't really helpful. She just told me to be an adult and deal with it. Other than that, I didn't really have a support system. I told Zach a couple of days later that I would be moving out immediately and would not be paying rent for that month. Then out of Zach's dark bedroom, Mike just pops up with a smile saying bye, almost taunting. I hurried into my room and locked the door. I could hear Zach blaming Mike for me moving out and Mike continued to just call me names and asking how I I had the money to move out. The iPhone was found for anyone who's curious. It had fallen out of his pocket in the Uber he was in, but obviously the first step to finding the iPhone was to flip out on me versus calling the Uber driver. This was almost a decade ago and I don't know what happened to that pair. About two years ago, I worked at a movie store inside a mall. I was 20 at the time. This guy was over 6 foot, late 40s, very hefty, and always had this weird zombified expression on his face. He came in about once a week. One of my co-workers had even warned me about him, how he was a little off, but I still treated him with as much respect as I did everyone else. One day, he came in and we talked for a bit, but it got a little awkward and I kept trying to end the conversation and looked busy by tagging items behind the counter. He stood there in silence watching me for about 20 minutes and finally left. A few days later, he comes back in and walks up to me, holding a large container. He says, I made four pounds of enchiladas at home today, just for you. I remembered you like Mexican food. I don't remember at all telling him that I liked it, but I do know that I went to the Mexican restaurant across the way every lunch break. I just politely accepted it and put it in the back office. Another few days later, he came back in and had a drawing for me of a dragon. Now, I love dragons, but I never told him that. This drawing looked like it took hours to make and at this point I was a little freaked out. I had him leave it on the counter so I could just throw it away later. Later on, I was given about a week vacation. During that week I had cut my hair about 12 inches. The day I came back, I got a shift with my manager. I told her all about the guy and immediately she was weirded out for me. A few minutes later, I see the dude walking around in the mall. He was going towards the exit and didn't look at me once. My manager tells me to go back to the office. I go and wait until she comes to get to me and when she does, she tells me I need to make a report to mall security immediately. Apparently when I ran back there, he turned around to come in and walked all throughout the store. When she asked him if he needed help with something, he said, I can't believe she cut her hair, and briskly walked out. I go to the mall security office to make a report, and we went through all the videos from the cameras of when the guy came to visit me, but there was one video that really stood out. The video shows him pull into the parking lot of the mall, and about three minutes later I arrive. This was really early in the morning and no customers were here yet, but there were cars in the lot. I didn't notice him at all. It shows me walking through the entrance and him following me. Right as I open the entrance door, the man starts sprinting towards me. I walked inside just in time. It shows him stop and just stand in front of the door, watching me through the glass walk a little further away. He begins walking normally inside the mall. I never noticed him behind me. That part really screwed me up. The video gave the security every reason to ban him from the mall and they did. They later told me they gave him a background check and he had four counts of stalking with restraining orders from different girls on his person and was on probation.
When I was like 13 years old, probably close to 12 years ago, I went trick-or-treating with some friends from school. We were the type to bring pillowcases and get as much as we could, then weigh at the end of the night. We've been all over the neighborhood. We lived in a suburban area, but we were quick. We were able to get most of the houses before lights started turning off, and we all had a hefty turnout of candy. Trick-or-treating was starting to calm down by this point. The time must have been around 9.30 or 10 maybe. There was this one house with the lights off, but we still walked up anyway because they were a couple cars parked outside. We rang the doorbell and nothing, so we rang a few times, still nothing. I'm not defending what we did at all, we were seriously stupid kids back then. One of us starts banging on the door and talking bad like, we're gonna egg your house and so on. Right after that, this man jumps out of the door and basically slams it open. We all jump back startled. It was pitch black inside his house. Where were the other people? There were two cars right in front of his house. He had to be late 20s or early 30s with a scruffy beard, wearing a white beater and black zip-up hoodie and had this look of total rage in his eyes. He comes out with this huge dog on a leash that starts barking, growling, and showing his teeth in our face. I couldn't really make it out at the time, but it appeared as though he had a knife in his other hand as well. We're terrified because we didn't expect this. He just busts out the front door and starts chasing us down and we start sprinting away in total fear. He's screaming things like, I'm gonna kill you, and you shouldn't have screwed with me, or better hope my dog doesn't catch you, or get back over here. He ran after us for probably 10-ish minutes. The whole time he was just frantically waving his arm with a knife, shouting mostly incoherently with his dog by his side on that leash. It was horrifying. We got away thankfully, somehow managed to lose him after running for a while, but I can't imagine what would have happened if we stayed there for any longer. I'd probably be chow for his dog, but thankfully we were all pretty healthy kids so we could outrun him. I'm honestly surprised that nobody else was really around to see this maniac chasing us in the middle of the streets. I knew it was later at night, but still. We had to beeline back to my place looking over over our shoulders the whole time because we didn't notice when we lost him and we didn't see him walk back towards his house. He was just gone after we turned a few corners. Now, I understand it would be frustrating for some kids to be at your door being annoying like that, but what gets me is that the reaction from this guy didn't really seem appropriate. I would have just opened the door and told the kids to screw off or threatened to call the cops or something like that. We went back to my parents' house and played Smash Bros on the Wii all night and ate a bunch of candy. We managed to hold onto our pillowcases of candy the whole way home. My friends started crying after we got back. We locked all the doors and windows obviously. We were pretty sure he wasn't around when we went into my house so it seemed safe. That guy's house was right in front of the middle school I went to and I had to walk right by his house to get to school every day. So fearing for my safety, I told my dad. We went back to that house the next day to knock on the door. In hindsight, we probably should have called the cops and let them handle it, but my dad is a confrontational no BS type of guy. So we went over and knocked on the door. This time there were three cars in front of the house. This mother opens the door and we could see inside their kids watching TV. When we told her what happened, her face went pale and she immediately rounded up her family and got them outside, fearing this crazy person might still be in her house. She told us that her family went out to another friend's house in the city next to ours for Halloween that night to do all their trick-or-treating. They didn't get home until the next morning because they stayed the night there. It was at that point that cops were called to search the house while we all stood outside. They didn't find anything though, no trace of him turned up. He must have been long gone by then. It turned out that the guy was able to get into their house because there was a window unlocked in the daughter's room on the bottom floor near the front door. Luckily, nobody was in the house that night. The only notable thing the woman could tell the police was that she noticed a car with dark windows parked down the street for a while but didn't think anything of it. He must have been posted up in there with his dog scoping out houses and noticed this whole family get in a car and leave and figured that would be a good opportunity to make his move. So who was this guy? Nothing was stolen from the house, and nothing looked ransacked or the family obviously would have noticed. The family said the front door was still locked when they got back too, so he must have locked it again and went out through that same window to cover his tracks. I'm pretty sure this was before those ring doorbell cameras were popular, and I don't think they had any security cameras set up either. I'm not sure to be honest, maybe he was just a drug addict and didn't have a reason for any of it. His eyes did seem pretty crazy and wide open, like he was strung out on something. This happened to me a few years back. I was living on my own in the city and was unemployed at the time, usually out looking for work and trying to stay busy. One early afternoon, I was heading back to my neighborhood after running some errands downtown and boarded a tram that would take me almost all the way home. There was a park that I would have to cross between the stop and my home, but crossing it would only take a few minutes. So I boarded the tram, which was mostly empty. Besides me, there was one younger man in the second carriage and the driver up front in the first. I find an empty two 
two-seater, the rows are quite narrow but I'm comfortable. I put my earbuds in and look out the window as we start moving out of downtown and towards home. We pass a couple of stops and don't pick up any new passengers. There had probably been a tram right in front of us who took all the people, so it was particularly empty compared to normal. At the third stop, the doors behind me open, but I don't pay much attention until a stocky man, average height, probably in his 50s, with neat, short hair and inconspicuous clothes suddenly sits down on the next seat next to me. The rows are very narrow, this guy is basically trapping me. I can't get past him without his cooperation, he greets me with a huge smile and says hi as he sits down. On this particular day, being down about not finding work, and it being broad daylight, I decide I do not want to play along. I just want to listen to my music and I don't like this man's vibe. I tell him I'm not in the mood to talk and he needs to go sit somewhere else. Wrong answer. That man goes from 0 to 100 in 0.2 seconds and his face contorts with rage as he starts yelling at me from the top of his lungs. I wish there was an exaggeration, but unfortunately it isn't. He was loud. You are a terrible person. You don't clean yourself. You stink of sweat. I didn't. He did. He goes on and on about what an abomination of a person I am, and I have sort of a freeze reaction. Inside, I am getting very scared. I start looking for a way out, but I'm trapped. I look over to the young man, hoping he will come to my rescue. I can tell he's hoping to stay out of it, but after I've been screamed at for maybe two whole minutes, he finally says meekly, you better calm down, which of course doesn't help. So he just gives up and goes back to whatever he was doing, probably looking at his phone. I am hoping that the driver might react as he has a clear view to the back of the tram and there's no way he's not hearing what's going on, but again, nothing. The stocky man, maybe frustrated that I'm not reacting to his insults, escalates the abuse and starts screaming that he's going to kill me. At this point, I have to do something and unconsciously probably decide that the only way is through. I'm so done with the situation, so before I even realize what I'm doing, I just get up and push past him. It's all survival instinct. Scared that he's going to follow me, I move quickly towards the front of the tram. He gets up and follows me, all red-faced, shouting how he knows where I live and that I need to clean myself behind my ears, that I stink and that he's going to kill me. Again, the driver does nothing. As we pull up to the next stop, which is the stop before mine, I wait until the very last minute before I ask the driver to let me out the front door, which he does. I slip out quickly in hope of escaping without being followed. I don't dare taking the time to look over my shoulder. I just hurry down the steps and away from the stop. I am so scared. Only when the tram has left the station do I take a second to look around me and he's not there. A brief sense of relief washes over me before I start worrying that he's going to get off at the next stop, which is normally my stop, and that he will be waiting for me there. It should have come as no surprise that I do not want this guy to follow me through the park or know where I live, so I spend a good hour just walking around, trying to get my nervous system out of panic mode and staying close to shops where there are other people around before I finally make my own way home. This happened when I was 21 years old, and I am fully aware I made a lot of poor decisions in my younger days. I am very lucky to have survived, and here's one of my stories. I have just met with a cousin at the mall I hadn't seen in a long time. At this point, I had been living in South America for about a year and had started feeling overly confident. I have been told many times about the dangers of taking a taxi from the street. Some people always take them, and some people never do. It's obviously never worth the risk, but I look obviously foreign, and I should have known better. My cousin says, I always always take street taxis, I'll find us a good cheap one. This was my first time ever taking a street taxi. She finds one and waves me over, looking back, I am flabbergasted as to how I got into an all black car. Again, these cars could just be normal taxis, they exist, but it's even more riskier than taking the yellow ones. The first red flag was how silent he is. After chatting away for some time, we realized it was taking far too long. I could see the smile in my cousin's eyes fade as we both realized at the same time that we are nowhere near home. She asks him, where are we going? and he mumbles under his breath, not really saying anything. We both know at the same time that something is very wrong. I remember vaguely thinking we had just went into a circle and wondering why he'd waited so long to rob us. It had to have been over 30 minutes. He finally gets off the highway and stops the car just past the ramp and we are on a very quiet street. He opens his dashboard and pulls out a gun. I'm terrified to say the least, in that moment, all you think about is surviving. A car drives by and he yells, don't turn your head. He then tells us to give him everything we have. I take off my backpack and even my jacket out of panic. He orders us to hand over our phones, which we oblige. He then says, I will let you go, but if you turn around to look at my license plate, I will come and kill you. He lets us out of the car and we run for it, but we are in a very, very bad area. I'm dressed inappropriately for the area, especially after handing over my jacket. A foreigner wouldn't dare come here. Everyone on the streets was staring at me up and down and one man yells, aren't you going to get cold? I tried to cover myself with my hands as I felt so unsafe. We ask a couple of people to try and contact for help, but what do you know? They 
they have no more minutes on their phone. In South America, it can be very dangerous and very poor. We find no police, but we do find security patrol people. They take us back to their office to contact the police, only for them to tell us we have no data and the phones are broken. So my cousin and I keep walking. It's the middle of the night and we are again in some obscure area. An hour must have passed by now. Then we see a police car and we are running for it. We tell them we had just been robbed and they ask, did you get a license plate number? I reply, no. The police officer shrug and say, he's probably at the club now celebrating all the money he made and proceeded to laugh. I then ask to use their phone to have someone come pick us up to which he says, hurry up, I don't have much data. We get home, but I find out that the person who robbed us used my cousin's phone to contact her family. Luckily, she was already with her parents at the time when they called, but there was a woman in the background crying hysterically, faking to be my cousin and they were trying to get a ransom from her parents. He was never found and nothing was done. I wonder what would have happened if it had just been one of us, and I am grateful that nothing more sinister happened. A week later, my friend and I are ordering a taxi, the safe way of course. While we are waiting, a similar black car pulls up next to us, asking if we need a taxi. We immediately say no. As he drives off, I turn to look at his car, and what do you know, he has no license plate in broad daylight. I'm not insinuating it was the same person. Of course it wasn't, there are over 10 million people in the city. My point is that it happens a lot in South America and never to get too comfortable. This experience made me realize what it's really like to live in a developing country, even if you have money and stay in good areas. You always need to be high alert and no one is immune to the constant fear of, Will I be robbed today? Brief setting in context, I'm a woman in my 30s, caring for my elderly parents, so staying in a downstairs room in my childhood home at the moment. The window faces the main street, which is an average residential street in a fairly quiet area. The bed faces the window. I often leave the window open at night since I need it to be cool to sleep, and I haven't really worried about it, since there's a cabinet with an aquarium in front of the window area, not blocking the window from view, and I can reach to open and close it, but it would make it difficult for someone to climb in. My dog, Sable, also always sleeps in the room with me. While she's a sweet-natured, medium-sized dog who doesn't look the least bit threatening, she's a fantastic guard dog in that she's always alert to any noises and will stand her ground and bark and growl if she senses a threat. So I've never really worried about the open window. After tonight, I won't be able to do it again. It started at maybe 3.30, 4 a.m. sometime. I was awake. Since I care for my parents, I often have disrupted sleep patterns and I'm awake at odd hours. I was reading a book and heard Sable growl, low and deep. Then she jumped off the bed and began pacing a bit, looking up at the window before jumping up at the cabinet by the window, barking. I shouted, hey, we're calling the police, my dog will bite, just in case there was someone there, and went to look out of the curtains to the side. I didn't see anything. I pulled the curtains closed again and made sure to pull the right curtain over, then drew the left side curtain, the one that covers the open part of the window, all the way over, covering the right side curtain too tucking it down so any wind wouldn't be able to move it. I wasn't really alarmed then. It's a fairly quiet residential street, but there are foxes around that we sometimes hear, and occasionally someone passing by or the neighbor's gate next door will make Sable growl or bark, but she doesn't usually react the way she did this time. She'll usually growl but stay on the bed, and her reaction was much stronger than normal. I thought that even if it was someone scooping out the open window to potentially break in, they'd see now that the room was occupied by a person and dog and would go find an easier target, but mainly I guessed it was just a random noise that she heard outside. I was wrong. It was a good half hour or more later after I'd relaxed and thought I might doze off soon. Then I heard her growl again, a really serious deep and low growl, and I listened, again, thinking it might be foxes or something, but I heard what sounded like deep breathing noises. I sat up and looked up at the window and my heart stopped. The curtain had been pulled back and lifted at the bottom, like someone peeking under it, and I could still hear the the heavy breathing. I shouted hey again and moved from the bed to the side of the window so I could see past the curtain and saw the figure of a man move away from the window to the right towards the front door and the exit of the front garden. Too dark to make out features or clothing, it was just a dark male figure. Shaking, I immediately thought that since I knew he'd moved away and wasn't at or under the window, I reached and pulled it shut, grabbed my phone and called 911. One thing that creeps me out in hindsight is that it would have taken a few seconds for me to 
moved from the bed to the side of the window, and that was after I'd shouted and he knew he'd been seen. But he must have stayed there even knowing I'd seen him, until I moved the curtain and could see out. Then he moved away. The heavy breathing also had to be deliberate. It was so loud, like someone trying to frighten me. While on the phone with the police, I went around the ground floor of the house turning lights on, making sure the rest of the house was still secure, and it was. Very careful to lock doors and all the other windows at night, and everything looked undisturbed. Two patrol officers came shortly before 5 a.m. and took the report. They suggested asking the neighbors if they have camera footage and to let them know of a potential prowler in the area tomorrow, and they went to drive around the area, saying that they'd be wanting to know what someone was doing wandering around at 5 a.m., the time the police arrived anyway. Since the dark meant I only saw the shape of a person, no real description, I doubt they can do much. I couldn't even be 100% certain it was a man, but the breathing and the figure I saw instantly made me think male. The outline of his head looked smooth, so either bald or wearing a tight cap, and height would have been probably around 5'8 to 5'10. I'm still shaken, but feeling angry and violated, and wishing we had a camera system now. We'll be looking into that. I never thought anything like that would happen. Don't have any enemies, no recent exes, no one I know of harboring any grudges, since I'm caring for my parents full time now. I'm not out socializing or making any enemies, nor are my elderly and disabled parents. I have to think it was someone who was looking to break into a house, but for the fact that they came back so much later, maybe someone on drugs or having a mental health episode. There's a passage around the side of the house to go from the front to the back of the garden with only a small side gate, meant to keep the dog confined, not designed to keep others out. It would be easy for someone to access against the back of the house. They were bold enough to come back a second time, even knowing a person and a dog were in the room, perhaps hoping I would have fallen asleep by then maybe. This happened a few weeks ago. I work at a gas station and have years of experience in a previous one, so getting this job was a piece of cake. Only this was different as it was lone working. Working 8 hour shifts entirely by yourself. The shifts included night as well. So my shift started early afternoon, about maybe half an hour to my shift, this guy walks in. I've seen him before as he entered the shop the day before and randomly asked me if I had any shopping bags to spare. The guy was giving me some uncomfortable vibes, but luckily someone else else was working with me that day for a short while so I asked them to deal with that guy. My colleague said we don't have anything to spare you and told him bye, the guy leaves. The next day the same guy walks in and I thought, what does he want now? He walks up to the desk and starts chatting to me. He was asking me some advice about his living situation as he told me he used to be homeless. Since to me it's not really my place to give advice, I just shrugged and told him to just sleep on it and think about things. He then left. He didn't enter the store to buy anything at all, just a chat but thinking back I remember that he asked what time I got off and stupidly told him 11 o'clock tonight. I went on with my shift as usual up until about 9.30 p.m. as the same guy returns but with another guy who may I say look dodgy, all dressed in black and hood up. The guy who entered the shop previously pokes his head into the door and asked if I do phone top ups. We do but something in my gut was telling me to make him leave now so I lied and told him we do not. So the guy and his dodgy friend hang outside the store for a bit while I was serving customers then until the shop seemed quiet again, they both entered the store and looked all around the shop. I noticed the dodgy guy kept his hands in his pockets the whole time and then a thought struck me. I might be getting robbed tonight. So I took some deep breaths and tried to keep calm and just thought of my training I repeated in my head. I thought to myself that I should just stand and be ready with one hand under the desk hovering over the panic button. I thought to myself the minute they pull a weapon out on me is when to hit the button as it's silent alarm and just pray the police arrive on time. Well they just ended up buying a bottle of water as of course I did notice there was someone still outside in their car. I felt a huge sigh of relief thinking they just wanted water, or they decided not to rob me because there's another person outside. They both leave the store but again hang around outside, right by the door. Then I see the car drive away and I thought to myself, I don't want these guys in the store again, not while I'm completely alone. So I flip the switch that automatically locks the main door. Half an hour passes, I had no customers and still the two guys are still hanging around outside. I call my boss to tell him what's going on and and to give him a heads up that at some point I'm going to have to call the police and have them move them along as it's making me very anxious. Then another guy shows up and joins the guys all dressed in black and wearing those COVID masks. He also hands his friend's mask too then he makes his way around the back of the store. Then I realize the back door, the one I go out from to smoke. I ran to the back door, slammed it shut and locked it. At this point I was scared for my life as these guys stack around the place to which felt like an hour and a half. I hid in the office watching the cameras. I picked up the phone 
phone and dialed the non-emergency number for the police. At this point, I was really freaking out. The next thing I hear is my cell phone ringing as a colleague calls me to check in on me. I told him what's happening when I came out the office to take a peek and of course, those guys were right up to the window knocking to grab my attention and they saw me with two phones to my ears. They saw me. I said to my colleague on the phone, then I came up with an idea. I put the phone I had making a call to the police down and kept my colleague on the phone. I said, listen, I'm going to see what they want. Stay on the phone. I'm going to put you on speaker. Stay quiet. Don't say a word. Just listen. If you hear me say the till is slow, you hang up and call the police. That's me telling you I'm in danger. So I put him on speaker and hide my phone on my bra. I head to the window. What's up guys? Can I help you? Guy, why is the door locked? That's because we're in night mode right now. Doors are locked, but I can surf through the hatch. What can I get you? They just look at each other and whisper amongst themselves. Guy, we'll just take some smokes and a lighter. Sure, one moment. I grab what they ask and they push a $20 note through. I grab the $20 and of course check it. Then I rang them up, but as I had their change ready, I saw one hand through the hatch. I dropped their change into that hand, avoiding contact. Okay, thanks. I stared them down and they left. I demanded that my shifts are to be changed to morning shifts after that night or I'm quitting. Back when I was around 17 or 18, I would go out to parties with my friend at night. It was my best friend at the time, Ivan, and his cousin Caesar that would invite me out that night. I had been talking to a friend of Ivan on Facebook about meeting each other. This girl had a birthday party that day and invited us all to join her. So I took a bath, got ready, and my friends pulled up for me in a small car. I said bye to my mom and got in, and we went to buy beer for the night and a pack of smokes for everyone. Back then, I would smoke a lot. My friend told us that he had been in contact with this girl Facebook and that she accepted to come to the party with him tonight. We were all impressed and happy for him. We pulled to her house and parked near a park to wait for her. I remember a group of people walking around the park but since they seemed our age we weren't too bummed out. My friend called her to come out and my friend Caesar stepped out for a smoke. I was sitting in the back not wanting to come out because of these guys outside. They seemed to be asking for trouble because they begun to argue about something really dumb with him. So my friend Ivan told me to step out just to have his back in case anything went down. We went to the party and had a great time. I hit it off with the girl I was talking to and later found out she kissed pretty much every dude that was there before me. Nevertheless, I was still grateful for the opportunity and said goodbye. As we headed back to my house of my friend's date, she seemed very quiet. I knew they hit it off during the party but now looked stiff and even scared. My bud and I were riding in the back to let them have the front to themselves but she was just nervously looking at her phone. When we arrived, she wanted to get out and my friend trying to score points said, wait, I'll walk you in. She did not like this and said just go. We were a bit buzzed in the back and wanted to have a smoke so we all stepped outside and watched them go to her door. I remember laughing about something with my friend when the mood suddenly became so dark. She started screaming go now, get out of here. A car pulled out nearly in front of us and people with bats and blunt instruments got off so fast I barely remember how I got back into the back seat. The girl said something along the lines of leave them alone and held him while a bunch of dudes got out. My friend Ivan got into the driving seat and started the car. Thankfully, it started right up without trouble, but a big bottle of liquor then hit the windshield, cracking the top corner. I saw some guys come from the right side of the car where we were standing and quickly went to the other side to let my friend have easy way in into the back right seat. As I turned the corner, I saw this massive looking guy come up to me and barely had time to close the door and pull the lock down. Dude was punching my window. My other friend wasn't so lucky since he actually got hit in the head and had barely made it in the car. He couldn't even close the door because one guy was grabbing his leg. All of this happened in the span of 6 seconds. I acted all out of instinct and thankfully we got in and my friend stepped in the gas while zigzagging in case they would shoot at us. We were all scared and wondered what had happened. As we got back to our neighborhood, my friends were fuming. Both of them knew their way around the fight and could hold their own. Thankfully, I still had some cash left and told them we should go buy some illegal beer at midnight and tried my best to calm them down and convince them to not go back. My friend Caesar had actually woken a dude up in the middle of the night with a phone call and the man was ready to show up and throw down. After a few beers and a lot of talking, I convinced them it wasn't worth it and to just let the night end. I got home and my parents never found out and I just fell asleep. The next few days, my friend Ivan called me and told me that the girl's ex-boyfriend was actually a lead gang member. My heart dropped out of my chest. We had been seconds away from getting beat down and maybe killed by a bunch of people for a date. If it wasn't for our quick reaction and her backing them up a bit, we may have not made it. All I can say is trust your gut and your instincts in the end. It can all happen so fast. Many years ago, before kids, rescue animals, a mortgage, and a husband, I was a travel writer in Europe. 
I did most of my trips alone. The story is about the first time I visited Prague. I had never been to Prague and the trip was last a minute so I had little time to prepare. My travel partner had dumped me in another country and I was determined to make the best out of my trip by visiting a place I'd never been. Upon arrival at the train station, I visited the accommodation office and asked for a hostel not far from the center. In my early 20s, winging it was part of the fun. These days, I'm far less adventurous. The hostel they sent me to was a sprawling, crumbling, slate gray, art decoration building on a nondescript street about a 10 minute walk to Stairmesto. The inside was probably beautiful at one time, but by the time I checked in it was full of shabby, mismatched furniture and cheap stained carpet. Most of the light fixtures were broken, leaving everything but the lobby dark and gloomy. It smelled of standing water and dust. I found my room, a double for $12 per night, and it made note of the fact that I had a roommate. She wasn't there, but on her side of the room there was a suitcase, dressed neatly folded across the back of a plastic chair. A scattered of makeup containers on the beat up desk and a stack of German fashion magazines on the bed. As I had no plans or goals on this impromptu trip, so I spent the afternoon exploring Old Town Square, the Jewish Quarter, and Wenceslas Square. I purchased some Sheck crystal for my mom and painted eggs from a street vendor for myself. I also made reservations for a sunset dinner cruise for one. At around 6 p.m., I returned to my room to shower, change clothes, and unload my purchases. When I left my room about an hour later, there was no indication that my roommate had returned at any point during the day. After the cruise, I stopped at a tiny bar in Tinska and had a glass of wine. It was nearly midnight when I returned to my hostel, so I was surprised to find that my roommate still hadn't returned. That wasn't uncommon though. Backpackers are a fickle lot. She could have gone on a short overnight trip and just left her stuff behind, hooked up with someone and was holed up at their place, or hanging out at another hostel, so I was surprised but not concerned. I took another shower before bed, however, and was surprised to find that things in the room had changed up in my return. Her bed was deeply turned down, the magazines had moved to the nightstand, and the dress was gone. The strangest thing though was the addition of a pink silky nightgown spread across the bed, my bed. Maybe she thought she still had the room to herself. I didn't see how, my shopping bags, clothes, and toiletries were in plain view. I gently moved the nightgown over to her bed and then settled in for the night as I wrote in my journal. I assumed she was in the shower or somewhere nearby so I expected her to return shortly. After about an hour though, her side was still in empty. I needed to use the restroom before I went to sleep so I made one last trip down the hall. The building was unusually quiet. There weren't the regular sounds of chatty backpackers, the clinking of glasses, or music that would normally leak through the walls. There was nothing. It was hushed like a church after the congregation has left. I found myself practically tiptoeing back. My room was near the end of the hall and I couldn't shake the feeling that the corridor was darker than before. The few working lights were blinking as they struggled to stay lit and it reminded me of a fun house. A tightness began to fill my stomach and I subconsciously quickened my steps. There wasn't a soul behind me yet, I kept glancing back over shoulder, convinced I'd see someone gaining momentum on me. The only sound was the soft thud of my flip-flops as they struck my soles. I was flooded with relief as I flung open my door, but it didn't last long. Everything was exactly as it left it, except for the silky nightgown which was now back on my bed. Sleep came in fits and starts. I left the lamp on for a while, still convinced my roommate would be right back, but the shadows it cast made the room even spookier. It was too dark with the light off. I'd finally slipped into a deep sleep when I suddenly heard the door open. A man stood in the darkened doorway, the hall light behind him showing just enough for me to see his contorted face. I didn't mean to, he sobbed. You have to help me. Too confused and disoriented to be scared, I sat up, scrubbed up my eyes, and reached for the lamp switch. But once the room was light, I saw that the door was closed. There was no man. I quickly bounded off the bed and went for the door. It was locked. Nobody could have entered without a key, and the hallway empty. I passed the rest of the night fully clothed, sitting up in my bed, and with the light on. Though I'd pay for two more nights, at 7am I gathered all of my stuff and went down to the reception desk to check out. By the way, I said to the 20-something receptionist, my roommate never returned. I'm a little concerned. She picked up the room key, looked at it hard, frowned, and then glanced at her computer. What room were you in again? When I repeated it to her, she looked back at her screen. Ma'am, that room's been empty for three weeks and it's been clean since. We only have six people in the whole building. The hostel has since been renovated and is now a luxury hotel. 
At the time of the story, it's mid-October, I'm 20 years old and a senior in college. I got out of class at 9pm and headed downtown in my college town to see about an open mic thing that was supposed to be happening at a lounge. And around that time, there was a guy who would play accordion on one of the corners of the main through of air. Didn't find accordion guy, and either the place was closed or it wasn't an open mic night. Don't quite remember. But as I'm walking back down one of the main streets in downtown that heads back onto campus, I came across this very drunk woman begging two other women for a ride home. I think the girls were getting into an Uber or they didn't have space or something. Point is, the other women weren't taking her and couldn't slash wouldn't help her. Mind you, this is a Thursday at 9-ish at night. When she finds that the other women can't help her and I'm walking past, she turns to me to ask for my help getting home. For context, I still have my backpack on. My phone's running low, but I've been at this school and in this town for three years at this point, so I know downtown and campus pretty well on foot. To note, I do not have a car at this point in time. She gives me an address and it's maybe 15 to 20 minutes walk north slightly northeast of where we were at, and I knew the general area where it was, so I was more than happy to be a good Samaritan and walk a drunk woman home who didn't feel safe. I would regret this later. She's incredibly thankful and overjoyed that someone is willing to help her get home. The route we were going to take was super straightforward and I knew exactly where I was in relation to the rest of the town. She says that she has to pee really badly. I reassure her it won't be that long and she'll be back at her place. She says that she was out with her boyfriend and he left her at the bar alone drunk and mad at her about something. Says she's from out of state. I commiserate with her that what he did was bad. She asked me about what I'm studying. I confided that I was finishing a bachelor's of science and in information technology. She's bemoaning this boyfriend that's at home that I'm walking her back to. She keeps trying to walk with me up against my side or slightly behind me and I'm like no walk slightly ahead of me or keep some space. She has a dermal piercing on her cheekbone that's hard to miss. She's getting more and more manic and weird as we walk along. We get about a half a mile into north downtown less than a a mile from the address she gave me, and the boyfriend's calling her and being a real douche. I'm about done with this guy from the stuff she's telling me about this and that and the other thing, so she puts him on speakerphone and I tell him to chill out. We're on such and such road close by. His tone changes in an instant. He goes from hostile and angry to surprisingly chill. That threw up a million more red flags for me. She starts saying that I'm going to have a good time at her house. I'm looking for an exit. Every bone in my body is screaming at me to get out of this situation. We get to the end of the road, which coincides with an intersection that has a gas station. I say, hey, let's stop here to use the bathroom. She says that she doesn't have to use the bathroom anymore. I'm scared. I tell her, well, maybe you don't have to, but I do, which was true. We go into the gas station. I head immediately to the bathroom and text one of my friends asking if she was working and if she could pick me up or if I needed to call the campus safe ride home program. Friend says it'll be a minute if I'm willing to wait. I agree to wait. I come out of the bathroom and this drunk woman, if she was even actually drunk to begin with, has vanished. No Nowhere in the store, nowhere outside that I care to look. I buy a soda and wait for my friend and her friends to come save me, effectively. I am later told that maybe the woman was affiliated with human trafficking, and to be honest, with the vibes and the changes in tone and the narrative that was being spun around me walking this woman home, and how she just completely vanished on me when I got to a safe place with lights and cameras and such, I have to wonder if that wasn't the plan. I won't ever know for certain, but it certainly scared the ever-loving daylights out of me as a 20-year-old. My friend and her friends pull up and take me back to one of their dorms and I spend more of the evening with them so I wasn't alone. Forever thankful for three underclassmen for rescuing me from a gas station at 10 p.m. Last year I was on vacation in southern Europe with a large group of friends. We have been there for a while and always took an Uber from our rented house to the city which had very nice bars and clubs. The thing with Uber is, it allows very cheap and flexible transport but it also opened the door to a lot of creeps. I've had Uber drivers who are super cool but also extremely drugged up road ragers who drive like maniacs and think they're impressive but the guy we had that day was by far the worst. It is late evening and Uber picks us up and drives me. 27 year old male, another one, 25 year old female and 24 year old female to the desired old town where we plan to go clubbing and drink. While driving, the driver constantly looks at the two women in the back seat via the mirror. They only told me this afterwards. He kept starting conversations but basically only addressed the girls who left answering to the guys who gave short non-detailed answers, basically signaling that we, one, don't want to talk and two, don't think he needs to know our plans. To us, he seemed way too pushy and he wasn't really that big on hygiene. 
Meanwhile, we can't wait to arrive at our destination and get out of this uncomfortable but not super horrible situation. But that stuff did not feel this great. When this guy didn't stop on the road, but instead pulled into a parking spot, he started fumbling with his phone and we were like, alright, weird, but let's get out, and left the car. To our surprise, the guy then turned the car off and got out as well. We saw that red flag and just started walking away towards the bar area of the town without saying a word. Cars can't enter the old town. After 400 feet, once we reached the gates, we stopped because this was the meeting spot for the other half of our group, who took a separate Uber, and found out that this guy was following us and stopped as well. You know the classic circle people form while talking, where one guy is just kind of standing next to it because people don't let him in? Yeah, we did that. We started making conversation about how long the others will take to get here, where they are right now, etc. And this guy keeps throwing in comments like he is a part of the group. Oh cool, even more people. This must be a great evening. Then we texted our friends at a group chat that we are changing their meeting place to this bar, because the Uber driver is following us around and we want to lose him. So one of us started leading the group at a quick pace through the streets. They are very small, lots of people, high old town buildings all around them. We make turns at every corner trying to lose the guy, but he follows. Finally, we reached a big plaza where there were hundreds of people closely together, basically queuing to enter the narrow street up ahead. We pushed through like rude douchebags and successfully lost the guy. Finally, we could head straight to the bar after our detour and linked up with the other part of our group. Two hours pass, life is all good. We decide to head to another bar a bit further away because the drinks and prices kind of sucked in this one. We had two drinks in that bar and guess who walks through the door and stands next to the table? That guy. Hey guys, he says. At this point, a friend, 28 year old male, who is good at communicating and frankly quite big, tells the guy that we want to keep to ourselves and have no interest in hanging out with him. Please leave us alone. Fortunately, the guy says it is no problem and leaves. Unfortunately, at around 3 a.m., while dancing in the crowd at a club, the same guy announced his presence by tenderly pressing his body against the back of one of the girls who he has been staring at through the mirror in the car. The girl's boyfriend recognizes the guy, gets angry, grabs him by the collar, and essentially tells him that if he keeps following us, he will get beaten up. A bouncer sees this and approaches them. I start talking to the bouncer, who is super annoyed by anyone intervening at first, but after hearing how this guy stalked us from this car to this club, he just asks the Uber guy a few questions, then proceeds to throw him out. We stayed a bit longer than we wanted, in hopes of him not waiting for us. After that, we reported the guy for being a creep in the app and called another Uber, which thankfully wasn't him. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. Two years ago, I moved to the UK for university as I always wanted to go there and get away from my parents as the situation at home was beginning to become too bad for me. In first year at uni, I moved into a student accommodation and met some really great people. It was a good year without meeting my boyfriend, who I'm still with and just enjoying my time away from my family and discovering what independence really meant. Anyhow, as second year came by, I decided with some friends to move into a house rented by student accommodations, but at least we had our own house and weren't restricted as much with noise and parties as living in a small shared flat like in first year. No, I had a ground floor room and my window gave into a very small backyard in which I would go smoke every day as I am a smoker and in which there would be a very thin wooden door giving into the other side of the street where you would put your bins and broken chairs blah blah. The door could only be closed and locked from inside the backyard but since it was an old door we had to attach some strings to keep it closed for good. I had neighbors on each side of the house so we were surrounded by families and some other student accommodations. The neighbors on the right of us were five boys who looked way over the age of being in university. They were strange, so to say. I met one of them outside of our house one day because of a police intervention due to one of his flatmates attacking him and the others with a kitchen knife and burning their kitchen down. I heard some screams and so I went outside with my flatmates and saw one of them having cuts everywhere on his arm and a wound on his head inflicted by a kitchen knife. Me and my flatmates didn't know what to do so we offered him our help to clean himself and gave him an old t-shirt to change out of his clothes. We then saw the guy who hurt these flatmates being escorted out by the police and into a van and driven off to be arrested. I don't know anything more about the story, the police didn't really tell us anything else. Anyway, the guy who we helped was quite weird. He said a lot of BS and kept trying to grab me and flirt with me, but we just wanted to make sure he was okay as we didn't know him. Then after some time had passed, I would go to uni and come back home and see him quite often in the street and just never said a word to him again. But 
one day he came up to me in the street while I went to the corner shop and started talking to me weirdly and I didn't feel comfortable at all with that for some reason so I just didn't respond to him. He then just said, oh that's okay, I'll just wait in front of your house then and we can talk further. No need to say I was creeped out and just thought he was joking. So I bought my drink at the shop and headed back to my street and as I turned into the street where my house was, I saw him with his flatmate sitting on my doorstep and waiting for me. So I went back to the corner shop and called my only guy flatmate to ask him to open the door and tell the guys to go away, but obviously he wasn't home and no one else was there either. So I literally just waited it out until they left about an hour later and then sprinted back home and locked the front door. Note, my front door had a glass panel on it where you would be able to kind of make out who was standing in front of it. After this already pretty scary encounter, I just tried to avoid the guy and mostly succeeded for a while. But then one day, as I went smoking in the backyard, I noticed that the wooden door, which is always closed, was open, and the strings that were put there to keep it closed were cut off. For whatever reason, I didn't think anything of it and just closed the door again and put a new string on it, thinking it was one of my flatmates who took the bins out and just didn't tie it back. The weird neighbors would very often scream and yell and fight in their house, and it would take me and my flatmates up in the middle of the night, but we kind of just got used to it after a while. But one evening, my boyfriend slept over like he usually did, and he, who usually never ever wakes up because of a noise, woke up in the middle of the night because of a bang and some whispering. I was sound asleep so he very silently woke me up and we both just waited in the dark and listened for any other noises. Suddenly, we heard the wooden door just bang, just shot open and some footsteps next to my window. I always had my window open because it would get really warm inside, so we both just froze. And then we heard the door leading to the backyard get shaken softly as if they were trying to get inside, and then they stopped. Luckily, we had the curtains closed so they couldn't see us, but we were ready to get dressed and get out of the room and lock them in if they came in from the window. Then we just heard my window move and get more opened, and one of the guys saying, something in a different language that we didn't understand and started hearing them trying to get in. My boyfriend and I just shot up out of bed, took my phone, and put clothes on and ran out of the room and out of the house. So I then called my flatmates and told them to lock themselves in their rooms and then the police, who luckily came in less than five minutes as the headquarters were a couple of streets down from us. I don't remember anything after the police came, I think me and my boyfriend were in shock. They ended up catching one guy, the other fled and was later found a few streets up smoking weed. The police told us that they were inside of their house and found a lot of meth and heroin, and that they were carrying a massive kitchen knife with them. I was so confused as I've never done anything to offend or do anything wrong to my neighbors, so the idea of them breaking in with whatever knows what intentions with the kitchen knife terrorized me and my boyfriend. The two guys ended up being arrested and one of them was put in prison for two years for carrying a weapon with intention to harm. I never heard anything else from the police and I moved back home a few months later. I was 17 when this story happened 3 years ago now. I was working at an old pizza shop right on the edge of my town. For context, the town I was in was an affluent, suburban town surrounded by a bypass which loops around the town. Around my town is some farmland and main roads, where all the blue collar workers moved to after the town was gentrified 10-15 to 15 years back. The pizza shop was around 20 years and was very catered to these same blue collar workers. It's around 9pm and a call comes in for 2 pizzas and a 2 liter of soda. I'm the only driver in, so I have to take the delivery out. It's about a 10 minute drive to get to the location. There I have to drive up a long, gravel driveway that took about 5 minutes to get up. My car really couldn't handle the gravel and how rough it was. Arriving at the place I see a nice house and two barns plotted across the land, with wheat 5-6 to six feet tall surrounding the whole property. Being at this place when I felt truly all alone really started to make my anxiety flare. I decided to call the number on the order because I have no idea where this guy wants me to go and drop off his food. After about another 5 minutes of absolute silence, the man picks up. He had a very deep and raspy voice, like he's been a career smoker, which didn't do anything to help me feel better. I was told to meet him at his truck at the far barn on his property. I am now properly scared as my mind races of all the worst possible things that could happen to me. I pull myself together and muster further into this guy's property. I see the man's truck as I round one of those cylinder storage units where I see his F-150 and him inside. Instead of getting out, I call him and ask him how we should do the transaction. In that same deep voice he instructs me to get out of my car and to put all the food onto his truck bed. Since he paid with his credit card already, I thought this would have been over in 10 seconds. I do what he tells me to do and walk over to the passenger window so that he can sign his receipt. The man looks to be around his mid 40s, heavy set with a scraggly black beard and a trucker hat. My mind was already racing on being kidnapped or murdered so I really didn't feel safe around this guy. I ask him if he has a pen on him because I forgot to bring one. I was pretty bad at my job 
job and he did not have any cash on him. He stares at me with these cold eyes and points into the back of his truck saying to me, if you ask me for a tip I'm going to be sticking this tip down your throat, where he has a double barrel shotgun just in the back of his car. I'm frozen in fear as I'm registering that this man has just threatened to kill me. The only thing I can muster out is okay and I get back into my car and I get out of that farm. I was going so fast that I screwed up my car from my car bouncing around on that gravel path. I go 80 all the way back to the pizza parlor where I tell my co-workers what happened. None of my co-workers took me seriously and just thought I was playing this up for a joke. I go home and forget about it pretty quickly, but a year later I'm working the lunch shift and the same man calls in and orders a pizza. Now at this point I am refusing to take this order. The pizza place I was working at wasn't doing well business wise, so it's on its last legs already. So management forced me into going anyways. It was only 1 to 2 p.m. on a Sunday, so at least my fear of the dark would be covered. I get there and the man is waiting for me at his actual house. He recognized me and out of all things started apologizing to me for what he said. He was excusing it saying that he just started going through a divorce and was struggling with his emotions. I just wanted the whole thing to be over with and he gave me $60 for what happened. When I was 6 years old, I attended the elementary school which is located in our small town. My way to and from school was basically just 500 meters of main road before turning into the street where I lived. At the time, we're talking about the late 90s here. All the parents in the town were extremely adamant on telling their kids not to trust or follow strangers. Never get into anyone's car, even if they say they know your parents and are friends. The reason why, there was a murder 3 years back in the same town. A girl, not even 6 years old, was found dead in a field. The strange thing about it is, nobody knows how exactly she was taken, no signs of forced entry or anything, which implies somebody lured her somewhere without her suspecting a thing. The case still hasn't been solved more than 20 years later, so our parents were very afraid that their kid was going to be next, because kids can be really stupid and you can't watch them 24-7. Now onto what almost happened to me. I was walking home from elementary school, about halfway home, at the shadiest and mostly covered by trees and bushes area, a car pulled up next to me. A blonde about 30-ish year old woman was the driver. She told me she could drive me home. She claimed to be going in that direction anyway, which was unclear to me at the time. Essentially BS because once the road ends near my house, there is nothing but empty fields. Kid-like as I was, I was not suspicious and was like, oh no, it's not that far, I can walk. Then she started becoming more insistent. The whole, oh come on, it is fine, nothing to worry about, and you can relax instead of walking thing. The alarm bells only started ringing when she said she knew my mother. They are friends and supposedly she was asked by her to drive me home. Thank god for my parents repeatedly talking about the tricks that people use to lure you in. I started being creeped out, continued to walk, but she kept driving beside me. Now the real weird part in hindsight was her next attempt to get me to the car. She started saying that I was obviously afraid and cool children are not afraid of such things. If you want to be cool you should just relax. Honestly, I did not fully realize the full extent of the situation. I just felt uncomfortable and wanted to get out of this conversation so I just started sprinting the rest of my way back to my house. Once I got home, I stayed right next to the door and kept looking out of the window for a few minutes. And guess who drove by and basically checked out the house, that creepy woman. The road was a dead end road, and only after 3 more minutes the car came back the same way. It took years until I realized what kind of bullet I dodged there. All I was thinking was, my parents told me not to do this. I didn't know why or what that woman wanted. The drill of hearing over and over again not to believe strangers or get into their car kicked in. Moral of the story is, even if your kids are too stupid or young, like I was, to comprehend such things, the rules of not following strangers and the fact that strangers will lie to you for evil intentions must be drilled into your child's head like watching both ways when crossing the road. Two years ago I moved to the UK for university as I always wanted to go there and get away from my parents as the situation at home was beginning to become too bad for me. In first year at uni, I moved into a student accommodation and met some really great people. It was a good year without meeting my boyfriend, who I'm still with and just enjoying my time away from my family and discovering what independence really meant. Anyhow, as second year came by, I decided with some friends to move into a house rented by student accommodations, but at least we had our own house and 
and weren't restricted as much with noise and parties as living in a small shared flat like in first year. No, I had a ground floor room and my window gave into a very small backyard in which I would go smoke every day as I am a smoker and in which there would be a very thin wooden door giving into the other side of the street where you would put your bins and broken chairs blah blah. The door could only be closed and locked from inside the backyard but since it was an old door we had to attach some strings to keep it closed for good. I had neighbors on each side of the house so we were surrounded by families and some other student accommodations. The neighbors on the right of us were five boys who looked way over the age of being in university. They were strange so to say. I met one of them outside of our house one day because of a police intervention due to one of his flatmates attacking him and the others with a kitchen knife and burning their kitchen down. I heard some screams and so I went outside with my flatmates and saw one of them having cuts everywhere on his arm and a wound on his head inflicted by a kitchen knife. Me and my flatmates didn't know what to do so we offered him our help to clean himself and gave him an old t-shirt to change out of his clothes. We then saw the guy who hurt these flatmates being escorted out by the police and into a van and driven off to be arrested. I don't know anything more about the story, the police didn't really tell us anything else. Anyway, the guy who we helped was quite weird. He said a lot of BS and kept trying to grab me and flirt with me, but we just wanted to make sure he was okay as we didn't know him. Then after some time had passed, I would go to uni and come back home and see him quite often in the street and just never said a word to him again. But one day, he came up to me in the street while I went to the corner shop and started talking to me weirdly and I didn't feel comfortable at all with that for some reason so I just didn't respond to him. He then just said, oh that's okay, I'll just wait in front of your house then and we can talk further. No need to say I was creeped out and just thought he was joking. So I bought my drink at the shop and headed back to my street and as I turned into the street where my house was, I saw him with his flatmate sitting on my doorstep and waiting for me. So I went back to the corner shop and called my only guy flatmate to ask him to open the door and tell the guys to go away but obviously he wasn't home and no one else was there either. So I literally just waited it out until they left about an hour later and then sprinted back home and locked the front door. Note, my front door had a glass panel on it where you would be able to kind of make out who was standing in front of it. After this already pretty scary encounter, I just tried to avoid the guy and mostly succeeded for a while. But then one day, as I went smoking in the backyard, I noticed that the wooden door, which is always closed, was open and the strings that were put there to keep it closed were cut off. For whatever reason, I didn't think anything of it and just closed the door again and put a new string on it, thinking it was one of my flatmates who took the bins out and just didn't tie it back. The weird neighbors would very often scream and yell and fight in their house and it would take me and my flatmates up in the middle of the night but we kind of just got used to it after a while. But one evening, my boyfriend slept over like he usually did and he, who usually never ever wakes up because of a noise, woke up in the middle of the night because of a bang and some whispering. I was sound asleep so he very silently woke me up and we both just waited in the dark and listened for any other noises. Suddenly, we heard the wooden door just bang, just shot open and some footsteps next to my window. I always had my window open because it would get really warm inside, so we both just froze. And then we heard the door leading to the backyard get shaken softly as if they were trying to get inside, and then they stopped. Luckily, we had the curtains closed so they couldn't see us, but we were ready to get dressed and get out of the room and lock them in if they came in from the window. Then we just heard my window move and get more opened, and one of the guys saying something in a different language that we didn't understand and started hearing them trying to get in. My boyfriend and I just shot up out of bed, took my phone, and put clothes on and ran out of the room and out of the house. So I then called my flatmates and told them to lock themselves in their rooms and then the police, who luckily came in less than five minutes as the headquarters were a couple of streets down from us. I don't remember anything after the police came, I think me and my boyfriend were in shock. They ended up catching one guy, the other fled and was later found a few streets up smoking weed. The police told us that they were inside of their house and found a lot of meth and heroin, and that they were carrying a massive kitchen knife with them. I was so confused as I've never done anything to offend or do anything wrong to my neighbors, so the idea of them breaking in with whatever knows what intentions with the kitchen knife terrorized me and my boyfriend. The two guys ended up being arrested and one of them was put in prison for two years for carrying a weapon with intention to harm. I never heard anything else from the police and I moved back home a few months later. I was 17 when this story happened 3 years ago now. I was working at an old pizza shop right on the edge of my town. For context, the town I was in was an affluent, suburban town surrounded by a bypass which loops around the town. Around my town is some farmland and main roads, where all the blue collar workers moved to after the town was gentrified 10-15 to 15 years back. The pizza shop was around 20 years and was very catered to these same blue collar workers. It's around 9pm and a call comes in for 2 pizzas and a 2 liter of soda. 
I'm the only driver in, so I have to take the delivery out. It's about a 10 minute drive to get to the location. There I have to drive up a long gravel driveway that took about 5 minutes to get up. My car really couldn't handle the gravel and how rough it was. Arriving at the place I see a nice house and two barns plotted across the land, with wheat 5 to 6 feet tall surrounding the whole property. Being at this place when I felt truly all alone really started to make my anxiety flare. I decided to call the number on the order because I have no idea where this guy wants me to go and drop off his food. After about another 5 minutes of absolute silence, the man picks up. He had a very deep and raspy voice, like he's been a career smoker, which didn't do anything to help me feel better. I was told to meet him at his truck at the far barn on his property. I am now properly scared as my mind races of all of the worst possible things that could happen to me. I pull myself together and muster further into this guy's property. I see the man's truck as I round one of those cylinder storage units where I see his F-150 and him inside. Instead of getting out I call him and ask him how we should do the transaction and that same deep voice he instructs me to get out of my car and to put all the food onto his truck bed. Since he paid with his credit card already I thought this would have been over in 10 seconds. I do what he tells me to do and walk over to the passenger window so that he can sign his receipt. The man looks to be around his mid 40s, heavy set with a scraggly black beard and a trucker hat. My mind was already racing on being kidnapped or murdered so I really didn't feel safe around this guy. I ask him if he has a pen on him because I forgot to bring one, I was pretty bad at my job and he did not have any cash on him. He stares at me with these cold eyes and points into the back of his truck saying to me, if you ask me for a tip I'm going to be sticking this tip down your throat, where he has a double barrel shotgun just in the back of his car. I'm frozen in fear as I'm registering that this man has just threatened to kill me. The only thing I can muster out is okay and I get back into my car and I get out of that farm. I was going so fast that I screwed up my car from my car bouncing around on that gravel path. I go 80 all the way back to the pizza parlor where I tell my co-workers what happened. None of my co-workers took me seriously and just thought I was playing this up for a joke. I go home and forget about it pretty quickly, but a year later I'm working the lunch shift and the same man calls in and orders a pizza. Now at this point I am refusing to take this order. The pizza place I was working at wasn't doing well business wise, so it's on its last legs already, so management forced me into going anyways. It was only 1 to 2pm on a Sunday so at least my fear of the dark would be covered. I get there and the man is waiting for me at his actual house. He recognized me and out of all things started apologizing to me for what he said. He was excusing it saying that he just started going through a divorce and was struggling with his emotions. I just wanted the whole thing to be over with and he gave me $60 for what happened. When I was 6 years old, I attended the elementary school which is located in our small town. My way to and from school was basically just 500 meters of main road before turning into the street where I lived. At the time, we're talking about the late 90s here. All the parents in the town were extremely adamant on telling their kids not to trust or follow strangers. Never get into anyone's car, even if they say they know your parents and are friends. The reason why, there was a murder 3 years back in the same town. A girl, not even 6 years old, was found dead in a field. The strange thing about it is, nobody knows how exactly she was taken, no signs of forced entry or anything, which implies somebody lured her somewhere without her suspecting a thing. The case still hasn't been solved more than 20 years later, so our parents were very afraid that their kid was going to be next, because kids can be really stupid and you can't watch them 24-7. Now onto what almost happened to me. I was walking home from elementary school, about halfway home, at the shadiest and mostly covered by trees and bushes area, a car pulled up next to me. A blonde about 30-ish year old woman was the driver. She told me she could drive me home. She claimed to be going in that direction anyway, which was unclear to me at the time. Essentially BS because once the road ends near my house, there is nothing but empty fields. Kid-like as I was, I was not suspicious and was like, oh no, it's not that far, I can walk. Then she started becoming more insistent. The whole, oh come on, it is fine, nothing to worry about, and you can relax instead of walking thing. The alarm bells only started ringing when she said she knew my mother. They are friends and supposedly she was asked by her to drive me home. Thank god for my parents repeatedly talking about the tricks that people use to lure you in. I started being creeped out, continued to walk, but she kept driving beside me. Now the real weird part in hindsight was her next attempt to get me into the car. She started saying that I was obviously afraid and cool children are not afraid of such things. If you want to be cool you should just relax. Honestly, I did not fully realize the full extent of the situation. I just felt uncomfortable and wanted to get out of this conversation 
conversation, so I just started sprinting the rest of my way back to my house. Once I got home, I stayed right next to the door and kept looking out of the window for a few minutes. And guess who drove by and basically checked out the house, that creepy woman. The road was a dead end road, and only after 3 more minutes the car came back the same way. It took years until I realized what kind of bullet I dodged there. All I was thinking was, my parents told me not to do this. I didn't know why or what that woman wanted. The drill of hearing over and over again not to believe strangers or get into their car kicked in. Moral of the story is, even if your kids are too stupid or young, like I was, to comprehend such things, the rules of not following strangers and the fact that strangers will lie to you for evil intentions must be drilled into your child's head like watching both ways when crossing the road. Last night, my 25 year old husband woke me up at around 11.50 to tell me that someone has been knocking on our door and ringing our apartment doorbell for about 10 minutes on and off. He woke me so I could possibly ID the person. Once I looked out our upstairs apartment window, I saw the man walking to his car in our apartment parking lot, across the street from our unit. He was wearing blue jeans and a grey t-shirt. He was a medium build, possibly a 30 year old blonde man. He wasn't covering his face or anything, but the thing is, he was carrying what looked like resistance bands or rope. He sat in his car for around 3 minutes while I was on the phone with dispatch. Then he came back to our door and knocked hard for another few minutes. Dispatch advised me that the police were on their way and they hung up. I started videoing the vehicle. I read out the tag number and make and model and just watched as he put his car in park in reverse over and over again. Out of seemingly nowhere, he backed out of the parking lot and started rushing away, but not before the officer arrived and pulled him over. My downstairs neighbor knocked on my door and told me that he had been peering into her little children's windows and was pounding on her door as well. She said that her husband had left only one minute before he started knocking at her door. She said he saw her children through the window and that's why he continued knocking. Our doors are right next to one another, so he probably didn't know what door he wanted opened. He was watching us as well through our upstairs windows, so I turned all the lights out and shut the blinds while I called dispatch. The police never contacted us for a statement. I've reached out to dispatch about an update and I'm waiting to see if any action was taken. We're keeping our eyes peeled to see if he's been following us. I'm replacing my porch light bulbs with motion detectors and putting bars in our window and door tracks. My neighbor and our families are panicked to say the least. He was outside for about 25 to 30 minutes. Update. I am trained in firearm usage and now live in a state where I can open carry and the background check is really quick. We are going this weekend to get a firearm. My husband will be taking some classes as he came from somewhere where owning a gun is illegal so he's never handled one. I am still waiting on a call from the responding officer. I have his badge number and name so if they don't reach out to me today or tonight, he might work third shift, I will call the substation. If they didn't do anything, I will go ahead and make a suspicious person case for the paper trail. We had no odd encounters last night. However, while I was looking at the video I took, I remember that car. I was walking my dog at 8pm a week ago from him to pee, and this car was driving really slowly through the parking lot and parked a few spots down from where I was letting my dog sniff. They just sat there with the car running. When I tell you my ears started ringing and I got an awful feeling, I'm not joking. I turned around and went home, didn't give my dog the chance to pee, and shut every door window. I think this man has been stalking out our apartment building, me and my neighbors, and I think he wanted to get in where those children are. I'll update more when I have new information. Update 2. It's been a week since the incident. I called the dispatch today because I'd never received a follow-up from the responding officer. A sergeant from the PD called me back to give me more information. He said that they pulled over the man, ran him to make sure that there were no warrants, and asked him what he was doing. He told the officer that he was meeting up with an acquaintance. The officer let him go with no further questions. I about lost my mind. The sergeant I spoke to today said, stated that he should have looked into it more. It was obviously an attempt at burglary, with whatever knows what intentions. The responding officer is supposed to call me tonight when he gets on duty. I'm livid honestly. Zero due diligence for this case, but there's not even a case. No case number, just a documented police contact. I'll give more info when I have it. Final update. The officer finally called me. Here's how the conversation went. I answered groggily. It was well past midnight. Hello miss, I was told you have some questions about an incident a few nights ago. Yes, about Thursday. I wanted to know what the man told you he was doing. You know, he was looking at windows and carrying potential restraints. I'm not sure if that was relayed to you. I stopped him, ran his tags, and he told me that he was meeting up with a guy from a dating app. He seemed forthcoming and open with his motive for being there. Meeting up with Wade, he was meeting up with someone by looking at windows, knocking on two different doors for 20 minutes. I was shocked and still not fully awake. Like I said, he seemed forthcoming and honest with me. With resistance bands, like workout bands, he had lots of belongings in his car, 
so he just probably had them in there right but bringing them to a hookup knocking on multiple doors he saw the little girls through the window he waited until my neighbor's husband left until knocking that's on tape officer i checked in with the apartment management after the incident well i'm familiar with this individual and i've been doing drive throughs of your complex to make sure he doesn't come back i haven't seen anything if you don't have any more questions i'll let you go ma'am doesn't make sense to me but thank you goodbye and i hung up I don't have much to say, I just feel so icky about that conversation. Nothing new has come of the situation. I haven't seen the man or the car. My mind is blown at the lack of follow up or due diligence. I live in a suburb, it's not a busy one either. The PD has a small jurisdiction. Guess I'll have to protect myself. I was 24 at the time, working in a nightclub about a 10 minute walk from my home. I used to close on Tuesday nights slightly earlier than most nights as it was generally our slowest night of the week, closing around 12am instead of keeping customers until 2.30am. Usually I'd be the only one left as I'd start cutting staff as the night went on and since it was a slower day of the week, we didn't have security on. About 2 months in of regularly closing at 12am, I was walking home. I used to bring bulkier clothes to hide my figure when leaving alone as I've been followed and chased multiple times before and we'd often get men waiting after hours for us girls to come out knowing we'd eventually come out after closing and didn't want to attract attention to myself. I also used to walk home as I didn't have a car and had a few terrifying experiences with uber drivers not actually driving me home, turning out to be fake cab slash uber drivers or harassing me until I pretended to show interest or give them some way of contacting me to which uber would just give me a $5 coupon for the trouble, but that's a story for another other time. The bar was located along a main road that was home to the majority of the other bars and restaurants in the city downtown. Often at this time I'd maybe see a handful of people but the streets were generally empty. I'm walking and notice a parked car about a block away. The driver noticed me and U-turns around to be on the same side of the street as me. Now he's catcalling me and trying to get me to come into his car. I don't engage and keep walking. We're maybe a block or two past the initial spot I saw him and he's been slowly driving alongside the sidewalk. I'd crossed the street but didn't want to get near his car. He keeps this up until about halfway mark when he takes off in his car and I'm just relieved he's gone. He then comes blasting back down the road. Now my walk is turned into a light jog which then turns me into full on running. I'm running behind closed bars and businesses now trying to find a back route to get home without him seeing where I live. At one point, I'm running through bushes and mud. No matter what street I end up on, his car is waiting for me. Eventually, I run right in front of his car while it's parked on the side street beside my place and run into my house through the back entrance. The back entrance is obscured by plenty of trees and car, and the surrounding houses are multiple unit homes, so I was confident he didn't see what door I got in through. Fast forward to the following Tuesday, and I'm walking home. Guess whose car is parked at the halfway mark? This went on for the next four Tuesdays, except he started parking on the street in front of my house until I begged my manager to take me off closing that specific shift. The last time I saw him, one of the apartment buildings along the way had a few cop cars and cops standing around the entrance and I stayed with them which led them to drive off for the night. A week passes and I'm no longer on that shift. A co-worker of mine sends me a news article via text. I open it and see that the man who's been following me was arrested for doing this to multiple girls in the city along the street my work was on and that I lived on. He got caught because he'd followed a university student up to her house and wouldn't drive away. She called the cops and he was still there by the time they came to arrest him. He got out the next day I believe and was arrested a few more times and was put on restrictions. Couldn't be out of his parents house between certain hours unaccompanied by either parent before he was deported. I've also heard he didn't actually get deported but I moved away shortly after and didn't keep up with the news on him. It was a Wednesday night in the summer. I was off work, my husband was out of town, and our son was staying at his grandma's for the night. I was home alone with my dogs, an 80 pound Aussie mix and my 80 pound German Shepherd slash Pitbull mix. I always have issues sleeping when I'm home alone, so I tend to just binge watch TV in the living room until I can't keep my eyes open anymore. This particular night, I remember that the trash pickup comes the next day. I decided to turn on Game of Thrones for a bit, then I would take the trash out. All of a sudden, I realized it's 1.30am 
them and I still haven't taken the trash out to the curb. My house has two solid iron gates, one in the front and one to the side door slash backyard. Lighting on our street or anywhere in our neighborhood isn't that great, but it's a quiet neighborhood with a lot of families and you rarely hear about crime here. I looked out the window by habit before I took the trash out and saw who I thought was my neighbor, smoking a cigarette outside of his gate across the street looking directly at me. For context, this is a normal occurrence. My neighbor across the street hides smoking cigarettes from his wife, so he typically does it late at night in front of his gate. I get off of work late, so I usually see him and we wave, say hi, chat a little, then I go inside and he makes the joke, you didn't see me smoking if my wife asks. So unbothered by seeing the guy, I go outside, grab my trash cans, open my squeaky iron gate, and take them out to the curb. I did not have my glasses on at the time, so as usual I waved and said hello. However, the guy, who I thought was my neighbor, threw down the cigarette and quickly walked off down the street. It took a minute for me to register that he was not my neighbor. I was a little creeped out because he was clearly staring into my window from the opposite sidewalk, but also maybe it was a guy taking a night walk. Not unusual in our neighborhood, and just stopped for a cigarette. I thought I probably weirded him out as much as he weirded me out, went back inside and laid on the couch with my dogs to keep watching Game of Thrones. At some point, I fell asleep and I woke up hearing my gate squeak and my German Shepherd mix growling. He's extremely protective of our family at home, but he's also the kind of dog you can take anywhere because he's so friendly in public. My Aussie mix is more passive, but his sheer size and scary bark tends to deter people. He's very friendly though. I quickly got up and pulled back my curtain. My gate was still shut and I didn't see anything. My dog, however, continued to growl at my front door. I looked out another window, which had a better view of my front yard and porch. I didn't see anything. Eventually, my dog settled back down with my other dog, but I was still uneasy. I ended up watching TV again because I couldn't go back to sleep. About an hour later, I definitely heard my gate squeak. We are the only ones with a heavy cast iron gate and the noise it makes is so distinct. So I look out the curtain while my dogs are continuing to softly growl. My gate is halfway open but I don't see anyone. At this point, I'm panicking. In my panic, I couldn't find my phone. I grabbed my wooden baseball bat out of our room, crouched down, and started going through the couch cushions to get my phone. My dogs are oddly still quietly growling instead of barking, so I assumed no one was there. The minute I find my phone, my front door handle starts shaking. I run to the side door to let my German Shepherd mix out. I know he'll protect me and he can jump the 6 foot back gate. My Aussie mix, going crazy, bust out of one of our door side lights. I heard the guys say, oh crap, and immediately, I let out my German Shepherd mix. I jumped up to look out the window, saw my dog latch on the guy's hand, the guy starts screaming and takes off down the street, my dog chasing him. I then become terrified he'll hurt my dog, so I run out with my baseball bat, screaming my dog's name over and over. The next thing I know, my dog is prancing down the street back to me, happy with blood all over his face. I called the police. They took another hour or so to show up and didn't seem to take me too seriously. They said they'd call local hospitals, but I never heard back. I called my husband bawling and he got on the next flight home. I stayed at his mom's for a few days, too terrified to go home. I did buy my dog's giant ribeyes for being so good in saving me. I don't know what that guy wanted, but since then I've been trained in firearms and self-defense. Quick backstory, I have had a stalker for about 4 years. He was never aggressive or sent me proper threats, so stubborn as I am, I did my best to ignore him and not give him the satisfaction of showing him any fear. His stalking behavior mostly just consisted of sending me letters and gifts, such as photos of my own apartment building from the outside, things he dug out of my trash can and so on. I called the police many times but they weren't able to or really tried to be honest catch or identify him. About 3 weeks ago, I discovered the AITA subreddit and thought that people might want to know about what it's like to have a stalker. Since I barely use any social media aside from reddit and have no personally identifying information here, I didn't think he'd ever see it. One person even asked, does he know you're putting him on blast on reddit? And I answered, maybe. Maybe would make him angry, maybe he'd be turned on. Don't know, don't care. Well, I know the real answer now. He did see it and he did not like it. Like I said, he was never aggressive and never came close to me. The closest I know of was when he sent me a picture of myself. Unlocking my apartment door, take it from the corner of the steps above. I'm thinking that he might have hit a camera there instead of being there to take the photo himself. I think I would have noticed him if he did. I don't know how he got wind of the AITA post I made, but he did. The next week was quiet, no letters, and I didn't see him anywhere. Then, he left me letters with printed out questions and my answers from the AITA post. He also left me with a long, hateful letter towards my boyfriend about an issue I had posted on the AITA subreddit. His letters were never hateful like that before, though he 
never seemed happy with my boyfriend. He wrote about how I should share the spotlight with him since I got so much attention thanks to him. A few days later, I got a gift, but this time he didn't leave it in my mailbox or at my car like he usually did. No, this time he left it inside the apartment building right in front of my door. I didn't take it inside my apartment but opened it outside. It was a pretty big box, which was also unusual, and it was taped shut. As I'm typing it out now, I realized that wasn't a good idea at all and could have ended badly for me. But luckily, he didn't send me anything deadly or anything. He did, however, send me several zip ties, a roll of tape, the kind you use to tape off walls when painting, nothing you could use to restrain someone, a TV remote with most buttons picked off, a pack of band-aids with a few used ones, not actually, just made to look that way according to the police, and a framed picture of me. I could tell the picture was taken a few days ago and my boyfriend was next to me but cut out of the photo. The frame was shattered and the package was full of glass shards, clearly more than just what could have fallen out of the frame and they were also intentionally put inside the crumbled newspaper that was stuffed in there to keep it all in place. I called the police right away and gave it to them. They were more concerned this time, finally, thanks. It told me they'd send patrol cars more frequently. He didn't show up or leave me any letters or gifts for about another week and a half. But eight days ago, it started again. I found letters in my mailbox where he wrote about how he wasted his time on me, how I haven't been appreciating his effort, how he was wrong about me being special. Five days ago, I left my apartment in the morning and heard a crunch sound as I stepped onto my doormat. He put broken glass under it in the night. I went off to work because I was in a hurry and was just going to make my boyfriend call the police, but then I found my car had also been vandalized. The sides were scratched, lights smashed, and the windshield had a phrase painted on. It's time soon, miss, my last name. I went back inside and called the cops myself. They found the same phrase on a note under the doormat. This time, they really, really, really took me seriously, which might have been because I was just pissed at this point, which I made very clear. All of this, the letters, gifts, photos, even the glass under my doormat are just really annoying and inconvenient, but my car was useless to me now and the threat scared me even more. I did, however, have a dash cam in my car, and it caught everything. The police said they took the footage as evidence, even though the dash cam footage wasn't of high quality, and I had given them photos of him that were just as good before, but they said it's not enough, and they told me they'll look into it further and promise to send more patrol cars again. Then it was quiet for two more days. Until two days ago, someone rang the doorbell at just after 4am. My boyfriend and I got up, but we were both hesitant, but I saw the blue lights outside, and just as I got up, I heard them shouting, this is the police, please open the door. They told us they were called by one of our downstairs neighbors, who came home from his night shift after about an hour earlier, and heard someone else entering the building after them before their door fell shut. My neighbors know of my situation, and I've asked them to make sure they don't let strangers into the building. This neighbor then went into his own apartment and looked through the peephole. We have motion-activated lights in the stairway, so he waited to see if they had turned back on. They did. Then he he saw a middle-aged man walk upstairs. Above this neighbor are only me and my boyfriend and a single mom with three kids who probably won't be getting any visitors at 3 a.m., so he called the police. They came and found my stalker one half floor above me on the stairs. He should have been able to see the cop car since there was a little window up there and they had their lights on, but he either missed them or wanted to get caught. They found a pocket knife on him and he confessed to being my stalker right away. He's finally caught. They got him. It took four years and one very vigilant and caring neighbor, but he's finally done. He's facing several charges and I've collected every single piece of evidence over the past four years. I don't know what kind of outcome I can expect, but for now, I finally got some peace. When I was a kid, my mom worked as a teacher and she was very close to a co-worker of hers who had a son around my age and of whom I, as well, was very close. When my mom or her friend would head out for the night, the other would take care of both of us kids and basically, it meant I spent half of my time over there and my friend spent half of his time at my house, which was perfect and fun for us. We lived in different cities, but since that kind of system had been going on pretty much forever since, I grew up knowing my friend's city just as well as mine. His mom was well aware of that, so that being said, whenever we were going on a walk in their area, she let us wander around because she knew we'd always find our way back to her. My mom though was more cautious and always kept an eye on us, as she'd walk behind us to make sure she always was able to see us. I just wish her friend would have done the same. One day, I had to be around 6 or 7, we were going on a walk with my friend Marcus and his mom Katie. It was a very sunny day and I was wearing a dress with embroidered flowers and I had my blonde long hair down. During that walk, Katie was walking ahead of us and I was chatting and just 
was fooling around with Marcus when he suddenly remembered something urgent to tell his mom. As urgent as something can be for an 8 year old boy. He ran up to her and left me strolling behind for a couple of minutes, just as it already had happened a hundred times prior. That time though, we were circling around a big camping site and we walked by the white vans and camping cars. One of those vans had its back doors open and there was a man, probably in his mid 40s, smoking a cigarette and leaning on the vehicle. He locked eyes with me as I was approaching, then saw that Katie and Marcus weren't paying much attention to me as they were already a couple of meters ahead. Then he proceeded to pull me by my arm close to him and so I found myself with my body touching his. So weirded out that I didn't even say a word, although I knew Katie would have heard me if I called for help. He leaned toward me as he was obviously much taller than I was, muttering something I didn't get and he winked at me and kissed me on the lips and then pulled me to the open doors of his van. At this point, if he had pushed me just a little, I would have fell in the truck. At this point, I was just too scared to even lift a finger, and even though I didn't understand everything that was going on, I knew it wasn't okay. He put his hands on the door as to close the vehicle and I felt my heart sink. At that exact moment, some other man jogged towards us, in his 40s as well, waving hello to me and saying something along the lines of, I lost sight of you for a bit. I was so scared. He had a very friendly look on his face and was staring at me with a great insistence and with a huge reassuring smile. And the van man awkwardly laughed and yanked me out of the way of the car, slamming the door shut. I ran to Katie as I heard the van go off and just acted as if nothing had happened. To this day, I never told that story to anyone, not to Katie or Marcus. Not to my mom, nobody. I am 22 years old today. Last year, I was staying in a university hall for my final year. It's a private building so not connected to the university and out in the city near the main town. We have a car park but nobody really uses it because we are poor students and it costs money to park there so mine was one of the only two or three cars at a given time. The car park isn't well lit and it's to the side of the building so you have to walk for about two or three minutes to get into the main door. I was sitting in my car one evening after getting back from the gym, just scrolling on my phone because my seat was warm and it was dark and raining outside so I couldn't be bothered to get up yet. I was reading an article when suddenly someone started knocking on my window which was really odd. It was a man dressed all in black and he started telling me how his friend had seen me through the window and thought I was really attractive so could he have my number. I responded no that's a bit odd and I don't feel comfortable with it. He continued to be insistent for a while practically begging me to get out and give them my number or any social media details telling me I should come over and speak to his friend who was weirdly stood at the other side of the car park for the away from the building. I kept saying no and scrolling on my phone to show that I wasn't interested. He finally relented and walked away. I text one of my friends to ask if he'd come and get me and walk with me to the building. As I was waiting, this man returned but now with his hood up and he started banging loudly on my window saying that I was being rude, ungrateful, calling me all kinds of names. I kept staring at my phone and pretending I couldn't hear him. He then started trying my door handle. Thankfully, I locked my car after the first encounter and then began violently pushing into my car when it didn't work. I still kept kept ignoring him and text for my friend to probably bring some other friends with him. My friend was taking a long time to read my message and I was terrified but for some reason didn't think to call the police, probably because I was scared of things escalating. The guy at my window had calmed down after a few minutes and walked off, saying that he'd leave me alone now. However, I watched him out of the corner of my eye join up with his friend and then maybe three or four other men. They walked so they were out of sight but I could see their shadows lingering as they kind of circled around my car and moved towards the building but staying in the dark. They lingered there for a while until luckily another car came which was obviously full of students going to a party due to the loud music and singing going on inside. This group of men left as they saw these people arrive and I latched onto them and was able to walk with them as they entered the building. When I got home, my friend finally responded. He said that he'd actually heard about these guys before. Apparently they'd followed another girl into the building and into the lift a couple of days prior, then stood in the lift making really gross comments to her. She had to run to her door and lock it, where they then stood outside knocking on the door and whispering for her to open it. We were able to report this to the building who, to their credit, then hired a permanent set of security staff. We also got the CCTV footage of both incidents and were able to pass this on to the police. My mom's dog, Punky, was a very sweet loving dog. She was an ESA dog but trained to be a service dog for PTSD before she lost her leg. I had never seen her get aggressive with anyone in the entire 12 years she lived. She never growled or nipped anyone and she had no sense of smell so she loved all animals and people. A real gentle giant among our little terriers at 60 pounds. What I'm getting at here was that her barking at something and being aggressive was so wildly uncharacteristic that I only saw it once. 
I, 11 years old, was at home with my siblings, 2 years old and 6 years old. My then stepdad is at work and my mom ran up to the gas station to grab a pack of cigarettes. It was only a mile or two away from us. For reference, we lived in a two bedroom trailer in the middle of the woods, on a dead end road at the time, and you had to really make an effort to get down our road, find our house, navigate down our rickety driveway, and find the door. I'm sitting at the computer, having a grand time watching YouTube videos, when all of a sudden all of our dogs, about two Boston terriers and one chihuahua perk up, bark a few times, and start investigating down the hall. My siblings were napping in the bedroom at the end of the hall at the time, so I figured they just stirred and scared the dogs. But then Punky sits up suddenly, stands up on the couch, and puffs her chest out. Her ears are perked up, her fur standing on end, her tail straight up, and then she barks. Loudly, I mean, the bark booms through the living room and echoes around, and all of a sudden she lunges off of the couch and goes tearing down the hallway. I'm already on edge because I don't think I've ever heard her bark, ever. She's a Basenji mix, so her bark is more of a baying sound, but this was a big, loud, alert bark. I stand up and go to look down the hallway, ready to fight off what I'm assuming is a shadow monster in the hallway based on how the dogs are acting, but then I hear it. Knock, knock, knock. We didn't get visitors because of how weird our house was location-wise, so my 11-year-old mind had no clue what to do here. The only people who showed up here were family, and they didn't knock, so I slowly walked towards the door. The knock drew the intention of the dogs, and they came running back down the hallway, all except for Punky, and I felt better with our three yappy dogs in the room with me, even if they were all the size of New York City sewer rats. I open the door just a bit, and standing on our porch is the sketchiest man I think I've ever seen. I can still picture him perfectly. He was a really thin, taller man with dark hair and a sunken face, bags under his eyes, and this half-managed hair, sort of like he just gave it a quick brush and then figured it was good enough. Everything about him seemed just a little too thin, a little too shallow, and his clothes were all off too. They were nice, but fake nice, you know? Like a clean, newer looking t-shirt and new jeans. But he had what looked like a suit jacket on. All his clothes were dark too, despite the fact that it was summer in Texas, and the weather was definitely into the hundreds that day. He also had this plain, unlabeled bottle in his hand. It looked like the label had been covered up and taped over. I stare up at him in confusion, because I definitely don't know this man, and I asked him what he wants. He smiles at me in this way that's way too fake, like this exaggerated and forced grin, and he spoke in the same voice retail workers do. Hey there kiddo, I'm trying to sell this here carpet cleaner. And he shakes the bottle at me. Mind if I come in to show you how good it works? Alarms are going off in my head because he just seems so off. Looking back with an adult perspective, the fact that he didn't ask if my parents were home is unnerving. Because he probably knew they weren't and that's why he was here in the first place. I should have told him to get off our property, that I'd have to go get my mom, something except what I did say, but I didn't. Instead I just shook my head and said, no we don't have carpet. Well, it works on other things and he took a big step towards the door and shook the bottle at me. I start to freak out and think to close the door, but the thing is, our front door didn't even lock. Small town, hard to access home, we never needed a lock, so that's basically useless. I'm sure there's something very wrong about to happen, and I'm terrified as I think about what to do in the few seconds I think I have before it does happen, when all of a sudden I hear it. Punky had crept up from the hallway, lowered towards the ground with her teeth barred and snarling like she was feral. She had slobber just dripping from her mouth, her ears were down and she was ready to pounce. The guy hears it too, and as I look towards Punky, she tries to lunge past me, and I just barely catch her with my leg as she tries her hardest to duck past me and attack this guy. He freaks out and runs off the porch without another word, booking it down the driveway as I let Punky out along with the rest of our dogs and they start chasing him. Our small dogs chase him down the driveway and stop about halfway, barking and jumping about, but Punky stops just on the porch and watches him with her ears perked, just staring in the distance until he disappears. I swear I saw someone jump up with him running when he got onto the road. Road. The second he disappeared, Punky's entire body language changed and she went back to being the sweet dog I knew. No barking or growling, just laying around, mouth and throat covered in slobber still. I realized my siblings are still down the hall and run to check on them, and when I get to the bedroom, my siblings were sleeping soundly still. But the bedroom window was wide open, the curtains pushed all to one side and the items on the dresser in front of the window all shoved around. Someone had tried to climb through the window, no doubt my mind about it. From what I can gather, the bedroom window was visible from the couch, where Punky Punky was sleeping, so I think someone was trying to climb through the window before Punky went after them and scared them off, and the man at the door was meant to distract me. They definitely didn't expect Punky, a bigger dog, because most of the time she was with my mom inside while our small dogs were the ones that saw public eye more often. I don't know what they intended to do, but after my mom got home she took all of us to my aunt's house, and on our way there we saw the men walking up someone else's driveway, men plural, because we watched a second one split off to wait by the road.
In 2014, I moved to England from Canada to gain work slash travel experience and also to find myself. I ended up living in Essex with three other roommates. They were all women, all a bit older than I was. I was 24 at the time, Megan was 31, Cherry was 34, and Cassie was 38. Megan was from New York, Cherry from New Jersey, and Cassie from Poland. All four of us shared this three-story flat. The back of our home was the living room and the kitchen. The back wall was complete glass that looked out into the garden, and the garden was completely be fenced in. The house had an interesting dynamic to say the least. Tons of stories from that time in my life. I adored all of my roommates except for Cherry. After living with Cherry for 7 months, I was over her antics. One day, I come home from work, I lock the door, make myself something to eat, and go up to bed. I brought some work home with me, so I am in my night tight with all these papers around me and my headphones on jamming out. I had headphones on because Cherry was out to dinner with work friends. That meant booze and then soon after that a tantrum was surely to come. I just didn't want to have to listen to her crazy scream crying. I am working away, completely focused until I feel something. I look up to see a man standing over me. I don't register it right away and passively say, Cherry's room in on the second floor, and continue to work. Cherry regularly brought strange men home. He doesn't leave. Again, Cherry's room is downstairs you, he then interrupts. I am not here for Cherry. A cold chill iced my veins. My fight or flight kicked in just then. I start surveying the situation. I look him up and down. He has a bottle of Prosecco in one hand and a knife in the other. He is about 5'10", wild muddy brown hair and black eyes. He has a light blue polo shirt on and one side of his collar is popped up in a distinct Manchester accent. Once I focused in, I realized his eyes were black because his pupils were completely dilated. I was in trouble. I needed an escape plan. Unfortunately, this man was standing in between me and my bedroom door. I needed to get downstairs, but I needed for him to think it was his idea. I decided to play along. Just then, he uses his knife to pop the cork. Prosecco started flowing onto my carpet. I said, oh no, let's clean that up. I prefer to drink out of a proper bottle anyways. He nodded replying, yeah, let's go. I try to act as natural as possible. I try not to show that I am shaking all over and try to gain control of my breathing. We take the long journey down to the main floor of my flat, all three floors. He has the back of my night tie bunched up in one hand and I could feel the point of the knife graze my back with his other. I was trying to playfully speak with him as we walked down the stairs. I couldn't tell you what I was saying, I was most likely rambling, I couldn't hear anything over my heart beating in my ears. We get to the bottom of the stairs and there is a hallway to my left that leads to the front door. On my right, which is much closer closer to us is the kitchen and living room. We make our way into the kitchen. I point to the cabinets that had the wine glasses. He said he knew where they were and started walking towards them. I now have the kitchen table in between us. It was time to run. I burst into a sprint down the hallway towards the door. My hands fumble over the lock, shaking and sweating. I swing open the door and see two men walking across the street. They must have been walking home from the train. There was a big train station in front of our home. I call out to them for help and suddenly I am flung onto the ground. Little pebbles piercing my skin and sent sharp pains where they are jabbed. The intruder pushed me out of the way to run and escape. One of the men chased after the intruder while the other said for me to go inside while he surveyed my home and to call the police. I lock the doors and I call the police. While I am on the phone with dispatch, I manically run around the house to double check all the windows and doors. Suddenly, I hear a loud bang on my door. I inform the dispatch of the banging and she informs me that the police weren't there yet. I thought it might be one of the gentlemen who helped me. I go to look out the eye hole and it's him, the intruder. He came back. He's banging on my door screaming that I had his glasses and that he was not done with me. I absolutely freak out. The dispatcher attempts to calm me down, but I am losing my ever-loving mind. She then said, they are pulling onto your street now, you should hear their sirens. I did. The intruder then blasts off, one officer jumps out of the passenger's side while the car is still moving and chases after him. The second officer comes into my home, interviews me, and the two gentlemen collects evidence, takes photos. The next morning I am called in to identify a man they had in custody. I pointed him out. I go into a little room and the officer pulls out an evidence bag. He asked me if the items were mine. They were. They were my underwear and photos taken from my home. The officer informed me that the intruder had been stalking me for some time now. He estimates three months. He had made a nest outside our home on top of a hill that overlooked into our living room and kitchen. He is a known offender and drug dealer. He then told me how lucky I was to get out practically unharmed. Others weren't so lucky.
So this happened in 2011, so the exact dialogue may have escaped my memory a bit, but the situation is something I'll never forget. Also, AIM was still pretty active during this time and so was video chatting. Thank Tiny Chat. This is important for later. I was on an online dating site and was talking to this guy. I was 31 at the time and he was 28. We talked for about 6 weeks before I gave him my phone number and we took it offline to calling and texting for another couple of weeks. Two months after our initial chat, we were texting and he told me that he was out having a few beers at a bar near my house. He asked what I was doing and asked if I wanted to come out but I had a very long day at work and didn't feel like going to a bar. I'm also not a big drinker. I invited him over to my place, I know, after he finished at the bar and he accepted. I figured I would be okay since I do keep firearms for protection and know how to defend myself, if needed. I also had a webcam. I took a shower so I wouldn't smell like a water buffalo in a hot day. The air went out at work, put on some makeup and got dressed to wait. He then called and said he was outside of my house. I clicked for record on my computer's webcam program and turn off my monitor and went to let him in. It's around 10pm and he comes in and we go back to my bedroom because my living room was being remodeled. We're sitting on the bed chatting for about an hour, talking about everything under the sun. The conversation flowed. He was very handsome and so easy to be comfortable with. We got on the subject of firearms and I showed him mine. About 15 minutes later he asked for some water so I go to the kitchen to get him a bottle. When I came back he said he got a phone call and had to leave. After he left I looked on my nightstand where I put the firearm down after showing him and noticed that it was gone. I looked everywhere for it, thinking I had put it down somewhere else. Nope, not there. I then played back the recording from my webcam program and sure enough, it shows him grabbing it and putting it in his hoodie. I was terrified at that point. He knew where I lived. He had my firearm and he left his phone on my bed. Right then his phone rings and I answer it. Come to find out he's married. His wife was calling him wondering where he was. I told her everything, including the fact that he stole my firearm and I had video evidence and was calling the police on him. Next thing I know, he's banging on my door, my firearm in his hand, asking me for his phone. The conversation went like this. Him, I need my phone, give me my phone. Me, not opening the door but yelling through the window. Take the clip out of my firearm, empty the chamber, throw the clip into the bushes. The one in the chamber across the road and put it on the ground. Him, no, give me my phone. Me, I'm on the phone with your wife at the moment and I have you on video stealing from me. I put his wife on speaker. Wife. A whole bunch of expletives. Him, he runs and gets in his car and then comes back. I threw your gun to the ditch. At this point, I make him empty his pockets, take his pants off, take his hoodie off, and show me that he doesn't have my firearm on him. All the while, his wife is on the phone. I go outside and get in his car, in the driver's seat, and tell him to take me to where he threw my firearm. He proceeds to tell me that I don't know how hard it is for him, being a felon, not being allowed to own a firearm ever because of a mistake he made. The mistake, domestic violence, involving a firearm. We get up the road, he tells me that the firearm is there in the ditch. Then, I realize the situation I'm in. I can get out of the car and go get it, leave leaving him to do whatever to me if he chose. I could make him go get it, taking a chance of him seriously hurting me. I took that chance since I was on his phone with his wife and my phone with 911. He retrieves my firearm, brings it back to the car, and I drive back to my house and wait on the police. I get out of the car and he gets in the driver's seat. I'm still on the phone with the police. I walk around the back of his car to get his license plate number, and he just puts his car in reverse, hits me, and takes off. They found him later that evening. He still had the clip and the one in the chamber in his pocket, so now he's enjoying some time in prison. So glad I never have to meet this person again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. This takes place around 10 years ago when I was like 8 or 9. I lived in a pretty bad neighborhood in what was at the time a really rundown city. It wasn't good but it wasn't bad at the same time, just a few bad apples in the tree. Anyways, enough background on the neighborhood and now to the main story. My friends and I loved to play outside, it was the only thing we could do. No one in the neighborhood could afford any sort of electronics or any sort of fun machine to play with. We loved to just run through people's yards, cutting through houses if they just so happened to leave their door open. Now looking back on it, it is probably the dumbest thing kids our age could have been doing in a neighborhood like that. This story has nothing to do with running in people's houses. Just wanted to let you know how dumb of kids we were. Well, on one fateful day, we were playing hide and seek with four of us hiders and one of us a seeker. We thought it would have been a funny idea to go to the other side of the neighborhood so that the seeker could never find us and we'd win. We like to call that part of the neighborhood the rich part because they had two story houses over there and a forest with a creek in it. We were just doing our usual thing, cutting through people's yards and jumping 
jumping fences when we heard the loudest scream maybe four to five houses down. After hopping off the fence that we had just jumped, we all stopped and looked around wondering where it came from. I noticed that one of our hiders weren't with us anymore. Three of us left. Where's Isaac? I exclaimed. We heard the scream again. I pointed towards where the sound came from and we all jumped back over the fence we just jumped from and ran towards the scream. When we thought we got to the spot where the screaming was coming from, there was nothing there but an empty plot of land in the forest. We all started to get scared. Did Isaac get lost in the forest? Did he get taken back there? Then we heard the scream again. It was definitely Isaac. I decided to be the man of all the other 8 year olds and go into the forest to make sure Isaac was okay. As I started my way into the trees, I did one last look at my friends and saw how horrified their faces were. I knew at that moment that I was definitely the only one that would go down into the forest. Making my way in, I could feel all the heat in my body fading and some sort of dread starting to take over. As I walked further in, it started getting darker and harder to see. I was whisper yelling my friend's name. He responded in the most shaken up voice, down here, be quiet. I finally got to him and asked him what happened. He told me the story of how he got tired of running and decided to take a break on the curb to catch his breath. And that instead of being out in the open and risking the chance of being caught, he decided to go into the woods and hide. He said that after like 5 minutes after he sat down, he heard talking. Nothing that he could make out, just random nonsense. He looked around to see a man in a black hoodie hiding behind a tree on the other side of the creek staring at him, but the man took off before my friend could even get up to run away. And this is where he said he started screaming at the top of his lungs and hid somewhere else in the forest, which is where both of us are now hiding. And I kid you not, as soon as he told me this, we heard a twig snap. We both look up to see the man looking for us in some of the shrubbery on the forest floor. I couldn't make out any facial expressions or anything on his face for a matter of fact. I could see he was holding some sort of blade. I couldn't tell if it was a stick or a machete. All I knew is that we needed to run. So when he turned us back, we got up and started running. We didn't care how loud we were, we just knew that we needed to run. We got out of the forest and told all of our friends to run as fast as they could down the street. We kept running until we got to the other side of the block and we all turned around to see the street empty. No one, not a single car. And from a distance you could hear a roar, or like a very loud engine. Shortly after that initial roar, a silver 2000s Mustang with the darkest windows comes peeling around the corner faster than I've ever seen a car go, headed straight towards us. I've never had my body tighten up like that at that very moment when I knew it was the same guy from the forest. I told all of my friends to split up and run into people's yards to hide. So as we were all hiding and running through alleyways and jumping fences you could still hear his engine. It was like he was targeting only me. I can't even tell you how far I ran. I got to the point where I didn't even think I was in my neighborhood, but still I hear his engine coming up on me. So I ran more. I was exhausted. The sun finally started to set and I could hear his engine fade. Almost like he had forgotten about me or had just given up. I start making my way back home scared, checking my back every so often to make sure I wasn't being followed. Once I made it home, I went right to bed to cry myself to sleep. And for months after that, that 2000 silver Mustang would follow us, stalking every corner that we played on. We would see it at our school and the grocery store. It could have been a coincidence that our little minds are not perceiving things around us, but either way, I think he was stalking us. Nothing actually came of him following us. He never did what he did that first day, but it was still so scary seeing that car everywhere we went. I didn't know what to do or how to tell my mom, so I didn't, and still haven't. This story is for the people of this sub and my four other friends. Funny enough, the seeker didn't know what happened until the day after we were at school and we told him. He still doesn't believe us and says it was to go inside and have him looking for us all night. So for a bit of context, I am a college student. Without giving too many details, I am a woman on the smaller side of average female height. I currently do not have a car, so I use my bike, walking, and the bus to get around. My college has a transit service that allows you to scan in with a student boarding pass for free. Other non-students are allowed to ride the bus by paying upon entering or purchasing a ticket beforehand. I frequently ride the bus for various reasons, grocery runs, or treating myself to food. And yesterday, I had the idea of treating myself to a movie after all the exams I have been having lately. I'm an avid horror fan and knew that Terrifier 2 was in theaters, so of course I wanted to see it immediately. One of my friends told me they found it funny and really enjoyed it, which was more than enough reason to go see it. I was looking at tickets the day before yesterday and trying to decide which time slot I wanted to see the movie in. Looking back now, something in my gut told me to choose the earlier time. I wish I had listened. Another detail I want to add is that there are two bus sizes, a large one and a small one. The bus I rode during the incident was the smaller one. 
The stop where I got on the bus is the beginning of the route. Unlike every other stop, the driver usually parks the bus here for 5 minutes and gets off to use the restroom or have a quick break before continuing with the rest of the route. Upon entering the bus, I noticed only two other passengers, another girl about my age and an older man. The girl was in the front of the bus on the right side and the man was in the second row on the left side. I sat on the right side, several rows back. I usually read something on my phone or listened to music on the bus, so I immediately got on my phone when I sat down. Everything was okay for a little bit until I looked up and noticed the man repeatedly staring at me and looking away before staring at me again. I was immediately apprehensive but just brushed it off. He started speaking aloud out of nowhere saying things like, beautiful baby and so fine, while staring at me. I was frozen out of fear and could only keep looking at my phone and trying to ignore it. This continued until I worked up the courage to say, sir would you please stop staring at me? To which he claimed he was not staring and told me I was extremely beautiful. Unsure of what to say I just stupidly thanked him and went back to my phone. He had his body slightly turned but when I confronted him he faced fully forward. The driver got back on and we started moving again so everything was calm for a bit though I was admittedly still shaken up. This calm did not last long. Obviously this creep couldn't contain himself and just had a voice's opinions about me out loud. He started saying similar things again but also added some new phrases such as gonna make you my wife and by far the worst one I'm gonna get you pregnant. I was shaking at this point and was unsure what to do. I desperately wanted to sit next to the other girl but did not want to pass by him to sit by her. We made it to the other two stops before the girl got off and said sorry before leaving. My heart dropped to my stomach. The last thing I wanted was to be alone with this guy. Luckily more people got on at the stop. A middle aged couple and a guy about my age. In a panicked voice I sort of shouted and asked the guy my age if he would sit with me. He was a bit confused but came to sit by me and I immediately felt relief. The stress of the situation got to me and I broke down crying. I guess the creep took this as indication to leave because he swiftly made his exit after that. The kind younger guy who sat next to me and began to comfort me. I am so grateful he chose to ride the bus that day. The bus driver noticed the commotion and called me to the front to get information in order to make a report. He told me he couldn't hear anything but that buses have video and it would hopefully pick up what the creep was saying. He told me that the same man had recently been kicked off for a similar incident and that he would be reporting this immediately. For the rest of the ride the younger guy and I talked about things like majors and other school related stuff. I want to go into the marine biology field and he is a graduate student in mechanical engineering. I made it to the movies, it was awesome, and back home safely. But I definitely learned a lesson. My boyfriend is going to help me look into some self defense items and he taught me a few fighting tactics. This happened several years ago. I was home alone one evening when I heard a knock at the back door. This confused me as no one ever used that door. My husband and I lived in a fourplex at the time and all the units had a back door at the top of a narrow staircase. These doors were a little inconvenient to access as you'd have to go around the building and up the narrow stairs as opposed to the wider main entrance at the front. It didn't make sense to use the back entrance and I couldn't think of anyone who would go to that door to visit. As I approached the back door I saw two tall men in the window standing at the door. I did not feel safe opening the door so I called out hello. One of the men tapped on the window. Yes hello, may we come in? We are with Bresnan. At the time, my husband and I had Bresnan for cable but did not have any issues with it. I replied, we're not having any issues with Bresnan, is there a problem? Ma'am, the man said, can we come in? We're servicing the area and it's important we look at your cable. I shook my head, we're not having any issues, I repeated, so there's no need to stop by. Ma'am, we are visiting every resident. Let us in so we can do our job. I noticed the man grabbed the doorknob and tried to open the locked door. I slowly grabbed a knife from our knife block and held it at my chest. We're not having any issues, I repeated, trying not to convey shakiness in my voice. So you don't need to be here. The two figures appeared to shuffle and then straighten. Ma'am, let us in. We're on a deadline and need to do our job. I glanced at the clock, gauging when my husband would arrive home from work. I gripped the knife tighter. Ma'am, I saw him try the doorknob again. Just then, a thought came to the forefront of my mind. I'm sorry, I can't help you. Could I please get your names and badge numbers? I can give your supervisor a call to let them know our cable is fine. I heard another shuffle and one of the men replied, no need to ma'am, we're sorry we wasted your time. With that, both of the men exited the staircase and disappeared into the night. Shaken up, I held the knife tight and tried to get my bearings. I remember making a mental note to call the cable company. When my husband returned home, I told him what had happened. I was still very shaken up and had started crying again after he came home. He immediately called the Bresden Cable Company and spoke to a representative, who informed us that no one from their company was was out on assignment in our area. The next day, we asked our neighbors if they had a visit from the company no one had. 
For the longest time, there was this man that would sit in his garage and watch me. He was an older man and he was very scrawny. He had patchy gray hair and a super gross beard. I never learned his name, so we'll call him Nick. He looked like a Nick to me. I moved into my classic suburban home before I was even born. I've been living here my whole life, and the first memory I have of Nick was when I was 10 and he gave me a small two-finger wave as I walked back home after school. I had to see him every day since my bus stop was a few houses down and I walked like a block to get home. My mom said he dropped by after after I was born, knocked on the door in the middle of the day and rang the doorbell until someone answered. My mom finally answered, my one year old brother attached to her leg and newborn me in her arms. She said his face lit up when he saw me. He smiled brightly and asked to hold me. She obviously denied, cause who comes to your house to hold your child when you don't know them in the slightest? She said he scowled at her before calmly walking back to sit in his garage to smoke a cigar. After my first encounter with Nick, I never stopped seeing him. Every day after school, every morning before school, every time I took my dog out for a walk. Every time I peeked out of my window at 3 a.m., I swear this guy never slept. I told my brother how it freaked me out and he said he was probably on house arrest and that was the only way he could get out. We learned that wasn't true when he knocked on our door. Small background for this bit, my mom is very weak. She has an autoimmune disease and her legs and feet will go numb randomly. She's doing a lot better now but this event happened when she was pretty bad. She insisted she take the dogs out alone and I didn't want to argue so I sat in the living room. After about a minute, I hear a knock. I yell out that the door's unlocked thinking it's my mom, but there's a louder knock. I get up and go to the door. I open it and there he is, smiling at me. Hey hun, your mom fell off the porch. You might want to help her, Nick states, giving me goosebumps. His voice was unreal, so raspy and sounded like he was in the process of choking. He leaves very quickly and I hurry to help my mom off the grass. Calling my younger brother to get the two dogs inside, I gave her the I told you so speech and she grumbled about it for weeks. My younger dog, a pit bull made of 98% muscle, got excited when she saw a bird. She pulled to get the bird and yanked my mom off the porch. She was standing behind a pot and tripped over it on her way down, making the fall hurt a lot more. She had a black guy and her legs were scratched up. The pot of flowers that she tripped over was smashed, but she was okay otherwise. Flash forward to my 13th birthday and my mom's in the hospital, so my dad goes all out, letting me invite a lot of my friends over for a sleepover, making us dinner and breakfast, and just letting me have an amazing time. There's a park across from my suburb that I walk over to sometimes. I decided that I wanted to take my friends there to chill before their parents picked them up. The night before we were looking out the window and giggling about the man, I know it's creepy and we were 13, so they knew he was weird. I told them to ignore him if he talked to them, but I didn't take my own advice. Hey Rosie, he said it so quietly I barely heard him. My name is Rose and Rosie is a nickname my grandfather often used. I never told this guy my name, neither did any of my family members. Uh, hi, I replied and my friends all scowled at me, knowing I screwed up. How's your mom? She's fine. I go to leave before I pause. How do you know my name? You told me, remember? No, I don't. Because it didn't happen, but I wanted to get away, so I agreed. Oh right, I chuckle. Me and my friends scurry off to the park. The next day, there's a box of chocolates sitting on the porch, a note with Rosie and Chicken Scratch writing on top of it. I pick it up and look over at the guy. He waves, and I can see that his left hand has disappeared into his pants. Gross. I leave the box out there and tell my dad. The next morning, me and my dad take our dogs out. No man. I figured he gave up after he saw me reject his chocolates. A few weeks later, a large family moves into the house, and I hadn't seen a trace of the man until yesterday. I I'm 15 now and the woman who lives in the guy's house comes over yesterday. Does a Rosie live here, she asks. I had answered the door and my heart drops at the nickname from the stranger. Yeah, why? She hands me an envelope with my full name written on it. The guy who lived in the house before us said to give Rosie this on her birthday. It's not Rosie's birthday. I was trying to pretend I'm not Rosie. Oh, well, I just took a guess. He didn't give us a date. Have a good day. My dad opened the envelope wearing a mask because I quote, what if he filled it with cocaine? The note inside just said, I love you in his writing, red ink, my favorite color. Color. I was about 5 or 6. I went to my local kindergarten, and I was as carefree as a child can be. The greatest of my worries being if my mom forgets to pick me up from school. She never does, and every day we walk from school to home, and vice versa since it was a good walking distance. We lived in a compound that's kind of secluded, and mostly inhabited by old people or boarding students who went to the university near it. This morning started out like any other. My mom picks me up and we're walking along the small path in our compound, along with four other people, three high schoolers, two of which were walking together 
together and a female college student. She was holding a handkerchief over her head because of the heat. The sun was high up and glaring in the middle of the day that you wouldn't expect anything to happen, but it did. We were quite far back from this group when I turn around and see a man join us. He's clearly not from there. He had a bright neon green bag in front of him which was slightly opened, one of his hands inside of it. His clothes were kind of dusty but most of all he was glaring at us. It was just us five walking in this quiet compound and my little self didn't think much of it. Up until my mom squeezed my hand and started speed walking. At first I was confused but I knew the only thing that could trigger this was that there was a danger behind us and it came in the form of the stranger that was following us closely behind. I kept looking back discreetly although it was probably obvious and still he kept staring at all of us getting closer and closer. I looked up at my mom trying to ask what was going on but her low murmurs didn't really translate well for me except my ears picking up on the word knife. That's when I felt my stomach drop. My stupid little legs weren't fast enough. Factor in, my mom's older age, she was around 50, compared to our other companions. We were the easy target. We were pretty much at the back, but our house was near and I focused on that. Because if I thought about the threat behind us, my legs would feel like jelly and I'd end up slowing down. Still, I couldn't resist looking back. He just kept getting closer and closer, shortening the distance between us. I remember thinking about how I wanted to scream for help, desperately looking at these houses that seemed empty, wanting to go inside, but my mom's firm grip kept me going. Anyways, we lived here too. I never really knew if the others were aware of it, not much until later. One of the high schoolers left to a house over the basketball court and further down the path, the path veered off to a different trail that led to the main highway. So it was just us and the female college student, Goody. At this point, the man was also speed walking and catching up, but our apartment was merely a few steps away and my mom and I dashed towards it, up the stairs and into the comfort of our own home. The man gave us one last glare, but he continued to walk. My heart was pounding against my chest. My mom had left me to lock the door while she stared out the window. She kept repeating, he has a knife, I saw it. He's holding a knife. I run towards the window and catch a glimpse of the girl, still clutching that handkerchief above her head, looking behind her in fear and alarm as the man continued to follow her, his bright neon bag in front of him, now wide open, his hand still inside, as he kept getting closer and closer. I don't really know what happened after, only of my mom's recollection of the events. She had noticed the man suddenly come up behind us too, and her suspicions were raised when he didn't try to walk past us like the others but maintained a close distance between us. And then she saw the knife hidden in his bag, holding on to it as he stared at us. I hope that girl's okay and that man was detained or something, but it's been years now and I don't really know what happened to her. Don't really know if I'd like to. This happened about 5 years ago. I was around 16 to 17 years old. I always enjoyed walking. I would spend at least 1 hour a day walking the roads around where I lived. One day I was out doing my normal route, walking down my street that my house was on, taking a right out to the main street, and following it until I got to the end. There I would cross the crosswalk and retrace my steps to go home. On this particular day I was about 20 feet from where I would leave the main road on my journey back home. I had my headphones in, blasting music as always, which can be a bad habit as I I was young walking alone, but since it was daylight and the roads were pretty busy, I figured I was safe. But man, was I ever off with that assumption. As I was about to pass the entrance of a side street before leaving this main road, a black Ford F-150 pulled up. He stopped and gestures for me to walk in front of him, so I do so. I was about to go on my merry way when I barely heard someone trying to talk to me. I turned down my music taking out my headphones as I looked to see the man in the black Ford still stopped at the entrance of the side road. I looked at him puzzled trying to figure out if he was talking to me. I pointed at myself and he grinned nodding. What's a beautiful girl like you doing out here? He asked. I laughed awkwardly, uh, walking, I replied, seen as the answer should have been obvious. It's a beautiful day for that, he commented, just seeming to make small talk. Yeah, I stated before going to turn around and continue my route home. Wait, the man called. I stopped and turned around, just trying to be polite. Even though the encounter was odd, I didn't see too many red flags yet. The man continued to compliment me. I grew incredibly uncomfortable at this point, seen as this man had to be in his mid-40s. He had a bit of a receding hairline with black hair, a nose with a protruding bridge, blue eyes that were surrounded by slight wrinkles and it was dressed in a dress shirt so I instantly brought up my age I was hoping saying this would get this fully grown adult man to back off but he didn't oh that's okay come on sweetheart get in the truck that's when I started panicking red flags shooting up everywhere stranger danger I laughed nervously looking at the cars around me to see if anyone was noticing what was happening nobody did no that's fine my house isn't far no really get in the truck I'll bring you home no come on just get in here with me he called as I turned and started walking away I was hoping he'd just drive off somewhere 
somewhere else but he didn't. Instead, he drove extremely slow following me, complimenting me and trying to pressure me to his truck. I thought fast of multiple options for different scenarios, but I chose a simple one. I pulled out my phone and while still walking, I lifted it up to my ear, pretending to loudly answer a call. Hey dad, yeah no, I'm just on interstreet name here. I'll be home in about 10 minutes. I stopped pretending to listen to her reply. Okay, you're outside waiting for me? Awesome. Yeah, we can do that when I get back. Love you. After he heard me say that, he took off, tires screeching. I ran back home and made it back within about 6 minutes, actually calling my dad on the way, who made a call to the police, who showed up shortly after and took my statement and description. Turns out there was a man on the loose in my area who was exposing himself to kids and trying to pick them up. I started a new job about 6 years ago, it was great. Really liked all my coworkers, and the job itself is really awesome and I still love it. This was before the pandemic and everyone was in the office every day. I work in a large multi-floor, multi-wing building filled with numerous businesses and agencies. I started getting into a routine. We have a gym and locker room in our building. I would go work out before I was on the clock and shower, get ready, etc. I'd go get breakfast at the next building over most mornings at around the same time. I'd go on walk breaks with coworkers at pretty much the same time every day. It was very regimented. In the morning when I worked out, everyone had a pretty set schedule. We didn't know each other, but there was kind of an unspoken pattern. A co-worker would finish and shower before me, then I'd go, then the head maintenance guy for the building, and so on. This is where it all begins. One morning like every other, I get out of the shower and I'm in the small locker area and there's this little older man over at the sinks. He's not doing anything but looking at himself in the mirror, but you could tell he was just loitering. Weird, but whatever. A few days later, he's there again. Then he's there every morning at the same time and he's definitely looking at me while I change. This creeps me out so I stop working out in the morning. Then after a few weeks we're walking back from getting breakfast and he's walking the other way towards the other building. I tell my coworker that's the guy that would always be in the locker room watching me get dressed. After a few more days he's walking the other way from us getting breakfast every day and he looks right at me every time. So I make an excuse and stop going for breakfast. Our 9am walk around the building he starts just appearing and walking the opposite direction from us every day. Literally everyone walked around the building in the same direction except for this guy and he'd stare at me as we passed. I'd tell the coworker who was a woman about the guy and what had happened and she just laughed it off. The only reason he'd go the opposite direction is to make sure he saw me. Our 1pm walk around the building, wouldn't you know it, he's there walking the other way and staring. So I just stopped going on walks at work. This is where the real magic begins. I have no clue where this guy worked in our building. I would come into our hallway every morning at the same time. From the time I went through the doors to the time I got into my office, it was maybe 15 seconds. We were on the first floor and at the end of our wing is a staircase. Every morning as I'd come into our wing, he would pop out the stairwell and come walking the opposite direction and stare at me as we passed each other. One morning, I'm walking into the bathroom to go number two. I stop and blow my nose real quick. As I'm walking to the back stall, he comes into the bathroom. We have two urinals, two stalls in this particular bathroom. No one is there but us. He comes into the stall next to me, widens out his feet so his shoe is under the device and on my side of the stall. This dude is tiny, maybe 5 foot so he'd have to almost be doing the splits. Then he lets out this deep loud moan after about 30 seconds then leaves. I start telling all of my coworkers. most of them laugh. I felt so creeped out and helpless, like what do I do? Any guy I work with that I tell this about laughs at me. The women just shrug it off or have an excuse for why he is always there. So I ask one coworker to pick any event at any time during the day to prove he will show up. So we decide to go out for a walk at noon. After 5 or 6 days there he is. Now she believes me. Everyone in the office knows now. I have told my wife all about this and she is supportive. She has had her share of workplace creepers as well. I get to read the texts and emails. My closest coworker and I decide to start working out at 1.30pm every day. I want to get my gym time in but I don't want to do it alone. After about a week and a half, guess who starts showing up every day? He'd just come in and loiter around. Mind you the guy has never tried to talk to me before and vice versa. Two guys lifting weights and this little old creepy guy just sitting there watching me. Here's where it hits the peak. My lifting buddy had a cut out early one day. My stalker is there with us. I was just going to leave but screw that I don't want to let this little weirdo control my life anymore. There is an elevated padded stretching platform on the weight side of our gym. He takes his shoes off, lays on his back and starts doing hip thrusts in the air and holding it while he stares right at me. I'm walking around trying to pretend I don't notice him while he follows me with his eyes, pelvis elevated in the air. After 20 minutes of this, he puts his shoes 
back on and goes into the locker room. I'm texting my Liv team partner and wife the whole time telling them this is going on. My wife tells me to confront him, I don't. I get in the locker room to grab my bag and he's at the sink. The top couple buttons of his shirt unbuttoned and he's rubbing water all over himself while looking at me in the reflection in the mirror. That was it for me. I started working from home almost exclusively after that, then the pandemic hit and I've been remote ever since. This happened Sunday night. I got into a very huge fight with my mom and it was very emotional and intense to say the least. We made up and said goodnight to each other but I was still pissed off. So my impulsive self decided I was going to take off for the night, I just wanted to cool off. I went into my backyard and hopped over one of our walls and started to walk around. Mind you, it was midnight. I didn't even have a phone in case something happened or a weapon for self-protection. For a bit of a layout of my story, down the street from my house, which is a neighborhood road, there is a church and a preschool across from it. In front of the preschool, there are large, tall hedges that sort of hide the pickup slash drop-off that's in front of the school. There's a stop sign on the church's corner before the busy main road and a street lamp on the same corner. I made my way down to the corner on the church's side. I was very bored and cold but it's not like I could call a friend to pick me up and hang out for the night. I decided to face the main road and put a hitchhiker's thumb up in hopes of someone pulling into the street and letting me use their phone to call a friend. After what felt like forever, I was getting no luck and then I saw a guy from across the main road and I called for him. I didn't have any weird feelings about him, he was harmless and he let me use his phone but I still wasn't able to find any of my friends to come and get me. Before he left, he asked if I had a knife on me or something. I said honestly, I forgot mine at home and he handed me a small but very sharp switch blade and told me to keep it to stay safe and have a good night. After watching him walk into the dark heading east, I wandered up and down the sidewalk as cars passed by often. I started to pass the hedges and I glanced over to the left of me where the school was. I saw a large silhouette of a man slowly creeping around in front of the doors to the small preschool. He was tall and looked like he was strong, broad shoulders too. It took me half a second to realize he stopped and saw me too. I went into flight mode and immediately noped out of there and ran across the busy street because it was empty at the moment and and kept sprinting until I was 5 streets down and realized he wasn't following me. About 30 minutes had gone by and I decided it was time I made my way home. I eventually crossed the street and was facing the main road walking down to the church and take a left and get home. It was silent and no cars had gone by for a few minutes at that point. Then I heard a car speeding down the road and I turned my head back to see if it was a large white suburban. I dismissed it thinking nothing of it as it turned right a few streets down across the road. I started to turn the corner under the street lamp when I looked back up again and saw it was starting to come out of the same road it just turned into. I don't know what told me to run but I did. I ran into the parking lot of the church and started to see headlights turn into the street. I threw myself onto the ground behind a ramp wall that was barely tall enough to hide me. I was trying to stay silent at the same time because the suburban's headlight reflected off the walls of the building as it pulled into the parking lot. It made a few laps from what I could sneak a peek of and stopped in the middle for a couple of minutes before it turned out and drove into the main road. I waited it out a bit longer and pulled the knife out listening for anything and everything. Once I realized I was probably in the clear, I ran back home. I'm a French student doing a master's in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. I live alone in an apartment in a building where there are only students. I'm 22, enjoying life peacefully. To give you a bit of context, I live in a calm, good neighborhood. The only noises I'd hear are the tram or parties in the building since a lot of students are there. One night around 10 p.m., I hear a knock on my door. I live on the third floor, and to get to my front door, you have to open the main door which needs a key. And then you need to open the door to my corridor with the same key. So people who want to come into my door must have the key, call me or ring at the door so I could open the doors for them from my apartment. Nothing of this happened, I just heard a knock on my door. I usually open the door without a second thought, whether it's my landlord or a neighbor asking for something. As I told you, I feel pretty safe in the building, but this time, for some reason, I had a bad feeling about this. I didn't move at first. I thought the person would just leave. I had finished my assignments, however, the knocking continued for 30 seconds. I said, yeah, in English. The person knocking doesn't say anything. I ask in English again, who is it? The voice answers in English, it's Uber Eats, which is weird, because Dutch always speaks Dutch and I recognize the voices and accents of everyone on my floor who have the key to access the floor. So it wasn't a neighbor, it wasn't my landlord, it was somebody claiming to come from Uber Eats. But the issue is I didn't order anything from Uber Eats that day. The voice was unfamiliar, in case it's a prank or a neighbor pulling a joke, it was also a deep voice, at least 40 and probably a smoker. I replied that, I didn't order anything, you must have it wrong. After a few seconds, the knocking continued 
continues in the same voice says, I'm pretty sure you did. I have an order under your name. I start panicking. I look around to pick up a knife in case he breaks the door because the knocking was getting a bit louder. I checked if my door is locked. It wasn't. I was literally 10 centimeters away from him. My front door was the only thing keeping him from me, and I'm glad it doesn't open from the outside. You need a key to open it even if it's not locked. I step back and I ask again, what's the name? He seems to be thinking for a few seconds, then a final knock occurs. It was loud and it translated some anger or frustration. Finally, I hear him going down the emergency stairs right next to my apartment. The steps were heavy and the person was clearly in a hurry. I don't know what he wanted or what would have happened to me if I had opened the door as I usually do. I still haven't understood how he got through the two doors and why he did come specifically to the last apartment on the third floor. Did he try others before? I posted a post about it on the WhatsApp group we have in the building. No one saw anything suspicious. No one opened the door for anyone. I grew up out in the wooded country in Illinois, on a short dead end street 10 plus miles from a town, and there were 7 houses in the area spread out on a 2.5 acre wooded lots or larger each. There were no large wild animals, there aren't bears or large animals in the region, and people didn't meander there or show up lost. Actually, lost folks or large animals wandering around never happened in the 20 years I lived there, so please keep that in mind. When I was a young girl in my early teens, I had a good guy friend a few years older than me who lived next Next door, Terry. Terry was allowed to go out with his friends much later than I was and he would sometimes walk over to my yard after getting home late and throw rocks from the gravel area outside at my window to chat. My bed was right next to the window. I'd open the window and we'd whisper stories and generally talk for a bit. My second story window faced our backyard and his house was to the side. I could see his house from my window over the shrub trees and walking path to his driveway. I'd often know if he was out, the light was on over the side door entrance or already home. Light was was off. One time during the summer when my window was open, I heard a car in his driveway dropping him off. I was probably 14 years old and it was around midnight. I heard Terry get out of a car and was talking to his friends. Soon his friends pulled away. I softly called out as loud as I could without waking my parents, asking Terry to stop by and chat. He didn't respond as he probably didn't hear me. Then I came up with a not so brilliant idea to sneak outside and scare him. As kids, we'd often sneak around and scare each other. So I silently sneaked down from the second floor and out my back garage door which led to our backyard below my window which led to Terry's house off the side through our gravel area then through a well-worn path through the woods about 25 feet long. My parents had put in a gravel pit around the back of the house probably because nothing much grew due to the shade of the oak trees. There were 14 inch oak rounds set out as an uneven stepping path in the gravel and if you stepped off of the rounds in the church of gravel slash rocks would give you away. I picked my way expertly and silently across the log rounds facing Terry's house. My eyes got accustomed to the dark and I didn't see him. Also at that time, I heard the door of his house close and the light going off signaling he went in, likely to bed. I waited a bit as I thought I saw something move in the woods between our houses, but not on the path we'd always use. If you didn't use the path, there were wild rose and raspberry plants that had thorns and were painful to walk through if you weren't careful. So I thought it was odd that he'd been in the woods, but maybe he wanted to scare me like I was plotting to do to him. But I saw something human-sized and dark moving through the woods slow and pausing every once in a while like me. It was coming closer and I definitely saw it but it was strange in that it wasn't walking directly to my window to talk. Therefore, I hunched down and waited in silence wondering if I could still startle him. I still thought it was Terry and he saw me sneak out and he was trying to scare me. I watched a dark outline of a human figure moving but then I would lose sight of it in the foliage. It seemed to be stalking slowly and listening slash checking every few feet while hiding. So I whispered after losing patience one last time for Terry but he didn't answer. Answer. I got bored of hiding and crouching, so I quietly tippy-toed back to my garage door and went back inside, silently locking up as I went. I snuck back upstairs to my room above the area where I was just standing slash crouching. My window was open and I definitely heard someone or something walking around the yard. I whispered again for Terry out my window but got no answer. Then I heard someone or something fall and grunt pretty loudly in the window well right below my window. It wasn't enough to wake my parents but definitely loud enough I didn't mistake it and it sent a shock of fear through me. If you aren't familiar with the window well, it's a semi-circle hole connected to the house dug out for about 3 or 4 feet deep and reinforced with metal. It allows a basement window to be put in below ground level and the hole lets some natural light in. There's no way Terry would have fallen in our window well. We have been playing hide and seek in many outdoor games for years since we were young around the whole neighborhood. We knew everyone's window wells and house footprints, plus pass in the woods like the back of our hands. The grunt sounded humanish and not like an 
an animal. It also pulled itself out quietly without a lot of thrashing. That's when I realized this wasn't a fun game and someone or something was out there and it wasn't Terry. I tried to look outside my window as best as I could but there was a screen on my windows to keep the bugs out so I couldn't lean my head out the window to see next to the wall of our house directly below me. I then heard the crunch of rocks as whatever it was stepping in the noisy gravel. Again, Terry would know where the log rounds were and would not step in the gravel. He knew my parents were pretty strict and he was as good at being quiet as I was. Whatever it was stopped and I held my breath. I pretty much sat there with my face pressed against the screen two stories up for probably half an hour. It seemed like an hour but I'm pretty sure I didn't have patience back then to wait that long. I never heard it leave but I grew tired and eventually fell asleep on my bed that was next to the window. There are a few things I'm certain of. It wasn't Terry. I asked him later and he said he went to bed that night when he got home. He also would have no reason to lie. I'm pretty sure it wasn't one of our neighbors and I can't think of any reason a person would be there. We had a few neighbors and only two other houses out of seven had kids. Again, these seven houses were spread out in 2.5 plus acres per home. There weren't any big animals in the area. As wooded as the whole area was, we only had some deer but they were hunted and didn't come close to homes. Plus, our dog scared them away. When I was 25, there was a short time I was staying at my aunt's. It was her, my two cousins, and I. She lives in a nice apartment complex, and her unit is on the lower level. Her living room has a lot of windows that she keeps open for fresh air and for her cats to people watch. Her unit happens to be on the corner near a grassy courtyard path. When I had first moved in, I noticed a man who gave me an off vibe. My cousins and aunts said he lived upstairs and two units over, recovering from hard drugs that permanently messed him up. His parents paid for him to stay there as they didn't want him with them. They also said other than hearing him mumble and say weird things, no one ever had an issue. My aunt works nights and leaves at 3am. My younger cousin works nights and leaves at 2am. That usually left my same aged cousin and I the only two there until we leave for work around 8. For context, it is a very open living room to dining room plan. My aunt always has people staying over, so she has a second couch in the dining room in place for a table. This is where I slept. She stayed on the one in the living room. My aunt has also never been one to lock her doors until this incident. One night I'm on my phone trying to sleep at about 1am and hear a man yelling. He's yelling don't shoot and banging on the door to the right of ours. Two male college students live there and just told him he had the wrong apartment and to leave. He says sorry and walks off. I am looking through the kitchen window which is in direct line of sight from my couch bed and it's the weird neighbor who sees me and grins. He then walks back to his home. I was unsettled but not enough to wake anyone else up over it. Told my family nonchalantly the next day in a lol that was weird way. My cousin and I watch a movie and head off to bed. I have a very hard time staying asleep but I woke up this time to the feeling of someone watching me. I check my phone and it's around 3.30am, so I know it's not my aunt or cousin. I sit up and figure I'll go watch TV on my aunt's couch since she was gone already. The feeling gets stronger as I am in the living room. Then, I see the shadow of a person standing still in the grass courtyard looking in. I froze. I immediately go back to my couch to get my phone. As I do, the person is gone. I am now trying to calm myself down and think of waking my cousin up when I hear the creepy man's voice. He is now at the kitchen window which looks out directly in front of her front door. I drop to the floor out of his line of sight and start frantically trying to call my cousin. The man is now saying things to the window slash front door like, I'm going to hurt you and I'm unarmed over and over again. His face is up against the window. Then he starts talking about wanting to pet the cats he saw through the window. I can't get a hold of my cousin. It's been about 20 minutes of this at this point. In this situation, I didn't have many options. I could jump up and run for a knife but I need to go to the kitchen. I could try to respond and ask him to leave, but I've learned when you underestimate crazy, you lose every time. I now hear him knocking and knocking while repeating his nonsense. I'm doing that ridiculous looking army crawl snake slither across the floor down the hall now. I see the door handle start to turn. I'm about to jump up when my cousin bursts out of his room directly across from the front door. Now, he's not the biggest guy, but he was intimidatingly mad at the circus show taking place at his front door. He starts yelling at the guy that he needs to get off of his porch and that he's calling the cops. Then man tries to say, I'm unarmed. I'm not going to hurt you. Don't be afraid. My cousin goes off and yells, that's dandy. It's 4am. You need to leave or I'll call the cops. So this guy backs up with his hands in the air and leaves. Needless to say, we didn't go back to sleep. My aunt was called, who called the apartment manager. The next day when I came home from work, his parents were there packing moving boxes in a truck from his place. Maybe he was trying to get me to open the door by seeming friendly. Maybe he had a bad trip and really wanted to pet a cat to feel better. We will never know. 
This happened over 20 years ago. I was driving back home with my girlfriend at the time. It was Christmas Eve and my mother's family used to hold a large celebration at my aunt's house in Estacada. This was my girlfriend's first time meeting with my extended family, but she got on quite well with them. We spent the majority of the afternoon and evening talking, playing poker, opening presents, and drinking an assortment of adult beverages. My girlfriend had been quite inebriated by the time we had to leave. Therefore, I'd be driving us home. It was around 11 p.m. or so. I was driving my girlfriend's car along Highway 211. Now, this stretch of road is surrounded by farms and dense patches of forest, and parts of it are unlit. But nothing to fear. I grew up in this area, so I knew this road like the back of my hand. The both of us were just driving and talking away, just two young lovers making the most of our moment together. There is a portion of the highway that descends down an enormous hill before crossing Deep Creek. Surrounding both sides of the road are thick forests there are no lights. The only thing we could see was the area directly in front of our headlights. I drive down the hill, cross the bridge, and uphill through more forest. It's as the highway starts to flatten out that it happens. Something sprints across the road so suddenly that I almost hit whatever it was. I slam on the brakes. I turn to my girlfriend and ask her if she saw it. She confirmed that she had, but she couldn't make out what it was. Maybe it was a coyote, as they are a fairly common sight in this area. But something fell off about it. Whatever it was that that ran in front of our car disappeared into the woods next to the road. Coyotes don't usually dart out in front of cars, not like that anyway. So for some reason, I decided to check it out. I turned the car around and switch on the high beams to better light up the forest in which this thing had vanished in. I step out of the car and walk towards the woods. I don't see anything, but now it feels like perhaps I'd made a grave error. Suddenly, the car's horn blasts. It's not a beep 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 that you'd get if you'd say, your driver or passenger wanted you to hurry up and get in the car. No, this was a long blaring beep. I walk back into the car and ask my girlfriend why she leaned on the horn like that. She said nothing, instead she pointed to a spot about 50 feet from where I was standing. I looked over in that direction and that's when I saw it. Surely this was the thing that ran in front of our car. It was a man. He was completely naked, his skin was covered in dirt and mud. He looked back at us and then he smiled and waved to us just before turning around and walking back into the forest. Needless to say, we got out of there. Once we were safely driving again, my girlfriend explained what had just happened. While I I was trying to look for whatever was in the area that initially vanished in, he circled back around and came out from another spot in the forest, beyond my car headlights. My girlfriend had seen something out of the corner of her eye, and that's when she saw him. Before she honked the horn, he was walking towards me. We called the authorities once we got safely back home, but they never found anybody. The officer we spoke to assumed the man was probably on drugs. I moved back into the area recently, so I now drive that highway often. No naked man sightings yet, but I can tell you that I'm definitely extra vigilant now, especially near Deep Creek. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. This happened like 12 years ago. I was 14 and my sister was 12. It was during summer vacation and we were hanging out, just the two of us outside, midday. We lived in a smallish town where during weekdays, it was pretty empty because adults were at work. Anyway, we'd been messing around, picking flowers and other random stuff when we decided to cut through a massive field of undeveloped land on the edge of our suburb. It was technically a shortcut to get home, but it wasn't the best idea because it was really bumpy, potted land that other kids and teens left all sorts of stuff laying in. Well, our bad decision came around and bit us. We hadn't made it very far in the field when my sister got two bad things at once. Some sort of twisted metal, maybe an old piece of tool, pierced right through her foam flip-flop and into her foot, and right after it happened she shrieked, jerked, and twisted that ankle on the uneven even ground. She started crying and howling and I was worried. The metal hadn't gone too deep and I was able to stop the bleeding with the hem of my shirt, but she couldn't walk anymore obviously. Our parents weren't available, didn't know where we were, and this was before I had a cell phone. My sister was still on the ground crying and I was trying to calm her down, when something made me feel like looking up. Y'all, it was the feeling of being watched. Out of the field, across the road, standing on the corner in the distance was some random guy watching us. He was too far away for me to see him clearly. All I could tell for sure was that he was blonde, probably adult, and dressed too warmly for July. He was all alone, stock still, just staring at us. I looked back at my sister and basically said to get on my back, I was carrying her home. We were leaving right now. Now, I had to carefully pick my way through this stupid field on my own bad flip-flops, with my crying sister on my back. 
back. Luckily, she was tiny, but I was no linebacker either. It had rained a day ago, and the field had puddles of water in the low spots. We were both kind of wet from her falling when she got hurt. I swiveled back to check if he was still watching us, and he was. Not only was he watching us, but he'd crossed the road and entered the field. Now he was standing stock still again and just watching. Ice in the veins doesn't describe it. One of the scariest moments of my life up to that point. My sister looked when I looked, saw my face, and started crying even harder. I just shook her a bit on my back and whispered something like, stop it. I need to concentrate on getting us home. Watch him and tell me if he starts following again. Just be quiet. So that's what we did. I started walking again as fast as I could without getting hurt. My sister watched him while I carried her. After less than a minute, she whispered to me that he was following again. How fast? Just walking. Is he watching us? Yes. I told her to tell me if anything changed and kept going. I stomped through puddles and I couldn't see into when I had to, hoping there was nothing sharp in them. I lost a flip-flop in the mud and just kept going. We were about three-fourths of the way through the massive field when my sister whispered that I least wanted to hear. He was speeding up. I turned us right around, so we were facing him head on, and as loud as I could, I yelled something like, Hey, we see you. Leave us alone. I'll call the cops. Nothing. He'd stop again when I stopped, but gave no sign whatsoever he'd heard me. Just nothing. I turned us around again and kept going. My poor little sister was shaking like a leaf and just saying my name over and over again. It was awful, and there was nothing I could do but keep going. Eventually, he started following again, at a slow pace. I finally made it into our suburb, out of the muddy field and onto solid concrete told my sister to hold on as tight as she could and booked it. Started running with her on my back as fast as I could. We couldn't see him anymore. Didn't know what he was doing or where he was. Every muscle hurt from carrying her so far. My bare foot was all scratched up from the road, but I didn't stop. I kept moving. With my sister looking out behind us, it felt like my heart was going to explode. After what felt like forever, I made it to our house. Ran across the yard, up the drive, put down my sister, who started crying again. My hands were shaking so badly I could barely use my key. We made it in safely and called my mom. She had us lock every door and window and came rushing home. But nothing happened after that. He never found us. We never saw him again. So a few years ago, I, a 17-year-old female at the time, would attend community college at the outskirts of my hometown. I would take an hour and a half long bus drive because both of my parents worked and my other siblings were too young to drive. The outskirts of my town, despite being the literal outskirts, are more populated than you expect, with strip malls and apartment buildings. The bus would drop me off about four blocks from my university, which isn't too far. I always enjoyed those few minutes. Anyway, this one time, I left my phone at the library. Using my brother's phone, I called a friend who worked at the school library during the late evening shift, 7 to 9, and he'd said he'd bring my phone to me. But he lived closer to the college than I did, so I told him I'd just meet him at his shift and pick it up myself. He said, okay, and I boarded the bus at around 6. Now, I get off the bus at my usual spot and the place looked deserted. I'd never been there that late at night and maybe it was because it was a weekday that people were home or I don't know. I had my brother's phone in my pocket and just clutched it tighter and tighter picking up my speed until I was practically jogging. I'm nearing to a corner when a flash of light goes off to my right. There, in the shadows, is a sleazy looking man. He's balding with a tourist shirt unbuttoned halfway. He was wearing sunglasses at night and was wearing some gold jewelry. And most importantly, he had just taken a picture of me. In the instant that I saw the flash go off, I knew it was coming from his phone. Now, I think it's important to understand our positioning. He was pressed against a building to my right, right at the corner I had turned. I was about 10 feet away from him. To my left, on the same side of the street, was a car with blacked out windows and no license plates, directly across the sidewalk from the man. The car was parked with the driver's seat facing me, so that it was on the wrong side of the road, because America drives on the right side as opposed to the left. I had slowed down at that point as I began to debate my next move, cross the street and continue walking, make a break for the school, turn 180 and leave my phone at the library, or approach the potentially dangerous man. I did the stupidest thing possible and approached the man. Anyway, I did demanded to know what he was doing. He looked taken aback. I could see his brain short-circuiting because I was demanding to know what he was doing. He eventually sputtered about how he was just standing here. I said, no, I saw you take that picture of me. His face fell. He started saying no, he hadn't done that. Why would he want a picture of me? I had imagined it. I asked to see his gallery, which is extremely risky because who knows what I could have seen. He slowly pulls up his gallery and as it's opening, I see a blurry picture of me in the distance. I didn't think I'd get that far. Granted, I had been 
running on adrenaline during our whole interaction, but this really made me pause. I told him to delete it. Then a door slammed shut. I just knew it was the parked car. My brain cleared up and I hightailed it to the school. I could hear a single pair of footsteps behind me, but I sure wasn't going to turn around and check who it was. The car started, but they would have to have to do a U-turn on a relatively narrow street just to be able to follow me. I think that's what saved my life. The fact that the car was parked facing the wrong direction. I reached the school out of breath and in tears. My friend opened the building for me and I explained what had happened. He locked us in while he called the police and we waited for them. But the sleazy guy and his buddy were never found. Anyway, my mom had gotten out of work by that point and I called her to ask to pick me up. We waited with my friend till the end of his shift and drove him home too. Needless to say, I carry a mace with me everywhere I go now and I'm yet to find a police report stating a guy matching his description had been arrested. To be honest, I don't think the police believed me fully, but who knows. I'm a single male, 33 years old, who lives alone in Denver. My apartment complex is not what you would call a nice building. I'm on a road close to Colfax Avenue, which if you're familiar with, the geography of this area is not the safest boulevard in town. I'm a few streets away from it, but close enough that I wouldn't consider this an up-and-coming neighborhood. This evening, I was watching Netflix on my couch. My two cats were cuddled up against me as I lay under a comforter. The night before, I had watched a horror movie that was scary enough to leave me in an unsettled mood making it hard to sleep. So this night I decided to watch a stand-up special instead, keep it light so I wouldn't have any trouble getting some shut-eye. I have classes early the next morning, so I was surprised when I made the conscious decision to turn on a second stand-up special and let myself fall asleep on the couch. I was just so comfy where I lay and didn't want to move, not even to turn off the several lights on throughout my apartment. I remember dozing off around 11 o'clock. It was effortless, which meant I was really snug under the covers with my cats flanking me on either end, creating a tucked in feeling. And all of a sudden, I'm not sleeping anymore. I'm woken up by a knock at my door. Then a man's voice says maintenance. I just sat there, sitting bolt upright on my couch. I knew something was off. I looked at my phone, which was by my left hand, and the time was 2.15 a.m. I didn't move. The floors of my apartment are old wood and there are many creaky floorboards. I didn't want whoever was knocking to know someone was at home and awake, let alone alert to his presence. My cats got up and ran over to the door as they normally would, but I stayed still and listened. After a few minutes with no answer, the man walked away from the door and down the hallway to the stairs. A moment after that, I heard the back door to the building swing open and closed. I have one window where I have a partial view of that door, so I break my paralysis and race over to it. I saw an old looking green SUV sitting in the no parking zone just in front of the back door. It must have been running the entire time because I didn't hear it start up and the brake lights were glowing red. Someone, presumably the maintenance man, got in the car and it drove off. I don't know how this individual got into the building in the first place as you would need a key to do so. I don't know what his intentions were, but no one knocks on someone's door at 2.15am claiming to work for the landlord with good deeds in mind. So I'm a 23 year old female. I live in a townhouse with my two children, two and six months old. My fiance did live with us until two weeks ago when I caught him trying to have relationships with other women and made him move out. That's important to the story. I'm a stay at home mom and when he did live with us, my ex worked evenings. Let me set the scene. We live in a tiny house in Northern Pennsylvania. My line of townhouses sits in front of a big field that runs to a line of woods. As far as I'm aware, these woods stretch out for at least a few miles and I'm not aware of any houses in there or any roads that lead through them. My living room has three windows that look to the field and my bedroom on the second floor only has one window that faces that way as well. People do tend to walk their dogs back in the field and kids sometimes play back there but I rarely ever see anyone close to my house. For that reason I tend to leave my blinds and curtains open because I guess I just enjoy the view. So in July of 2019 I was laying in bed trying to fall asleep. All the lights were off but I had my window and blinds open since it was so warm. I was looking out the window and I noticed small red and white lights just outside. I got up and looked to realize that the lights were coming from a drone. I ran downstairs to where my fiance at the time was sitting in the living room and ran to the window. I told him what I saw but of course when he went to look it was gone. I was paranoid that the drone could have had a camera on it and someone was watching me with it. I kept my blinds closed for a while after that. Fast forward to January of this year. I guess I stupidly got comfortable and assumed that whoever it was flying the drone was a one-time creep. 
My blinds were open and I had just gotten out of the shower. I was sitting on my bed pretty much naked except for my underwear. Scrolling on my phone when out of the corner of my eye, I saw lights again out of the dark window. It was that drone again. I ran out of the room and waited for a few minutes. I peeked back into my room and it was gone. I quickly shut my blinds and got dressed. Honestly, I felt sick at how stupid I was to leave my window open again, especially when I was practically naked. Now for the real disturbing part. My two-year-old son and I were out in the field two weeks ago, three days after I kicked out my boyfriend playing ball. I had my six-month-old strapped to me in a baby carrier. Probably about a half hour after we had been out there, I heard a slight worrying noise coming towards us. I looked up and saw the drone flying towards us. I looked around and didn't see anyone. It stopped right over us. I freaked and grabbed my son and dragged him into the house, looking back at the tree line every so often as we went. I knew they had to be hiding in there. I went inside, closed the blinds, and called my mom and told her about the situation. She told me just to keep an eye out. I said I would. My son likes to line his toys up against the window, so I figured it wouldn't hurt to open them up just an inch or so. A little while later, after we ate dinner and it was almost dark, I was feeding my six-month-old and my son was playing. He was standing over by the window, lining up his toys. He started saying, Dada, Dada. I assumed he was just missing his father and dismissed him by saying he was going to see him that weekend. He kept saying, Dada, Dada, though. I looked up and saw him pointing to the window under the little gap the blinds didn't cover. I froze. I remembered that he calls any man with facial hair Dada because it reminds him of his father, but there was no way someone would be bold enough to actually come up to my window. Not when my neighbors are literally right there. Anyone could see them, but there aren't any lights back there, so unless someone actually stepped out of their house, I guess nobody would see them. Maybe it was my ex, but he should be at work at that time. I ran to the window and moved my son. I didn't want to lift the blinds, but honestly, I was sure it had to be the person who had been creeping on me for the past year and I wanted to see who it was. I pushed the blinds up and was looking at a man who I definitely had never seen before, crouching in front of me. He was bald with a mustache and goatee. I have no idea how old he was. He could have been anywhere from 30 to 50. When he saw me, he smiled and stood up. I yelled and told him to screw off and that I was going to call the cops. He just stood there, smiling at me like some freak. I was about to close the blinds again when he said something I couldn't hear. I told him to leave again and he said, louder this time, I just want to talk to you. I shook my head no and yelled the same thing to him. He started slapping his hands on the window yelling no 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 over and over. I grabbed my phone, scared he was going to try to break in. I dialed 911. My kids were crying from the yelling and I felt on the verge of tears. I told the operator what was going on. The whole time I was on the phone, the man was pounding on my window, screaming now. He was yelling all kinds of nonsense, and I only caught some of it. He said he's been watching me for months, I'm beautiful, he wants to come with them, he'll kill my children if I don't. The operator told me to go into an upstairs room and hide until the police arrive. My town doesn't have a police department, so we rely on the state police. She said it would be about 20 minutes, but to stay on the phone with her. The man was practically punching my window now and was just screaming like a maniac. I was about to grab my kids and run upstairs when I heard someone else screaming. The man bolted. I looked out and saw my neighbor and his girlfriend. I opened the window and my neighbor said that he heard the man so he ran around the building. He said when the guy heard him, he ran back to the woods and disappeared in the tree line. They said they also called the police. I thanked them a hundred times. The police arrived 10 minutes later. They did a quick search around the buildings and found the man and arrested him. I don't know why that guy targeted me or why he waited so long to do something. I'm just happy my neighbors were there to intervene or who knows what would have happened. I was about 7 years old, my brother about 10. It was well past our bedtime when our mom woke up off the couch to put us to bed. Our dad worked construction out of town back then, so it was often just us three at the house for weeks at a time. Up the stairs into the immediate right was our parents' bedroom. Going left puts you in the middle of a hallway. Taking another left down that hallway led to my brother's room. The opposite end was my room which was also across the hall from our upstairs bathroom. At either end of the hallway are window doors we always kept locked locked and rarely used. The door on my end led to a balcony overlooking our front yard, and the door on my brother's end opened to our back porch. The house kind of leans into a small hill. My brother and mom both had a habit of waking up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. I only knew this because I was always a light sleeper and they just couldn't help flushing with the door wide open. This night, however, my brother stopped on his way to his room and came back towards the bathroom. I'm gonna try to pee before I go to bed. The past few nights have been too afraid to walk to the bathroom. I keep 
keep seeing a man wearing stripes at the end of the hallway. I don't know if my mom wrote it off as my brother telling ghost stories to try to scare me or if she was already half asleep and didn't catch it, but she didn't react at all to my brother's confession. I, on the other hand, was terrified by it. The fear of seeing a ghost like that at the end of the hallway or through the windows is the reason I started running from the stairs to my bedroom at night. Years later, when I was about 18, my mom and I were having a conversation in her car about a dog we had for a very short time when I was little. We were sharing stories about Max's tendency towards destroying my shoes and other unruly behaviors when my mom blurted out, Do you remember that time I opened the front door for the cops and Max ran inside to the kitchen and started tearing open that big bag of dog food we had? This really caught me by surprise because in all the years I lived in that house, we never once called the cops, gun owner family in a quiet rural West Virginia neighborhood, etc. I asked her what she was talking about and she looked equally surprised as if she had just revealed something by accident. Oh, that's right. I never told you because you were too young at the time. One night, I woke up hearing noises outside my window and when I looked, I saw a man staring into my bedroom. She went on to describe how turning on the lights caused him to take off running and how she grabbed my dad's pistol before calling the cops. I can't remember all the details I gave them when they showed up, tall white male, wearing a striped shirt and jeans, short dark hair, something like that. They said it matched the description of a man they were looking for in the area. It turns out he had escaped from jail on a murder charge. Now, I know it sounds so obvious hearing those two stories back to back, but it wasn't until a few years ago in my mid-twenties that I pieced together that my brother had unknowingly warned us about a murderer who spent multiple nights casing our home. At the time, I just turned 17 and was still pretty naive. I live in England, so it is legal to work in a bar and serve alcohol supervised, but not to drink alcohol. Not that it stopped me. I worked in a working men's club filled with middle-aged elderly people. Most were really nice. I sold bingo tickets twice for a week for my dad's cousin and I was pretty good at it. It's not typical to get tips here, but I earned more in tips than I did my actual wage. On a Saturday, my dad would come with me to have a drink with my elder sister while they played competitive darts in the main bar overlooking my booth. This one particular night, there was a middle-aged average looking guy. A little on the plump side, but generally unnoticeable. On the first round of selling tickets, he was at the fruit machine opposite the entire time, looking over at me occasionally. The second round, he approached me, asked me what I was selling, how bingo worked, etc. Clearly had never played before, but hey, everyone starts somewhere, right? He bought some tickets and offered to buy me a drink. I declined and informed him I was underage. By now, I had a bit of an uneasy vibe and didn't want to take a drink from a guy I don't know. He then offered a cola complimenting me a little too hard. Again declined and went on my way to help with the game in the main hall. Part of my job. Third time, he stood against the wall adjacent to me and just watched me work. He'd waited until the queue calmed down and bragged about how much money he had and now he wants to be my sugar dad. How cute I am commenting on my figure. I was trapped in my booth. I was late into the main hall so the concert chairman, guy who calls out the bingo numbers and gives out winnings, comes out and asks what was going Going on. This guy claims we were just talking. I apologized to the chairman and he walked me to the hall. Said he could see I was freaked out so I told him everything. He made the bar staff aware who also made my boss, my dad's cousin, aware also. Last round of selling tickets, he doesn't even wait for me to get back in my booth. He grabs my butt, telling me how he wants to be my sugar dad once again. Tries to push me against the wall and is suddenly span around. Not just by my dad but my boss and numerous staff members and customers who heard and saw what went down. He started arguing arguing his innocence until my dad not so politely introduced himself. He knew he was screwed. My dad punched him in the nose, blood running down his face. Everyone picked him up like a plank of wood and threw him out the closed door. Never saw him after that. Everyone checked up on me to make sure I was okay. My sister covered the rest of the shift and I had a free bar tab for two months. It was a chilly autumn evening when I returned home from work. The setting sun painted the sky with hues of orange and pink, casting long shadows on the quiet suburban streets. As I pulled into my driveway, a sense of relief washed over me. I was eager to unwind, cozy up with a book, and forget about the stresses of the day. I lived alone in a small, single-story house on the outskirts of town. The neighborhood was peaceful, and I had always felt safe there. But little did I know that my peaceful life was about to take a chilling turn. It all started with a simple 
cold knock on my front door. I didn't think much of it. It wasn't uncommon for a neighbor or delivery person to stop by. However, when I opened the door, my eyes met those of a complete stranger. He was a tall, weary man with unkept hair and a scruffy beard. His clothes were worn and dirty, and his gaze was unsettingly intense. Hi there, he said, his voice a little too eager. I'm sorry to bother you, but I'm new to the area, and my car broke down a few streets over. Could I use your phone to call for a tow? His story sounded plausible, but something about his demeanor made me feel uneasy. I hesitated for a moment before offering to make the call for him instead. He seemed grateful and handed me a scrap of paper with a number scrawled on it. As I dialed, he hovered uncomfortably close, making me anxious. A voice on the other end of the line confirmed that a tow truck was on its way. I informed the man, and he thanked me profusely, promising to repay me the favor someday. I didn't think much of it and politely bid him farewell. Over the next few weeks, the stranger's visits became frequent. He would drop by unannounced, often with a different excuse each time. Sometimes he claimed he needed directions, and other times he said he was looking for a lost pet. Each time, I became more suspicious of his intentions, but I didn't want to escalate the situation. Then one night, as I was preparing dinner in my kitchen, I noticed movement outside of my window. Peering through the curtains, I saw the man standing in my backyard, watching me intently. My heart pounded, and I quickly turned off the lights, hoping he would think I wasn't home. I considered calling the police, but worried that it might make him more aggressive. The visits continued, and I grew increasingly uneasy. I started locking all of my doors and windows, even during the day. I confided in a few close friends about the situation, and they urged me to contact the authorities, but I was hesitant, fearing it might provoke the man further. One afternoon, as I was leaving for work, I spotted him waiting near my car. My heart sank, and I immediately retreated back into my house, trying to remain as inconspicuous as possible. After a few minutes, I carefully peeked outside, relieved to find him gone. Enough was enough. I contacted to the local police and explained the situation. They assured me they would keep an eye on the area and advised me to report any further incidents. I felt a bit safer knowing that they were aware of the situation. Months passed and life gradually returned to a sense of normalcy. The persistent visitor had vanished from my life, leaving me with a mix of relief and lingering apprehension. I began to let my guard down, hoping that he had truly moved on and that my days of fear were behind me. But as winter approached, so did an unsettling change in the atmosphere. One evening, while I was engrossed in a movie, I heard a faint tapping sound at my window. My heart raced as I cautiously approached the source of the noise. As I drew the curtains aside, I found myself face to face with a chilling sight. A message etched into the frost of the glass that read, Missed you. Fear gripped me like a vice, and I immediately called the police, showing them the eerie message. They took it seriously and conducted a thorough investigation, but without any leads or concrete evidence, there was little they could do. The visits intensified once again. The man seemed to know my schedule, always choosing moments when I was alone to make his presence known. He would leave unsettling notes on my doorstep, scrawled on random pieces of paper or even on torn out pages from my own books. Each message was cryptic, like twisted riddles meant to unsettle my mind. With the police unable to catch him in the act, I decided to take matters into my own hands. I installed motion activated lights around my property and placed security cameras in every corner, hoping to catch a glimpse of him or any clue that could identify him. One bitterly cold night, I awoke to the sound of shuffling outside my bedroom window. My heart pounded in my chest as I summoned the courage to investigate. Peering through the curtains, I saw the man trying to pry open a window. Panic surged through me and I called the police immediately. The dispatch operator kept me on the line as I hid in my closet, anxiously waiting for the police to arrive. The minutes felt like hours as I clutched my phone, praying for help to come in time. When the sirens finally echoed through the silent night, I let out a breath I hadn't realized I was holding. The police caught the man red-handed, attempting to break into my home. He was arrested and as they led him away, I saw the same intense gaze in his eyes. But it was mixed with a disturbing grin. The officers assured me that he wouldn't be causing me any more trouble, but I couldn't shake the feeling that the ordeal wasn't truly over. The court proceedings were a stressful and harrowing experience. The man was charged with stalking, attempted burglary, and harassment, among other offenses. His defense lawyer tried to portray him as mentally unstable, but the evidence stacked against him was overwhelming. Finally, he was sentenced to a lengthy prison term, with a restraining order in place to keep him away from me. The years passed and the fear that had once gripped me began to wane. I moved to a different town, started fresh, and gradually rebuilt my life. The memories of that terrifying period became like distant nightmares, fading with time. But as I share this story with you now, I can't help but glance over my shoulder occasionally, a lingering instinct born from the haunting experiences of the past. And so, I implore you to stay vigilant, for even in the most ordinary places, there may be shadows waiting to disturb your peace.
It was a stormy evening, rain pounding relentlessly on my car's windshield as I drove down a deserted highway. The dim glow of streetlights illuminated the road ahead, casting eerie shadows on the surrounding trees. I was eager to get home after a long day of traveling, but the weather seemed determined to keep me from reaching my destination. As I pressed on, my eyes caught a figure huddled by the roadside, drenched and holding out a thumb, a hitchhiker. My heart wavered between empathy and caution. It was late and picking up a stranger in this weather was risky, but I couldn't ignore the guilt tugging at me, against my better judgment, I decided to pull over. The moment he climbed into my car, I noticed something unsettling about the hitchhiker. His clothes were worn and his face bore the wariness of a thousand miles. He looked much older than I had initially thought, with a scruffy beard and sunken eyes. His name was Jack, he said, and he was grateful for the ride. Jack didn't seem dangerous, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. He spoke with an air of sadness, hinting at a troubled past and recent hardships. I listened, offering a few words of comfort as we continued down the highway. As the rain intensified, visibility dwindled, and I focused intently on the road. I tried to keep the conversation going to stave off any awkwardness. However, Jack's responses grew increasingly vague, and he seemed preoccupied with something else entirely. I really appreciate you giving me a lift, he finally said, breaking the silence. I've been stranded for hours, and it's been tough to find someone willing to help. It's no problem, I replied. Where are you headed? He hesitated for a moment before replying, I don't really have a destination of mine, just trying to put some distance between me and the past, you know? I nodded sympathetically, but a twinge of unease crawled up my spine. It was as though he was trying to avoid any specific details about his journey. My instincts urged me to stay vigilant, reminding me that trusting a stranger in the dark of night might not be the wisest decision. As we drove further, I noticed Jack glancing at my belongings in the back seat and even craning his neck to look at my GPS. It made me uneasy, as if he was sizing me up or planning something. I decided to divert his attention away away from my personal items and steer the conversation toward more general topics. An exit sign came into view and I saw the perfect opportunity to end the ride. Hey, this is my exit, I said, my voice feigning casualness. I hope this spot works for you. But Jack's reaction was unexpected. His eyes widened and he looked genuinely alarmed. No, no, please, just a little farther, he pleaded. I promise I won't be any trouble. My heart pounded as I weighed my options. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was seriously amiss. However, I didn't want to put myself in any unnecessary danger. I decided to trust my gut and firmly insisted that I had to stop at that exit. Reluctantly, Jack agreed and as I pulled over, he quickly thanked me and stepped out of the car. As I drove away, I glanced at my rearview mirror and to my surprise, I saw him standing in the rain, watching my car until it disappeared from sight. In the days that followed, I couldn't shake the eerie feeling that lingered after encountering the mysterious hitchhiker named Jack. I kept replaying the encounter in my mind, wondering what might have happened if I had ignored my instincts and continued driving with him. My unease grew when I realized that I hadn't taken proper precautions when offering him a ride. I scolded myself for not considering the potential risk of picking up a stranger, especially on a stormy night when visibility was poor. Determined to learn from the experience, I decided to be more cautious and prepared in the future. I researched safe practices for offering help to strangers, especially while driving alone. It became clear that while compassion is important, safety should never be compromised. Weeks passed and the memory of the encounter with Jack began to fade, buried under the weight of daily routines and responsibilities. But just when I thought I had put the incident behind me, a news report caught my attention. The local news featured a segment on a man named Jack Harrison, who had been involved in a series of violent crimes across neighboring states. My heart pounded as they showed his picture, confirming my worst fears. It was the same hitchhiker I had encountered that stormy night. According to the report, Jack had been arrested after leading the police in a high-speed chase, during which he injured several officers and caused a serious accident. The authorities had been searching for him for months, and he had a lengthy criminal history, including charges for assault, robbery, and even kidnapping. My hands trembled as I realized just how close I had come to danger. It sent shivers down my spine, knowing that I had unwittingly given a ride to a dangerous criminal. I couldn't help but think about the possible outcomes if I hadn't decided to trust my instincts and let him out of my car. The experience left a profound impact on me. I realized that we often encounter situations that demand a balance between compassion and caution. While I had wanted to help the hitchhiker, I had failed to prioritize my safety. From that moment on, I vowed to be more vigilant and aware of my potential risk when dealing with strangers, no matter how genuine they may seem. The news of Jack's arrest also led me to reevaluate my trust in others. Not everyone we meet has good intentions, and it's essential to stay vigilant and prioritize personal safety. I made a conscious effort to share my story with family and friends, hoping that my experience would serve as a cautionary tale and remind others to be wary in similar situations. As time passed, I carried the lesson with me, growing stronger in my resolve to prioritize safety while remaining compassionate. The encounter with Jack had been a terrifying wake-up call, but it also served as a valuable reminder that in a world where we often aim to help others, we must first ensure our own well-being.
A few years back, I found myself in a small town for a weekend getaway. My friends and I had rented a cozy cabin near a picturesque forest. We were excited to explore the area, take long hikes, and immerse ourselves in nature's beauty. One afternoon, we decided to venture deeper into the woods, following a winding trail that led us to an abandoned building. It stood like a forgotten relic, its walls covered in graffiti, and its windows broken. Curiosity got the better of us, and we decided to investigate the eerie structure. As we stepped inside, the air was thick with dust and a sense of isolation. My heart raced, but the adrenaline rush added to the excitement. We wandered through the decrepit rooms, taking photos and speculating about the building's history. Time seemed to fly, and we lost track of how far we had ventured into the decaying structure. That's when I noticed something odd, a faint sound echoing from the distance. It was a barely audible shuffle, like footsteps on a creaky floorboard. I paused, holding my breath to see if my friends have noticed it too, but they seemed oblivious, captivated by the sights around them. Unnerved but not wanting to spoil the fun, I decided to brush off the sound as my imagination playing tricks on me. We continued exploring, but the atmosphere had changed. A feeling of unease gnawed at me, and I kept glancing over my shoulder, sensing that something was amiss. As we ventured deeper into the building, the shuffling sound grew louder. My unease turned into genuine fear, and I couldn't ignore the nagging voice inside my head warning me that we were not alone. I decided to voice my concerns to my friends, hoping they would take me seriously. Just as I was about to speak up, a chilling realization hit me. I could no no longer hear my friends' voices. Panic surged through me as I turned around, only to find myself standing alone in a dimly lit hallway. The shuffling sound was now unmistakable and much closer. Guys, I called out, my voice trembling, where are you? No response. I felt a knot forming in my stomach as I tried to find my way back to the entrance. The building seemed to have transformed into a maze, with each hallway leading to another dead end. My heart pounded in my chest, and every shadow seemed to be concealing something sinister. Then, from the corner of my eye, I caught a glimpse of movement. I turned, half expecting to see my friends, but my blood ran cold when I saw a figure lurking in the shadows. It was a man, dressed in tattered clothes, his eyes fixed on me. Fear paralyzed me as I tried to make sense of the situation. How had he gotten in here without us noticing? What were his intentions? I was too far from the entrance and escape seemed impossible. Hey, he called out, his voice unnervingly calm. Don't be afraid, I'm just exploring, like you. His words did little to comfort me. I knew I needed to find my friends and get out of there, but the man blocked my path, making me feel trapped and vulnerable. Summoning all the courage I had left, I decided to make a dash for it. I turned and ran back the way I came, hoping to find my friends and escape together. The man's footsteps echoed behind me and I pushed myself to run faster. As I turned a corner, I saw a glimpse of daylight, the entrance. Relief washed over me as I burst out of the building, gasping for breath. My friends were waiting outside, concerned looks on their faces. What happened? Where were you? They asked. I tried to catch my breath before explaining the encounter with a the stranger. They were alarmed and immediately agreed to leave the abandoned building. We hiked back to the cabin, our hearts still pounding from the ordeal. The incident left a lasting mark on us, reminding us to be cautious even in seemingly harmless explorations. The rest of our weekend retreat was overshadowed by the encounter at the abandoned building. We tried our best to enjoy our time, but the fear lingered, and the once exciting hikes became tinged with trepidation. Back at home, I couldn't shake the feeling that the stranger had followed us, even though there was no concrete evidence to support it. Every little noise at night seemed amplified, and I found myself constantly looking over my shoulder, half expecting to see his face in the shadows. I confided in my friends about my fears, but they reassured me that it was likely just my mind playing tricks on me, haunted by the unsettling experience. They reminded me that the stranger had not followed us back, and that he was probably just a curious individual who happened to be exploring the same abandoned building. I wanted to believe them, but the fear persisted. I started locking all doors and windows, double checking everything before going to bed, and installing security cameras around my home. I felt like a prisoner in my own house, always on edge, unable to fully relax. Days turned into weeks and the encounter with the stranger remained etched into memory. I tried to move on to regain the sense of security I once had, but the events of that day had forever changed me. Then one evening, while watching the local news, my heart skipped a beat. The reporter mentioned a string of unsettling incidents involving a man who had been approaching hikers and campers in the area. The description matched that of the stranger I encountered in the abandoned building. As I listened to the news report, the memories flooded back. The eerie shuffling sounds, the chilling encounter, and the fear that gripped me. I realized that my instincts had been right all along, and my friends and I had narrowly escaped a dangerous situation. The authorities were urging anyone with information or similar experiences to come forward. Without hesitation, I contacted the police and shared my account of the encounter. They took my statement seriously and assured me that they would investigate. In the following weeks, the police increased patrols in the area and launched an active search for the man. They warned hikers and campers to be cautious and report any suspicious activity. I felt a sense of relief knowing that the authorities were taking the situation seriously.
seriously. Months passed and there was no sign of the stranger. The anxiety that had consumed me gradually lessened, but the experience remained a haunting reminder of the importance of trusting our instincts and being vigilant. To this day, I still think about that encounter and the chilling possibility of what might have happened had I not managed to escape. It's a lesson that will stay with me forever. The world can be a beautiful place, but it can also be filled with hidden dangers. It was the summer of 2023, and I was on a road trip across the country, exploring new places and making memories. As dusk settled in, I found myself in a small, desolate town that seemed stuck in time. The sun dipped below the horizon, and I realized it was time to find a place to rest for the night. Driving along the deserted highway, my eyes caught sight of an old, run-down gas station. Its flickering sign hinted at life, but it appeared deserted for years. Desperation overtook my better judgment, and I decided to give it a shot. After all, it was the only sign of civilization for miles around. I parked my car and cautiously approached the station. The creaking sound of the rusted door sent shivers down my spine. I stepped inside, and the musty scent of decay greeted me. The interior was dimly lit, with cobwebs covering every corner. Broken shelves and shattered glass littered the floor, remnants of the place that once thrived. An unsettling feeling washed over me, but I convinced myself that it was just my imagination playing tricks. I called out, Hello, is anyone here? My voice echoed through the silence, but there was no response. As I made my way toward the counter, I noticed a flickering light coming from a back room. Curiosity got the better of me, and against my instincts, I approached the source of the light. The door was slightly ajar, and peering inside, I saw a shadowy figure hunched over something. Hey, is everything okay? I asked hesitantly. The figure suddenly stopped moving and turned its head slowly to face me. It was a man, but his appearance was unsettling. His eyes were wide and vacant, and a crooked smile stretched across his face. He didn't respond, but rather continued to stare at me in an eerie silence. Feeling a rush of anxiety, I backed away slowly, my heart pounding in my chest. Without uttering a word, I retreated to the front of the gas station. I decided it was time to leave, but as I turned to exit, the man suddenly appeared in the doorway, blocking my path. Panic set in, and I fumbled for my car keys. He stood there, so grinny like a malevolent specter. My mind raced with fear, imagining the worst scenarios. I managed to keep my voice steady as I spoke. I'm leaving now. I don't want any trouble. His grid widened, sending chills down my spine. You can't leave, he murmured, his voice sending shivers through the air. Nobody ever leaves this place. I could feel his words like an icy grip on my soul, but I couldn't let myself succumb to the terror. Summoning all the courage I had, I made a run for it, pushing past the man and sprinting to my car. I could hear his unnervy laughter echoing behind me as I drove away, adrenaline coursing through my veins. Over the following days, my road trip took on a more cautious and vigilant tone, and every time I passed an abandoned building or a desolate area, the memory of the eerie gas station would resurface, sending shivers down my spine. It was as if the encounter had left an indelible mark on my psyche, a constant reminder of the inexplicable and the dangers that might lie in the unknown. As I drove through various towns and landscapes, I couldn't help but wonder if there was something deeper and darker beneath the surface of these seemingly ordinary places. I kept my eyes peeled for any signs of unusual activity or anything that might indicate a connection to the enigmatic gas station. However, I found nothing concrete, just my own unease. With time, the memory of that fateful night began to fade slightly, but I couldn't forget the haunting stare of the man I encountered or the bone-chilly feeling of being trapped in that forsaken gas station. The incident played like a broken record in my mind, and I found myself delving into research during my travels, seeking any clues or urban legends that might explain what I had experienced. Through online forums and local stories, I stumbled upon a handful of tales that eerily mirrored my own encounter. Whispers of a wandering gas station began to surface, a place said to appear when and where you least expected it. According to these accounts, the station was a portal to an otherworldly realm, where time and reality twisted in inexplicable ways. These stories were both intriguing and terrifying, but they felt more like campfire tales than reality. Still, the coincidences were hard to ignore. People spoke of unsettling encounters with the station's mysterious occupants, describing them as otherworldly beings who seemed to be stuck in a time loop, reliving the same moments over and over again. Determined to find some answers, I decided to revisit the town where I encountered the gas station. This time, I was prepared, equipped with a camera, a voice recorder, and a journal to document any strange occurrences. As I approached the area, an eerie silence enveloped me, making my heart race in anticipation. The town looked just as desolate as before, but the gas station was nowhere to be found. Its absence only deepened the mystery. I began to interview locals, discreetly inquiring about the abandoned station and the strange occurrences in the area. Most people dismissed my questions as idle curiosity, but a few shared cryptic stories that only fueled my intrigue. One elderly man, who appeared to be hesitant to speak, eventually shared a chilling tale. He recounted a legend that 
had been passed down through generations in the town, speaking of an ancient curse that bound the land to a realm of restless spirits. According to the story, the gas station was a nexus, a thin veil between our world and the ethereal plane, where lost souls wandered aimlessly. As the day turned to dusk, I decided to spend the night in the town, hoping to witness anything out of the ordinary. I parked my car near the area where the gas station had once stood and set up my equipment. The hours crept by slowly, and my mind began to play tricks on me as I imagined shadows moving in the darkness. Just as I was considering giving up, a faint, ethereal glow appeared in the distance. My heart skipped a beat as the glow intensified, taking the shape of an old-fashioned gas station sign. It couldn't be. The gas station was gone. But there it was, materializing before my eyes like a haunting apparition. My hands trembled as I started recording and photographing the eerie scene. The sign flickered, and the station seemed to waver like a mirage. As I approached, I could hear faint whispers carried by the wind, voices of the lost and the restless. Against my better judgment, I entered the station, drawn by an inexplicable force. Inside, time seemed to lose its meaning, and the air grew thick with a sense of foreboding. The same hunched figure from before emerged from the shadows, still wearing that haunting smile. This time, I resisted the urge to flee. Instead, I mustered all my courage and asked the question that had been haunting me since that night. What is this place? Who are you? The figure's vacant eyes locked onto mine, and his voice echoed with a strange mixture of sorrow and malevolence. We are the forgotten, the ones trapped between worlds. We yearn for release, but the curse binds us here. In that moment, I felt a surge of empathy for the lost souls trapped in this timeless purgatory. I couldn't help but wonder if there was a way to freedom, to break the curse that held them captive. As I continued to explore the gas station, I found old journals and artifacts shedding light on the history of the place and the people who once inhabited it. It became clear that the station was more than just a gateway, it was a focal point for lost souls and unresolved mysteries, a limbo that held them in perpetual torment. But before I could uncover more, a powerful gust of wind swept through the station and the apparitions began to fade. The figure warned me to leave before it was too late, as if the station itself was closing its doors to our world once more. With a heavy heart, I stepped back out into the night, the gas station vanishing behind me. As I drove away, I knew that my encounter with the wandering gas station had changed me forever. I now carried the burden of knowing about the lost souls stuck in that timeless purgatory, yearning for freedom. Though I might never have all the answers or fully comprehend the mysteries of that place, I couldn't forget the haunting faces and voices that echoed in my mind. The encounter had opened my eyes to a hidden world that existed just beyond our perception, a world of forgotten souls and inexplicable occurrences. And it was a world I could never let myself forget, no matter how much I wished to leave it behind. This chilling encounter took place not too long ago, and the memory still sends shivers down my spine. I was an avid nature lover and enjoyed taking long walks in the woods near my house. It was my way of escaping the stress of everyday life and finding solace in the tranquil beauty of nature. One evening, unable to sleep, I decided to take a late night walk in the forest. It was a clear night, and the moonlight cast an eerie glow over the trees, creating strange shapes and shadows that seemed to dance around me as I walked. As I meandered through the familiar trails, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being walked the rustling leaves and distant sounds of wildlife didn't seem as soothing as they usually did. However, I dismissed my unease, attributing it to my restless state of mind. The further I ventured into the woods, the more the feeling of being watched intensified. I convinced myself it was just my imagination, but my heart continued to pound in my chest. That's when I heard it, a faint whisper carried by the wind. Hello, is someone there? I called out, trying to sound brave. Silence greeted me, but the unsettling feeling didn't subside. I quickened my pace, hoping to reach a more populated area, but the forest seemed to stretch on endlessly. My anxiety was reaching its peak, and I considered turning back, but something kept urging me forward. Finally, as I approached a clearing, I saw him, a tall, shadowy figure standing at the edge of the trees. My blood turned to ice, and I couldn't move. The moonlight revealed his silhouette, but his face remained hidden in the darkness. Who are you? What do you want? I stammered, my voice trembling. The stranger didn't respond. Instead, he took a slow step toward me, and I felt my fight or flight response kick in. My instincts screamed at me to run, but my body felt frozen in place. Just then, a sudden burst of courage surged through me. I turned and sprinted back the way I had come, my heart pounding in my ears. I didn't dare look back, fearing what I might see. As I ran, the whispering sounds seemed to follow me, growing louder and more menacing. It was as if the forest itself was taunting me, playing tricks on my mind. The trees swayed eerily in the wind, and the shadows seemed to come alive with malevolence. 
Finally, I burst out of the woods and into the safety of the street lights that lined the nearby road. I glanced back one last time, but there was no sign of the mysterious figure. My heart was still racing, and I struggled to catch my breath. I hurried back home, vowing never to venture into those woods again at night. The encounter had left me shaken and questioning my sanity. I wondered if I had stumbled upon some dangerous individual or if my mind had played tricks on me in the darkness. Unable to shake the feeling of dread, I reported the incident to the local authorities. They assured me they would increase patrols in the area, but they found no evidence of anyone lurking in the woods. The weeks that followed the eerie encounter were filled with anxiety and sleepless nights. The memory of the shadowy figure lurking in the woods plagued my thoughts, leaving me on edge even in the safety of my own home. I began to question whether I should have reported the incident to the authorities, fearing that I might have drawn attention to myself from someone with ill intentions. To ease my restless mind, I confided in a close friend about the strange encounter. She listened attentively, offering reassurance and understanding. She encouraged me to join her on walks during the day, hoping that the presence of a companion would help ease my fears. Despite my lingering unease, I decided to give it a try. We strolled through the familiar forest trails, the sunlight filtering through the leaves, casting a warm glow on the surroundings. With my friend by my side, I felt a glimmer of the comfort and tranquility I used to find in these woods. As we walked, my friend shared her own stories of feeling uneasy in certain places and how she coped with those feelings. It was a relief to know that I wasn't alone in my fears, and her support helped me regain some of my lost confidence. However, my unease returned as the sun began to set, reminding me of the unnerving encounter that had occurred under the moonlit sky. I could feel the grip of fear tightening once again, and I was ready to call it a day and head back home. But just as we turned to leave, I caught a glimpse of something familiar in the distance, a tall, dark figure standing among the trees. My heart pounded, and I froze, unable to believe what I was seeing. Was this the same person from before? How had they found me again? I clung to my friend, whispering urgently, do you see that? It's him. My friend looked in the direction I was pointing, but when she turned back to me, her face was puzzled. I don't see anyone. Are you sure you're okay? She asked, concern etched on her features. Doubt not at my might. Had my fear conjured up the figure once more? Was it a trick of the fading light? My friend's reassurance did little to calm my racing heart. Reluctantly, we decided to continue our walk, but the feeling of being watched didn't dissipate. My eyes darted around the trees, half expecting the shadowy figure to emerge at any moment. I couldn't shake the sensation that we were being followed, even though I had no concrete evidence. As we neared the exit of the forest, a sudden rustling in the underbrush caused us both to jump. I turned around, fully expecting to see the figure charging at us, but instead, it was a startled deer leaping away into the trees. My friend gave me a gentle squeeze on the shoulder. It's okay, sometimes our minds can play tricks on us, especially after experiencing something frightening, she said soothingly. I nodded, trying to rationalize my fear. Perhaps it had all been in my imagination. Maybe the first encounter had heightened my senses, making me more prone to see things that weren't there. Over the following weeks, I continued to explore the woods during the day, gradually regaining some of the peace and tranquility I had once associated with them. The memory of the eerie encounter still lingered, but it no longer consumed me. While I couldn't entirely explain the strange experiences I had, I learned to trust my instincts while also acknowledging the power of imagination. Sometimes fear could take on a life of its own, creating shadows where there are none. The woods remained a place of solace and adventure, but I always made sure to heed the lessons learned from those late night encounters. And though the unsettling memories occasionally resurfaced, they also served as a reminder of the strength I found in overcoming my fear, and reclaiming the beauty of the natural world once more. This unsettling story happened to me during my first year of college when I moved into a shared apartment near campus. The apartment complex seemed like a typical college housing option, nothing out of the ordinary. Little did I know that my new roommate would turn my life upside down. At first, everything seemed normal. I was excited to start this new chapter of my life and looked forward to getting to know my roommate better. Let's call her Sarah. She was friendly, cheerful, and we hit it off right away. However, as the days passed, I noticed peculiarities about her behavior that left me feeling uneasy. Sarah had a habit of disappearing for long stretches without any explanation. At times, she would be out for days without a word, and then she would return as if nothing had happened. When I asked about her whereabouts, she would brush it off, claiming she was visiting friends or spending time at her family's place. As weeks turned into months, her absences became more frequent, and she began to withdraw from our circle of friends. It was as if she had a secret life outside of the apartment, one she didn't want anyone to know about. One evening, as I was studying in my room, I overheard Sarah talking on the phone. 
she spoke in hushed tones, and although I couldn't make out the details, her conversation sounded intense and secretive. The hair on the back of my neck stood up, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something was seriously off. Curiosity got the best of me, and one day, while she was out, I decided to look around her room. I felt guilty invading her privacy, but my gut feeling told me that I needed to find out what was going on. Inside her room, I found stacks of notebooks filled with what seemed to be coded writings and obscure symbols. It was like nothing I had ever seen before. The room was cluttered with strange trinkets and items that seemed to hold hidden meanings. My heart raced as I realized I had stumbled upon something much deeper and more sinister than I could have ever imagined. I didn't know what to make of it all, but I knew that Sarah was involved in something that went far beyond ordinary college life. Despite my fears, I didn't confront Sarah directly. Instead, I discreetly asked around campus, trying to gather information about her mysterious activities. Some mentioned her involvement in strange rituals and gatherings late at night, while others spoke of her fascination with the occult. I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't over my head. The more I delved into the mystery, the more I feared for my safety. I didn't know who I could trust or what secrets Sarah might be hiding. One night, as I lay awake in my bed, I heard muffled voices and chanty coming from the living room. Theo gripped my heart, and I realized that Sarah had brought her secretive practices into our apartment. I decided that I couldn't stay there any longer. I packed my belongings in a haste, making sure to leave no trace behind, and moved out without saying a word to Sarah. I found a new place to live, far away from the darkness that had enveloped my old apartment. After moving out of the apartment, I tried my best to put the unsettling experience behind me. I focused on my studies and surrounded myself with friends who brought positivity into my life. Still, the memory of Sarah and her mysterious activities lingered in the back of my mind like a haunting shadow. As the months passed, rumors about Sarah's bizarre behavior spread around campus. Some claimed to have witnessed her participating in peculiar ceremonies late at night, while others spoke of strange symbols and writings she would display in public places. I found solace and confiding in a close friend who had known Sarah before she became reclusive. To my surprise, my friend admitted that she had also noticed peculiar changes in Sarah's behavior during their time as roommates. She had moved out early on, feeling uncomfortable around Sarah's newfound fascination with the occult. They couldn't help but wonder what had happened to Sarah to lead her down such an unusual and unsettling path. Some speculated that she had fallen in with a fringe group, while others believed she might have encountered something dark and dangerous during her absences from the apartment. Despite our curiosity, we knew better than to delve further into Sarah's secrets. It was clear that whatever she was involved in had the potential to be harmful, and we were not equipped to confront such mysterious forces. In an attempt to find closure, we decided to reach out to Sarah. Sarah's family. We discovered that she had cut off communication with them, leaving them deeply concerned about her well-being. They were as puzzled and worried as we were, desperate to understand the changes in their daughter. Months turned into a year, and Sarah's strange presence became more like a ghostly legend around campus. Few had seen her, and those who had reported that she seemed like a shell of her former self. It was as if she had become a different person entirely. One day, an email circulated campus announcing that Sarah had withdrawn from the university. No explanation was given, leaving us all to wonder what had happened to her. Her abrupt departure only added to the air of mystery that surrounded her. As time passed, the rumors about Sarah's occult involvement subsided, but the unsettling memories remain etched in the minds of those who had encountered her during that dark chapter. I eventually graduated and moved on with my life, but I couldn't help but feel a tinge of sadness for Sarah. Whatever path she had chosen led her to a place of isolation and darkness, and I hoped that one day she would find her way back to the light. The encounter with Sarah changed me in profound ways. It taught me to be cautious about the people I trust and to listen to my intuition when something feels off. I realize that some mysteries are not meant to be solved and that it's okay to walk away from situations that bring discomfort and fear. The story of Sarah and her enigmatic journey is a haunting reminder that the human mind is a labyrinth of secrets and sometimes we can never fully comprehend what lies within another person's soul. As the years pass, her memory remains a reminder that some encounters can forever alter the course of our lives, leaving us with more questions than answers and a deeper appreciation for the fragility of our own minds. This happened over 10 years ago, so excuse me if the details are a little fuzzy. When I was in high school, my friend Claire came to sleep over. We made some plans to sneak out and hang out with some guys, and then one of them would drive us home. We go out to our friend's apartment, have some fun, and around midnight we decide it's time for us to head back. But when we ask to be taken back, everyone says no, despite previously agreeing to bring us back. Everyone said they were too drunk or too high, so we eventually decide to just start walking back and we would make some phone calls to see if anyone could pick us up and bring us 
us the rest of the way back. My house was a good 20 minutes away by car on the highway so there was no way we were walking all the way back. The apartment was towards the back of the complex so we start making our way to the entrance. We don't even get halfway there before a car slowly starts rolling up behind us. I was 15 or 16 at the time and very naive to the ways of the world so I wasn't too concerned but Claire was a little smarter than me on this night. She tells me to start walking faster so we start walking faster. The car also picks up their pace behind us. Again, she tells me to walk faster so we start moving as fast as we can and that's when the car pulled slightly in front of us and two of the passenger doors open and two may get out. Realizing there's no walking faster to get out of this situation, she instructs me to run now so she takes off running and I follow her. She runs towards a group of parked cars and jumps behind a pickup truck and for a minute we hope and pray that we weren't spotted. This is where details get a little fuzzy. One of them must have gotten back in the car at some point as there's only one of them following us behind the truck. We hear a set of footsteps quickly approaching and she quietly indicates that we're now going into stealth mode. This man is on the other side of the truck that we're hiding behind. He's circling the truck looking for us and we're slowly and quietly circling it on the opposite side to avoid being spotted. It felt like a scene from a movie or video game. We somehow managed to do two or three circles around the vehicle without being detected and by the grace of the gods, he gives up and decides to go back to the car with his friends. This is our one shot to get away. She tells me to run again, so we run for what felt like an eternity, but in reality was probably only 15 to 20 seconds. We find the pool house area and find a spot to hide. We were headed behind some fences and bushes and were anxiously waiting to see if they discover us. Their car pulls around to the pool house and we're biting our nails hoping they don't stop and get out. The car slowly drives away and we realize we haven't been spotted. We were safe for now, but the car circled around the apartment complex for hours and hours and hours. They weren't giving up on looking for us. We were safe for the time being, but now we needed to find a way out of there. It was the middle of winter and of course we were dressed to impress the guys we went to hang out with, so short shorts and revealing tops. We were freezing. We found a dirty disgusting Captain America blanket that we huddled up under while making phone calls to find someone to pick us up. We tried contacting the guys at the apartment but no one answered our calls. None of our friends answered our calls. We felt completely alone and hopeless, but around 5 in the morning someone finally answered and said they would pick us up. The best news I had ever heard in my life. Our friend gets to the apartment complex but can't find the pool house. The group of men are still constantly circling around, so there's no way we're coming out of hiding. We manage to figure out where our friend is at with a little detective work, figuring out what building they're facing, what's in front of them, are there dumpsters nearby, clues like that. We figure out where they're at so we make a run for it. We spot their car and hop it as fast as we can. Go go go. We tell them and our friend speeds off towards the entrance. We pass the group of men on the way out and that was the last we saw of them. We made it back around 6 in the morning, just in time to sneak back in without my parents ever knowing we even left. If Claire hadn't been with me that night, I definitely would have been abducted or possibly killed. So thankful for Claire and our friend that picked us up, but a big screw you to the adult men we went to hang out with as teenagers, and especially screw you to the guys that intended to harm us. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I was 15 years old living in a medium sized city in North Florida. It has about 60,000 people but some areas were really spread out and rural. Don't think of it like New York City or anything. More like a lot of houses spread out over a huge area and condensed shopping centers. I was a bit of a punk that my parents had a hard time controlling so that meant I basically snuck out constantly and was always riding my bike around the city all hours of the night with my friends fighting and constantly causing trouble. For reference, I was probably 5 foot 10 and 150 pounds. My next door neighbors were my best friends, let's call them Nick and Tim. Nick was younger than us at probably 5 foot 5 and 140 pounds and Tim was 5 foot 8 and easily 210 pounds. Nick and Tim were brothers only a year or so apart. On that night, Tim had texted me around 1 in the morning asking me to ride bikes with him and his brother to his girlfriend's house so he can get lucky. I remember being hesitant because of how long the bike ride was, I just looked it up and it was nine and a half miles from my house to her street. But Tim begged and begged me to go until I agreed. Our city had a curfew, meaning any police in the area that saw you and assumed you were a minor would stop you and possibly issue you a ticket. 
and bring you home. That meant we had to be careful about being seen by cars going by. Well, the bike ride to her house went by without any issues. We took our time, joked around, smoked a little pot, and genuinely just enjoyed the ride together. We ran out of what little pot we had on the way and finally got to his girlfriend's house. After what felt like an hour, Tim snuck around the back to go in and naked and I just sat on an electrical box and talked. Maybe 30 minutes went by and Tim triumphantly snuck out of the house bragging about his time in there and says we should head out. Annoyed at how long it took and nearly sober we both agreed. The first mile of the ride went by smoothly, but things changed. We had just passed a decent sized shopping center which was closed and a church. We rode by it slowly in zero rush at all. After we passed it, it led to a long stretch of road with woods and canals on each side. The road had two lanes on each side separated by palm trees and landscaping in the middle. Sidewalks on both sides and on the right side another road connects to the parkway. We were riding on the right hand sidewalk. Off in the distance we saw a very tall older man wearing a yellow raincoat and a large backpack. He was walking back and forth on the sidewalk under a street light on the corner of the parkway and the side street. We all went silent as we got closer. I don't think he could have seen or heard us as there were no lights over us and there were sprinklers going off in the median. I remember hearing him dragging his feet across the ground and mumbling. He was dragging his feet almost like he was trying to brush away the concrete to find something underneath it. The mumbly was incoherent and frantic. Honestly, it made my heart sink and my stomach not up. I couldn't understand anything he was saying and the only way to go to get home was to go by him. Nick said let's cross the street and get onto the other sidewalk. Tim and I agreed. I remember this so distinctly. We crossed the landscape median and a jet of sprinkler water hit me directly in the face and got into my mouth and my eyes. It smelled like sulfur and tasted horribly. On the other side we could hear the mumbling and scraping of his feet clearer. I could now see more details about him. He was smoking a cigarette and was probably six foot five, had on a huge green backpack, was extremely skinny, had long gray hair, was wearing combat boots and blue ripped jeans and that he had a full white beard. He didn't seem to notice us until we were directly across from him. We all had our eyes locked in his direction when he suddenly stopped walking, talking and scraping his feet, looked up from the ground and let out this god awful screech. It was like he tried to say a hundred words at once. None of us knew what he tried to say. After the initial scream I could make out what are you doing. It startled us. We were now 25 yards away from him and then he screams what are you looking at. I was a foolish teenager. I piped up to say something smart and Tim riding next to me grabbed onto me and said don't say a word. So I didn't, and in hindsight I am so glad I didn't. He kept screaming in our direction and we kept riding. The further we rode, the fainter the screaming got. Then it stopped. We crossed the street again to the other side and made it about a mile down the road, all of us on edge. We glanced over our shoulders constantly to make sure he wasn't following us. We talked briefly about it and how strange it was, but we were glad it was over with. Or so we thought. Nick and Tim were riding in front of me when I thought I heard something behind me. I turned around and there he was, maybe an arm's length away headed directly for me. The yellow raincoat hood was pulled up over his head and buttoned. This guy was standing up on his mountain bike pedaling as hard as he could. We locked eyes and he started screaming. I bid scream it. He screamed not words, not any language, a constant scream as loud as he could. I have the chills writing this even now as a 25 year old grown man with a wife and a baby. I screamed he's right behind us and stood up pedaling as hard as I could. I think we all did. And he was right behind us the whole time screaming. Every so often he would get right on top of us screaming and trying to knock us off of our bikes. I don't know how long we rode with him behind us but it felt like eternity. I think age played a factor because he must have got tired and let us get ahead a bit. Exhausted we pulled into a neighborhood and stared cutting through yards trying to lose him. We jumped off our bikes and all just decided if he's still chasing us we were going to make our stand together and fight. It was like a hive mind decision. All too tired to keep running it was our only option. We waited for him but he never came. I don't even remember hearing him. I still can't recall when we lost him. I called my house foe waking both my parents up in the process and told my dad about the situation. He told me to get home and figure it out. I asked to talk to my mother and she yelled at me on the phone and refused to come pick us up as I stood in the middle of the street hoping this crackhead didn't come and kill us all. I got home with Nick and Tim and Toe who asked if they could crash in my room. Of course I said yes. I think we all still have some weird feelings about that night and we never really spoke of it again. I don't know what he wanted. He was clearly on drugs but it makes me wonder if he would have robbed us or worse.
two weeks ago, my fiance, who is 24, and my future father-in-law, who is 53 years old, and myself, who is also 24 years old, take a little road trip to pick up some jazz cabbage in a different state as we live in a dry state. The drive up was uneventful as per usual. However, on the way back home, we had passed a slower moving vehicle, which was a white truck. We were coming into a town where the speed came from 45 to 35 miles per hour. As we start to slow, this white truck nearly rams into the back of us. I am sitting in the back at this point and turn to look over my shoulder and can see the white truck swerved into the other lane to avoid hitting us. At this point, my future father-in-law is the one driving and motions a what the heck gesture to the truck behind us. The driver of the white truck proceeds to tell him to pull over. My future father-in-law, being a hothead, obliges and pulls over. He steps out of the vehicle and says some colorful language to towards the other car. The driver of the white truck is also out of his vehicle and walking up into my future father-in-law's face. At this point, my fiance steps out and I follow. I see things getting heated between these two men and I throw myself in between them. Everything next happens so fast, I'm going to try my best to recapture. As I'm between everyone, the driver of the white truck pushes past me and shoves my future father-in-law. This gets my fiance to step in, hey, don't push my dad, to try and split them up. Next thing we see is the other passenger in the vehicle, who is easily in his 40s and close to 500 pounds, sucker punched my fiance who is 225 pounds. You just punched me. Somehow I get pushed to the ground and my guys are fighting the other guys. Fists are flying, they're rolling down into the ditch. The guy that was 500 pounds is on my fiance, pulling his hair and scratching him. Now, I'm against jumping, but this man had 300 pounds on my man. I jump in, I start punching and kicking and doing anything I can to get this man off of him. My future father-in-law is quaking the main guy in the other vehicle in a chokehold. He can see that we're struggling with the big guy and forgets the main guy to hit the other guy in the face until he got off my fiance. Cops were called, everyone was separated, the party in the white truck decided not to press charges, we agreed to not press charges and were sent on our way. So did the man in the white truck, let's not meet again. Recently, I moved out of my apartment. I simply had to because I didn't feel safe with my landlords. I lived in this really nice apartment in Brooklyn for a few months with my roommate, who paid for most of the rent since her parents are super rich. Our landlords were actually this seemingly really sweet couple who lived a few floors above with their kids. The first few weeks were somewhat normal except for the fact that every time I saw their kids in the elevator, they would scream at me before they got off and then just ran away. I thought it was funny and cute at first, but then their eldest son came to visit and started doing the same thing and he looked about my age. I didn't really think much of it since maybe he was just playing with his younger siblings. Stuff got weird really when I bumped into all of them together and we talked for a bit. Out of nowhere, while we were having a pleasant conversation, the dad apologized to me saying that his son might act strange because he's got some screws loose. I was pretty shocked with him just saying that out of the blue. I paused for a bit and I can't really remember what I said but remember just wanting to get out of this conversation now. A few days later, I bumped into the dad again in the elevator. I was pretty weirded out and he was just talking about about how great my apartment is and how much of a generous guy he is for giving us such a low rate. Then he asked if I could babysit his kids as he and his wife and his eldest son would be at a dinner. I said no at first but he counter offered saying he'd pay one fifty an hour and being the greedy idiot that I am I agreed. This is where I screwed up. When I get to his place I was speechless. His apartment wrapped around the entire floor of the building. It was the nicest apartment I will ever see that's for sure. About an hour and everything was normal. I was playing some fighting game with his kids when we suddenly heard the front door slam. I told them to stay there as I peeked to see what was going on and I see the dad falling all over the place, clearly drunk. He started walking toward me and at the last minute fell face first onto his couch. I must have popped a blood vessel trying to hold in my laughter. I asked if he was okay and walked over to his system. He then turned around, looked at me and said my wife will let us, please. When I tried asking, his wife walked up to me, thanked me, paid me, and told me to come back another time. I just kind of went back to my apartment in shock wondering what just happened and I definitely wasn't going back. I told my roommate and she told me that she also bumped into the dad and he told her my wife is cool just so you know with no explanation and just left. At this point, we knew that we sure were not renewing our lease. We didn't see our landlords until our final month. We kinda joked to our friends about how our landlords were creepy cooks. The next time I see them was actually with my boyfriend, who was well aware of what they were trying to do. It was an intensely awkward elevator ride as when they saw us in there, they just went quiet and smiled and nodded at us repeatedly. As we step out the elevator, the dad shouts hey to us and winks
winks at me as the doors closed. After that, I asked my boyfriend to stay with us for the remainder of our lease calls at this point, my roommate, and I were freaked out. Our final and creepiest encounter was a few days before moving out. My roommate walked out the apartment and both the landlords were sitting in front of the elevators, waiting for us. She said they started sobbing when they saw her and then begged us to stay. They apparently apologized for making us uncomfortable and said they thought we were the pretty young girls they were waiting for. She didn't say a word to them and got on the elevator and called me to warn me they were outside and then they started to knock. My boyfriend answered and said when the guy saw me asked if I was here. Of course my boyfriend said no but they tried walking in any way. I walk out my room saying I'll call the police if they don't leave and they beg me to not and run out the apartment. A few days ago, we get a text from a random number saying we could live there six months free if we just gave them a few nights. Of course, blocked and deleted. The whole thing was such an uncomfortable experience living there all those months, especially knowing they had keys to our apartment. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. Yesterday, I took my son fishing. He wanted to go to a nearby lake that we haven't been to in quite some time. It's not known to be a great area. It's known to be a late night hookup spot as well as a late night drug deal location. Due to the lake's reputation, I had made a deal with my dad that I wouldn't stay there past 4 in the afternoon without him. On to the story now. My 12 year old son, who looks much younger than he is, and I pulled up at our favorite fishing spot, a small pond on the opposite side of the road as the lake. Almost immediately, an older gentleman approached us asking if there were fish in the pond. I replied that we had just gotten started, so nothing yet, but that we had caught fish in the pond on plenty of other occasions. He thanked us for the information and returned to his spot on the other side of the road. About 15 minutes later, another younger man approaches the older man with a dog. I can see and hear them chatting, but they've made no move to involve us in the conversation, which I'm glad for. I just want to enjoy a day with my son. Unfortunately, the water in the pond was incredibly low and murky and I could tell we weren't going to have any luck. I tell my son to pack it up and we'll try another spot on the other side of the lake. As we begin packing our gear into the trunk, the younger man yells over sorry if my dog and I ran you off. I tell him it's no problem and we were simply moving to a better fishing spot. He then starts telling me how nice it is to see a mom taking her kid fishing and how you don't see that very often. I get this a lot so I'm pretty used to it. We have a short conversation about it as I pack up and I then move towards the driver's side doors to depart. Before I can leave, the younger man starts up another conversation, this time asking me how old I think he is. This feels strange strange to me, but I'm nice to a fault sometimes, so I answered his question. I tell him I'm a horrible judge of age, but maybe 25. He tells me he's 38 and I'm too kind and I laugh it off saying something like I work with teenagers, so they always guess me well above my age just to be mean. He asks where I work and I stupidly tell him my city. Turns out he lives there too and starts going on and on about how he got a free apartment on such and such street because his baby mama kicked him out of their house. I think he's talking about some kind of government assistance program. Weird flex, but okay man. At this point, I'm standing by the car door with my hand on the handle and my son is already in the back seat. This guy can't take the hint and starts telling me all about his awful baby mama and how women are supposed to be submissive, quiet, and do what they're told. He specifically said I mean, it's cool that you can bait a hook or whatever, but you're still a woman. Now my alarm bells are blaring. This guy struck up a conversation by commending me for doing a typically dad thing with my kid. Now he's putting me down for the same thing. He's gone from being overly friendly and complimentary to agitated and random. I should have been rude and just got in the car and left, but I've unfortunately been conditioned, like many women, to be polite even when we're uncomfortable. Instead, I start making comments in the hopes he'll see I'm not some meek submissive woman who's going to agree with him. After all, I'm a tatted up chick with an eyebrow piercing and two lip piercings. I don't exactly look like a submissive little housewife. I guess I was trying to make him just as uncomfortable as he made me in the hopes he'd leave me alone. After he says women shouldn't be loud or opinionated, I tell him oh, well you wouldn't like me at all. He tries tries to backpedal saying I mean, it's okay to be loud I guess, but don't try that with your man, you know. I say my man doesn't tell me anything. I do what I want. This kind of back and forth goes on for a while before he finally shakes his head and says I just don't understand what kind of woman would act like that. I reply a strong one. As soon as the words left my mouth, the older gentleman yells from his spot on the bank, yeah, say that again honey. This distracted the creep long enough for me to hop in the car and lock the doors. I still don't feel safe though, unbeknownst to the creep, only two of my car doors 
doors actually have functioning locks, but at least they're the two on his side. I put the key of the ignition and turn. No dice, nothing. Of all the times for my car to act up, it chooses now. Panic has now set in. As I repeatedly try to start my car, I can see him out of the corner of my eye. He's taking notice of my car troubles and is trying to get my attention. As he takes a few steps towards my car, the engine finally roars to life and I peel out of there. Only then do I let my composure crumble and have a long talk with my son about what just happened. To the older gentleman who took notice of my discomfort and provided a distraction, I gladly meet with you again any day. When I was in my late teens, I worked at a little coffee shop in my city. This was around the time that smartphones hit the scene. I had just got my first phone and laptop recently around this time. Anyway, we had this one regular customer who was very eccentric. He made me really uncomfortable if I had been honest. He had strange vibes. It was in the middle of a scorching summer and he always wore many layers in a large park parka with faux fur trim and sunglasses. I never once saw his eyes. He would get out of his car and run for the door in his big coat, shielding himself from the sun. He always ordered almost every item on the menu, but always said it was not for him and he didn't like the food there personally. One day he came in and ordered the whole menu, as per usual. I was checking him out at the cash register and he leaned in and softly said to me, You seem like a nice young woman. I need to warn you about something. I'm not supposed to tell anyone, but it honestly bothers my conscience keeping this information to myself. What is it? I asked. Do you have a computer or smartphone? And he asked. Yes, I just got one. I answered. Get rid of them immediately. He said sternly. Mm, dot 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 was that? I asked. I have a friend who has certain government ties. Nothing is private. The government will be monitoring everything and it's all permanent. He told me that they are planning to put up concentration type camps in some major United States cities. They will use the info on your cell phones to decide who will go and where they will go. I've gotten rid of everything that can be traced and I'm planning on running away soon. Please be safe. He urged. He left and I kinda just shrugged him off as a crazy person, but it still weighed heavy on my mind a while. I went on to leave that job and got a job as a hostess at a restaurant. A year passed by and I'd pretty much forgot about that whole encounter until one we would cross paths again. I was at the front host stand where I greet and see guests arriving at the restaurant. When a limousine pulls up and a man gets out accompanied by two large bodyguards at his side. It was the guy from the coffee shop. This time he was wearing a sleek tuxedo and the same sunglasses. He enters the building and says, you remember me? I said I did. He said, do you remember what I said? And again, I told him yes. He proceeds to pass the host stand and he examines every inch of the restaurant as if he was looking for something. He then signals his bodyguards to follow him to the door. Before exiting the building, he says looking back at me, don't forget. He then got back in the limousine and I never saw him again after that. It was the strangest thing ever because he knew he'd find me there. But how? How did he find me at my new job. Perhaps he asked someone at my old job, but still, why go out of your way to make some flashy appearance like this? I was just thinking of this and wondering whatever became of that man and who he was. I was talking about this with my mom a couple weeks ago. Then I was telling a long time friend. It's something that has always stuck with me. Mostly because I don't know what came of the case. I was never called to testify. Still don't know what happened or why I was stalked for months and then almost kidnapped. But now I think I have possibly found one answer. This happened in Texas. I was a 11 year old girl at the time. and We had a family friend's daughter living with us. I also have an older brother. Both of them were in high school into the school year so they had after school things going on. My mom was working for our school transportation. She still works there. My dad also was working in Dallas. I wasn't always by myself only two days a week. Never long either maybe an hour. We lived in what we call the boondocks nothing but back roads at that time with few houses in one direction town and the other. We lived out in the country about two miles from town. Our driveway was very long about an eighth of a mile. One day happens to be a day that I was by myself and remember seeing a red or maroon four-door car with a man and a woman sitting in it about a mile from my house. On the road we lived on if you came from the town side we were the last house with the longest driveway. The bus always came from the other direction, the back road side, so you would pass like a trailer park. Best way to describe it because that's what it reminds me of but the house aren't like side by side but plenty of houses. You pass that and there are no other houses until you come to mine. The car was sitting in between the trailer park and my house. So I get home from school and I get off the bus and see the car driving up behind the bus. So I kinda take off in a sprint because I didn't feel right about them just got a feeling. I get about halfway up the driveway. I turn around 
around and the car is sitting at the end of my driveway in the road watching me. So then I take off running to the house and get in and lock the door. I go to a window and look out noticing they're gone. When my mom and the other two get home I tell them what happened. We make a police report. Almost every day for the first week even when the other two were with me we saw the car. They didn't do anything creepy when they were home but they were still there every day. When I was by myself they would do the same thing. Sit and watch me. Well I'm assuming they caught onto the routine of after school things. I only saw them after the first week on the days the two wouldn't be with me. Not only myself but my bus driver noticed the car got closer to my house each day. One day they were so close to my house I mean like right at the driveway that the bus driver dropped me off and sat at the end of my driveway until I got close enough to the house to be safe. He did that every time we saw the car. This went on for about two months. Well one night it was a weekend. To this day I still like to sit outside to listen to music. So I'm sitting outside listening to my boombox. I hear a car door slam so I still look around. Again we lived in the country so the road and surrounding area is pitch black. Expect the cow pasture to our left had one light like a street light. So he had paid to have it put in not sure why I'm glad he did. Sitting directly in but at the end of our driveway is a car. I saw it because of the light in the pasture. It hit the headlights on the car just right. I'm not saying it's the same car and people but given everything that happened I'm 85% sure it was them. So I go in and tell my mom someone is sitting at the end of the driveway. Her and my dad go outside and again I hear a car door slam and the car started up and headlights come on. With our long driveway my parents wouldn't have been able to chase the people down. So of course I couldn't sit outside at night anymore. Fast forward a couple days maybe a week. No car. So it felt like everything was normal hoping that was the end of that scary situation. So the bus is dropping me off at home. Our mailbox was across the street so I went to check it. It was empty. I walk back and I'm in the driveway with my back to the road. I'm still close enough to the main road and out of nowhere a bee grabbed from behind by a woman. She doesn't have a good enough grip on me so I'm able to wiggle kind of free and I punched her in her face. She completely let go of me and I take off running down this forever long driveway. At this time I'm not skinny I was 185 pounds so it sucked running up that driveway. But I got home and I hid in my mom's closet until I hear her looking for me. She had this huge walk-in closet that went bathroom to bathroom. So plenty of hiding places. I'm crying and trying to tell her what happened. We call the police. They take a report. That's it. A couple days later my mom tells me that there was almost another kidnapping in town right up the road from my house. It was a man and a woman in a red car. About a week later in the next town over there was almost another kidnapping at the school. A man and a woman in a red car. They were caught. Like I said in the beginning nothing happened and I was never called to testify and as far as I know neither did the other two girls. Never heard anything about it again and I asked my mom when we talked about it a couple weeks ago. She confirmed that nothing came of it. My kids don't leave the house without me now. I don't leave them by theirself. My oldest is 11 and the world is a nasty place. I don't blame anyone back then in a small town it's not something you hear about happening. We moved down there to get away from the crime rate in Dallas. After they were caught, I was able to have outside time back. It was safe again and I haven't had any other experiences. I trust my oldest, he is a homebody. I can't get him to leave the house to do anything other than leave with me or his dad or school. My middle son loves to be outside, so does my youngest, but I have a fenced in backyard and I live in a community that has older couples. We all watch out for each other. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. This happened around two years ago. It was during the pandemic at some point because the mask mandate was still in place at the time. For some context, me and my boyfriend were both 17 at the time. This was the start of our relationship and we didn't live together at this point, so I went to his parents quite frequently to stay over. He lived about a 30 minute drive away, but at the time none of us could drive so we took the train. I always preferred the train to the bus as it felt safer to me, but this hindered that for a while. It was in November so it was pretty dark and rainy as it was around 8 at night. We got on the train and sat down kind of adjacent to a man. In those table seats with four seats, we were on the one across the aisle from him. Due to COVID restrictions at the time, half of the carriage behind us was closed off so it was just half of the carriage but it was pretty quiet apart from a group of like 14 year olds on the seats in front of us. Anyways, the train starts and everything's fine. However, I did notice that the man was staring just kind of strangely at the younger kids but I thought I was just being a bit too on edge. After a while, the man started staring at me instead. Like really obviously, turned to pair 
parallel face us and just stare. I didn't look at him and just kept him in my line of sight while trying to draw my boyfriend's attention to it subtly as I was starting to get quite anxious. It took a minute of awkwardly trying to point with my eyes before my boyfriend clocked what was happening. But just as he did and looked over at the guy, the man looked at us dead in the face and pulled his mask off and leaned forward and then coughed obnoxiously at us. At this point, I just kind of stared at my boyfriend and kind of laughed it off and started talking about something else to try and get the man's attention off of us because he just gave me a really weird feeling. The man then said what's so funny to which I ignored. We just ignored him the rest of the journey, but I was really nervous. I just felt like he was going to do something weird. Then after a while, the train was coming up to our stop. My boyfriend stood up and started to walk towards the doors which were far away from where we were as technically due to half the cart being closed. We were at the back. I was still like starting to stand up at this point still in the booth on the back side and the man stood up and then just stood right in front of where I was, blocking me from getting out and towering over me pretty much. At this point I was really starting to panic and could feel myself starting to hyperventilate but I told myself I'm just overthinking it. And he is just being a jerk and nothing more and glanced around to try and see my boyfriend but there were a few people now blocking the way. The guy stood there for like 2 minutes and completely ignored when I said excuse me to the point I had to squeeze past nervously to which he immediately turned around and followed behind. I finally caught up to my boyfriend near the first set of doors, the part that's a bit more open with the smaller fold down seats but still on the train carriage. The man still didn't pass us despite us moving right to the edge to let him go ahead. At this point the train had arrived and stopped completely and my boyfriend went through the first doors to where he was now in the smaller section between carriages waiting on the door to open. Before I could even move to follow him the man went into the same area and stood right up against my boyfriend, like fully pressing himself against him while he turns his head to just again stare right at me. It was so weird. At this point I was just confused and nervous so I just leaned forward and grabbed my boyfriend's hand and pulled him towards me back into the main area of the train. The guy, again, just stood there. He didn't get off the train or move to sit back down, so my boyfriend pulled me past him and we got off. Now, I was really panicking at this point and had been since he blocked me in. I was visibly shaken up and I considered speaking to the train ticket person who was away at the front of the train outside but I thought I was being silly and really he didn't do anything and my boyfriend was really calm about it so we just continued home. The way to my boyfriend's is like a 5 minute walk. There are two routes when you get off the train, a long way and a short way. The short way is easier but creepier as it goes through an alley with some bushes so I told my boyfriend to go the long way which really is like a 2 minute difference but it's more lit up and beside a road and I also figured the guy would probably go the short way but he didn't. He was right behind us and my boyfriend lives in a tiny little farmer village so there was no one around even though we were on the main street and I was getting really scared and constantly checking behind me to see how close he was getting but the guy just didn't seem to be phased by my reaction and surely a normal guy would notice if someone was scared and back up a bit. I don't know. My boyfriend was trying to calm me down and reassure me that he was probably going the same way and I guess he is probably right and I do tend to be overly anxious but he stayed behind us until we were about five minutes from our destination where he turned in. The unsettling part is that the place he turned in is a little set of flats that houses convicted offenders after prison. This happened years ago when I was barely 14. My middle school and middle school best friend at a time organized a trip abroad to Great Britain, London to be exact. It's supposed to be a few days looking at London attractions, museums, and shops. It was fun, until it wasn't. For the day before we're supposed to leave and go home, we were brought to the streets with some interesting shops. From there we could see Golden Freddy. We received free time for shopping. Our teachers and guide had a brilliant idea. They told us after the time for shopping ends we have to meet at a different street than this. In retrospect, it was like a hundred meters away but they still should do that. Most of us have never been in London. We are barely speaking English. We don't have a map of the city. Roaming services don't work correctly. 90% of students got lost. I got lost with my best friend because we went in a complete opposite direction. We were both confused about the directions we were given. We were walking along some pavement and my friend was running ahead or staying behind to nervously look around. We didn't look like we were together because we were not interacting with each other. I guess that's why this next thing happened. My friend ran ahead head and stopped to look around when I saw a black car approach me and match my speed. It was broad daylight, there were a lot of people around and no one reacted. I was confused and didn't know what was happening. Then from the car stepped out a man and said you are nice, come with me, and then tried to grab me. The car was still running so I suppose someone was still in it. I was stunned, I couldn't believe this was real. At that moment my friend ran behind me and grabbed me and dragged me away. We ran and tried to lose tail if a man or car followed us. After some time we stopped and my friend nervously cried. She 
asked why I didn't move when the man tried to catch me. I explained my deer in headlights moment. We cooled down and managed to ask some people for help, and we were found by our teachers. We didn't tell anyone there what happened. We were sure no one would believe us. After that, when we got back, I told my parents and I never went on a trip organized by my school ever again. My mom considered all of that really unprofessional and irresponsible. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. A few years ago, I was renting a house in Northern California. The neighborhood was just outside the suburbs. It seemed like the perfect balance of having space and having nice neighbors close enough to not feel isolated. The area had no streetlights, so it was very dark at night, especially if there were no clouds blocking the moonlight. It didn't bother me though. It made my little house feel even more quaint on dark nights. I got home from work one day in midwinter. It was a cloudy night, so pulling up to my house, I saw only what my headlights and front porch light illuminated. When I got out of my car, I caught a whiff of cigarette smoke. That was odd, as I had never smelled that before around the house. I didn't see anyone nearby, so I ignored it and went inside. I had just got off a shift with a few hours of overtime, so I felt pretty tired. Even though it wasn't even 7 yet, I decided to take a shower and call it a night. I woke up sometime later sure that I had heard a noise inside my house. I wasn't worried right away because my friend would sometimes stop by to use my shower after work on his way to his night classes. I even gave him a spare key so he could stop by even if I wasn't home. He would always text me to let me know beforehand though and I hadn't heard my phone go off. I reached over to my bedside table and picked up my cell phone to see if my friend had sent me a text. The bright light from my phone screen and number pad blinded me. Through squinted eyes, I could make out it was a 9 or something, but I couldn't tell if I had an unread text or not. I set my phone aside and called out my friend's name. There were a couple seconds of silence before I heard loud footfalls as someone started running through the bottom floor of my house. I leapt out of bed and ran to the closet. They were already up the stairs by the time I had opened the door and stepped inside. That house had three rooms upstairs, two bedrooms on either side of the hallway, the one that was in a spare, and a bathroom at the end. The bedroom doors were both closed, but the bathroom door was cracked open. I heard whoever was in my house thunder down the hallway past my door and into the bathroom. Thank god they did. They gave me enough time to open the attic access in the ceiling of my closet and hoist myself up. I just started to lift myself up when the person ran back out of the bathroom. My feet were barely inside of the attic when my bedroom door burst open. I heard footsteps run into my room and stop. When they didn't see me in that room, they ran back to the hallway and into the other room which just had boxes stacked in a corner, some weights, and a table where I painted my miniature models. I guess they decided that if someone were hiding, it would be in the bedroom because they charged back into my room and turned on the light. A moment later the closet door was ripped open. I was crouched on my attic just a foot or so away from the access, so I could try to stop them if they had started to climb up. From my vantage point all I could see was from about their knee down. They were wearing dirty blue jeans with frayed cuts and worn work boots. After a few seconds of looking into the closet, they stepped away and I heard a loud crash come from my room followed by a scream of frustration and anger. That scream was the most unnerving part of the incident for me. Whoever it was in my house ran back down the stairs. I heard crashes and clatters as things were thrown around and furniture was knocked over. I stayed crouched in the attic. I had left my cell phone when I ran for the closet and I wasn't certain I could climb down without him hearing. After some time, the noises stopped. I started counting slowly and when I reached a thousand, I decided it was safe enough to climb down and call the police. The first thing I noticed when I exited the closet was the intruder had flipped my bed over, I assume in an attempt to find me. That was the last noise I heard after they stepped away from the closet. I couldn't find my cell phone, so I went to the landline by the bed and called the police. I waited in my room until I heard them call from downstairs. The first floor was a mess, but I expected that. Chairs had been knocked over, the sofa had been flipped, all the books, pictures, and knickknacks I had on my shelves were strewn all over the floor. The cupboards in the kitchen had been opened and all the box and canned foods had been thrown to the ground. As far as I could tell though, the only thing missing was a single knife out of the wooden block in my kitchen. The police checked the house from top to bottom. They also found a few cigarette butts along my fence line along with some foil and an empty pin tube which the police said people often use to smoke meth with, so they think they had been watching my house for a while. I realized that they must have been out there smoking a cigarette when I got home. They collected up the evidence and told me I should stay with my family or friends that night and get that door fixed as soon as possible. I opted to just not sleep. I moved a shelf over to block the broken door and spent the next couple hours cleaning things up. I would often go to the window with a flashlight and shine it along the fence line where the police found the cigarette butts and foil, but I didn't see anything. The next day I called to have the door fixed and motion lights installed at the back and sides of my house. I lived there another three years without incident. My boyfriend, who I live with, works as a teacher in a town about 15 minutes away by train. He gets home more or less at the same time every day, give or take an hour or so. I, on the other hand, work from home. In late January of this year, we got in a pretty big fight about something stupid. 
I can't remember what it was by now, but it was one of those fights where we didn't speak to each other, text, or call, or anything the whole next day. So this afternoon I was lying in bed getting work done. It was a Tuesday and I'm pretty sure his last class finished at 1pm on Tuesdays, meaning he'd surely be home at 2.30. But around 1pm I heard the front door open and shut. I thought, huh, I guess he's home an hour early today. It was normal for him to skip his class every once in a while, so I didn't really think anything of it. In fact, I was mostly mentally preparing for the awkward post-fight, hey how's it going conversation. So I continued to lie in bed and do my work and wait for him to come in and change his clothes. The bedroom door was closed and I had earplugs sort of half in, as I usually do when I'm working, but I could hear the heavy footsteps of him walking around the apartment, as he always does. If we hadn't been mid-fight and I wasn't so preoccupied with the awkwardness of all of it, I might have noticed it was strange how slow the footsteps were or how long he spent walking around the living room. But I was caught up in the dramatics of the fight and didn't think about it. I was just lying there, waiting, waiting, and waiting for him to finally come in. Finally, the bedroom door slowly opened just a few inches. I turned my head towards the door and prepared to give him a sort of awkward, we've been fighting for 24 hours, huh, smile. But the door didn't open more than a few inches. I looked and saw that it was a woman's hand with red nail polish on the doorknob. Whoever was there slowly closed the door just as they opened it, without entering the room. I jumped out of bed, ripped out my earplugs, and sort of froze there for a few seconds while thinking rapidly. My first thought, that was not my boyfriend. Then I thought, could that have been his mom, his sister, the landlady? For some reason, I concluded that surely it was his mom or sister. So I opened the bedroom door and walked into the living room. There wasn't anyone there, but the room smelled heavily of women's perfume. Then I came to my senses and realized, his mom and sister don't have keys and have never come before. The landlady has never entered without permission. This was a stranger. I went back into my bedroom and shut the door, now shaking heavily. There was a balcony connected to the bedroom so despite the cold January rain, I stood on the balcony and called my boyfriend. He picked up and I asked him if his mom or sister might have come over unannounced. He told me, no, don't move, I'm calling the police. The police were there in minutes and searched the whole apartment. Of course, nobody was there by this point. It was weird though. Nothing was missing from the apartment despite us keeping a jar full of money right in the entrance. Nothing was even touched. In fact, it seemed like the intruder came straight in the bedroom, saw my legs on the bed, panicked, and left. Plus, you can't open that big wooden front door without a key. Nevertheless, we demanded that the landlady change her locks. When she came to change them with her husband, she made a discovery. There was a square area by the keyhole that had been scratched away with something. The landlady said surely someone used tools to break into the apartment. I never got to meet the person who opened the door that day. And I hope I never do. Okay, this happened in 2016 when I was a 17 year old first year college student in film school. I lived alone in my first ever apartment. I never felt unsafe in this apartment for several reasons. There were multiple gates in the residence that needed to be opened through a code only the people who lived there knew, and my door had three different locks and it was right next to the university, so most people who lived in the neighborhood were college students. Nothing bad had ever happened in the neighborhood before. I've always been very careful with locking the door when I leave my home. I always check it twice. So this one time, I leave to go to class and lock my door but for some reason I couldn't get the key out of the lock. It was completely stuck so I went to get the caretaker of the building to help me, but he wasn't there and I was getting late for class, so I went to class with the key still in the lock. I took off the keychain first so it's not too noticeable. But I got home, the caretaker was back so he came to help me, and we couldn't get it out for 15 minutes until somehow he did. He told me the lock was damaged, but that I didn't necessarily need to change it if I only locked it once instead of twice. I just said okay and that was the end of it. I really wasn't worried because of how safe I felt in this building. Flash forward to two months later, I was taking out the trash one night around 11pm. While on the phone with my sister, I remember telling her that I was taking out the trash. Then I would take a shower afterwards before heading to a party. As I previously said, I always locked the door, even just to take out the trash. Because of my lock being damaged, I only locked it once. When I got back to my apartment, I found the door unlocked, which immediately alarmed me. So I went to the apartment and locked the door immediately, with three different types of locks. When you walk into my apartment, which is just 215 square feet, you have the main room in front of you and the bathroom door immediately to your left. I left the bathroom door slightly open, enough so I could see a man in my shower, turning his back to me. Naturally, when I saw this, I tried to open the door and leave as fast as possible except my main lock was damaged from two months earlier and I couldn't open it no matter how hard I tried. In this moment all I could think of was the fact that I had to leave as fast as possible. I jumped out the window without really thinking. I figured it was the only solution except I'd live on the second floor so I completely smashed my ankles in the landing. I started running in whichever way I could and when I got a little bit further from the building I looked back and a man was there at my window watching me run away. I thought of two possible outcomes, either the man was going to jump and chase me except I wouldn't get far with my twisted ankles, or he would get scared of the height and be locked in my apartment. Thankfully, he picked option two. I went to hide in a bush a little further and called the police, who arrived in just 10 minutes because I lived close to the station. They pushed my door open and the man was there just sitting on my couch, holding a kitchen knife, waiting for me to come back, like he didn't think I would call the police. 
They arrested the guy and later told me he had already been arrested for attempted kidnapping and attempted murder. They also told me how everything had happened. Like I said, it was a very friendly neighborhood with mostly college students, so he got inside the building by other people holding the door for him. He then heard me telling my sister I was going to take a shower, which was why he was waiting in the bathroom for me. He crocheted my lock while I was taking out the trash. He apparently noticed me on my school campus and followed me to my home several times before succeeding to actually come in. He stayed inside waiting for me because I had recently changed my phone and the previous one was still on the table, so he thought I didn't have a phone with me to call the police. I don't live there anymore, but after that, to get into the building, we all needed identification proving we lived there. Building IDs were created and we had to scan them every time and it was the only way to go inside the building. Nothing really bad happened in the neighborhood after that. It's back to being very peaceful and friendly. A friend and I played after school hockey. It wasn't a popular sport so our games took place at another school which was incredibly far away and pretty much in the middle of nowhere. The area didn't have any train stations so we relied on three different buses to get there and again to get home. The games usually took place pretty late and ended around 7 to 8 p.m. when it was dark. All the other girls in our team got picked up by their parents, but we always busted together home. We didn't feel it was dangerous because there were two of us and being classic 12 year olds, we thought we were mature enough to be independent. Because we had to change buses three times and we lived so far away, by the time we got to our second bus stop it was usually pitch black. The second bus stop was desolate, far off from the school, in front of some kind of abandoned building and basically a bit creepy. The stop was small and wasn't sheltered, it was just a steel pole with a bus painted on the sign. On this particular night, it wasn't raining as well, so we felt extra miserable standing out in the cold. The buses in my area are also notoriously unreliable, so it wasn't unusual for us to wait an hour at this bus stop. That night it definitely felt like we had been waiting there for over an hour when a car pulled up in front of us. A woman was in it. She rolled down her window and asked us where we were going. I told her the suburb we lived in, which was an hour drive away and she said she could give us a lift if we wanted. If it had been a man, I would have immediately been suspicious and liked it. But because she was a youngish woman, looked about 40, it didn't raise any red flags in my mind. I remember thinking that she must be understandably worried about two young girls standing out in the rain at night. I smiled and thanked her and said it was okay, and we would wait for the bus. She hesitated and then drove away. But a few minutes later, she came back and pulled up in front of us again. She told us her daughter was in at a play and that she was going there anyway to pick her up, so are we sure we didn't want to lift? My friend was almost about to get in, but I hesitated. Maybe thanks to my parents drilling me about stranger danger, and I said thank you, but it was alright, we'll wait. She was a bit pushier this time and asked us if we were sure quite a few times and mentioned her daughter again, but eventually she drove away. At this point, I think my intuition was telling me that it felt a bit weird that she hadn't mentioned her daughter earlier. Another few minutes later, she came back again. This time, she said that she had just driven past our bus further down the road and then it obviously skipped our stop, so she offered to give us a lift to try to catch up to it. This sounded unlikely to me. By this point, I was super suspicious. I didn't really have any time to think, so it was just a bad gut feeling, rather than any logical reasoning. With all the politeness and smiles gone, I straight up just said no. I could tell my friend, who was about to get into her car before, was also starting to feel weird about it because she backed away from the road. The woman hesitated for a while. It lapsed into an awkward silence and I remember she just kept glancing at her back seat. I remember holding my hockey stick tight and playing in my brain how I was going to defend myself. It honestly felt like forever before she finally drove away. A few minutes later the bus came and I had never been so relieved in my life. By this point, we were absolutely soaked. To this day, I still don't know whether she was just worried, a good Samaritan, or a potential kidnapper. I flipped between the two and honestly I can't decide. My friend also thinks it's a mystery. We don't know if we were just being paranoid. This was around 2015 and I was living in Seattle. I worked in an office that allowed me to bring my dog to work. A 100 pound German Shepherd. He's a big sweetheart but looks quite scary to strangers. After work one day, I got on the bus home, which was around a 45 minute ride. I noticed someone stared at me and didn't think much of it. While it's unsettling to be watched, I've had my fair share of odd conversations on the bus and it wasn't out of the ordinary to encounter such weird behavior. I honestly don't remember too much about his appearance, but I do remember thinking he looked fairly normal and didn't seem high or drunk. My bus stop was on a busy street in a bit of a sketchier part of town, but it's not frequently trafficked. When we reached the stop, my dog and I set off on the short trek home, only a few blocks away. As I exited the bus, I noticed the man who had been watching me had exited too. Something was off about him. He seemed intent on keeping stride with me, trailing closely behind. I've heard advice somewhere in the past that you shouldn't go straight home if you're being followed. I'm sure that's situation specific and sometimes it's safer to be in your home, but nothing had happened besides having my personal space invaded and didn't feel immediately unsafe. So I opted not to leave this stranger straight to my door. I knew that my partner at the time wasn't at home, so I decided the best plan was to weave through my neighborhood for several blocks to try to lose him. I think a part of me was also wanting to be sure I was being followed at all, 
or if this person just happened to be walking in the same direction. After several blocks, it became clear he was following me. I was weaving around erratically and he was walking the same path. Neither of us spoke to one another and I was becoming more and more frustrated that anyone would follow a woman home. The streets were quiet and I couldn't see anybody around who I could signal to for help. I don't think I would have been so surprised this was happening if I was alone and without my dog. I can't imagine anyone in their right mind following someone with a large German Shepherd. I started walking faster when I rounded a corner and quickly ducked into a hallway, hugging a duplex a block from my house. I was hoping the pathway would wrap around the house completely so I could get out of the line of sight of this person, but was met with a fence to my face and didn't have time to backtrack. I was ultimately cornered in this nook between a house, a fence, and a hedge. I crouched down with my dog and waited for the guy to pass us. I watched as the man strolled by the walkway, seemingly not noticing us at all. He didn't turn his head or even gaze in our direction. I decided that we'd stay there for a few minutes just to make sure he was gone. About three minutes went by. Just as I was thinking it was safe to head home, the man stepped into my line of sight. He didn't make eye contact with me, just as he had it in the first time he walked by. He was moving calmly and deliberately, and slowly came to a stop as soon as he was right in front of me, just off the curb. He was about two yards away, facing me, and not directly looking, with just a sidewalk and a grassy strip between us. I watched him as he started to unload his pockets. He had a number of metal objects he was taking out, placing them in a line. To this day, I'm not sure what they were, but I'm glad I didn't find out. At this point, I called 911 and told them what was happening, that someone was following me and showing erratic behavior. The cops made it there quickly, and as soon as they pulled up, the dispatcher advised me to get out of there. I hightailed it out of my hiding spot and took a non-direct path home since my house was technically in the line of sight of where I was crouched. I don't know what ended up happening with him, but fortunately never saw him again, and I don't know if he had malicious intent. This happened when both me and my friend Jay were 15. I was spending the night at his house, as I often did. It was a normal enough night, we watched movies, played a couple video games, and stayed up way too late. It was about 2am I think when we heard a loud banging coming from the front door. Luckily at the time we were in his kitchen at the back of the house, so no one could see us. We were spooked because there couldn't have been anyone at the door at this hour, but we figured it was just some drunk person and they'd go away soon enough. After 30 seconds, there was more banging on the door and yelling that neither of us could understand. It sounded like an adult man, and he sounded angry so we both were scared. He texted his mom, who we thought was upstairs, but she said that she had just left a bit before without saying anything. She did that often enough. She liked to go to her friend's houses in the middle of the night, so we didn't pay any attention or notice when she left. We didn't know what to do, as we were scared to call the police based off past experiences with cops in our small town being not the best. At this point, we turned off the kitchen light and we were ducked down on the ground. We heard the banging and yelling getting louder, and I decided to see who it was, if it was anyone we knew. I armed crawled through the dining room, which was also dark and peeked through the door to the living room, which is where the front door was. There was also a huge window by the door that you can see right into the dining room though, so I was very careful not to be seen. I couldn't see any details of the man, but he looked to be about 6 feet tall and had grey hair. I crawled back to Jay and we quietly decided what to do. We heard the knocking stop, so we decided to wait a bit before seeing if it was safe. We also decided to go around the table in the dining room, in case he tried to come around back, which is where the kitchen was. After around 10 minutes of silence, we rock paper scissors for who had to check if he was there, and of course I lost. So I again army crawled to the dining room door. I saw the man staring through the window, hands cupped up against the glass. I made eye contact with him, and the moment he saw me, and I loudly said, causing my friend to panic and crawl behind me. I saw him pull out his phone, and he told me later that he was texting his mom to come home and save us. The man started yelling again, and this time we could make out a bit of more of what he said. It was mostly cussing, although I definitely heard the phrase, I'm gonna kill you, in there a couple times. I quickly looked past the man to see if any of the neighbors seemed to notice him, but no luck. I crawled back out of his sight and again discussed what to do with my friend. We decided to go into the basement for safety, which you could get to by moving the fridge. Confusing house I know, but it was really old and not meant for modern sized appliances. We pull out the fridge and get into the basement, feeling mostly safe but still terrified. I start having a panic attack, although I'm trying to hold it together best I can for Jay, who is also on the verge of a panic attack. We hear a gunshot and shattering glass from above us, and I cover my mouth so I don't scream. Jay and I look at each other, terrified. We hear loud footsteps and yelling above us, the man asking where we went. We hear him going upstairs and run around up there for a bit. He eventually comes back down and starts turning over our furniture, I'm assuming to find us. After what felt like hours, but was probably only minutes, Jay's mom pulls into the driveway, which scares the guy as he runs out the back door in the kitchen. Jay and I get out of the basement and run to greet his mom, never happier to see her. She was shocked by the state of the house and hugged us, happy that we were safe and scared by how close we were to being hurt. We were all scared after that. After that night, they had better security installed, and we went over safety protocol if anything ever happened again. Luckily, it hasn't happened again yet. 
and I hope it never will. I work at a convenience store. I've had some creepy customers come in before, but this one was a little more disturbing. If it weren't for what had been said and done, I don't think this would have been that bad. I normally work third shift, which is around 4pm to around 12am, and I'm by myself for the last 4 hours of my shift. This man had come in earlier that day and was acting odd, jittery, chewing at his lip constantly, fumbling with his debit card, to the point I did everything for him except putting the pen in. Fast forward to around 10.30pm, I'm sweeping the floors as I'm supposed to do every night, when the man entered. He approached my register and asked him what he needed. Hey, can I have one of those lighters? I pick one up and go to scan it, but he tells me that he doesn't have any money. I tell him he can't have it and he glares at me before leaving. A man was in line behind him, and the entire time I was scanning his things, the lighter guy was staring at me through the window right next to my register. He eventually walks off, and the man jokes about the creepy guy asking for a lighter when the man in line didn't even have his with him. He tells me to be safe, then walks out to the gas station pumps. I start sweeping again, but when I turn around and move a small crate out of the way, the creepy guy is staring at me again, just watching me work. I quickly make my way to the back room to make mop water so I could get away from him for a second. He stayed there for a solid 5 minutes before stalking off again. I grabbed a random receipt as a cover and basically bolted to the man at the gas pumps. I got close and asked if he was in a hurry to go anywhere. I told him that the creepy lighter guy was still hanging around and that it was really freaking me out. He promises me that he didn't plan on actually leaving after getting gas. At this point, I thought it wouldn't take up too much of his time, since we both thought the man was already wandering away from the store. Unfortunately, he went back toward the store a few seconds later. Soon, an older woman comes in and I warn her about the creepy guy. She asked what I was talking about and I subtly nod in his direction, mind you, still hanging around my window. She looks a little disturbed, leaning in and whispering, What does he want? I explained that he wanted a lighter, but he didn't have any money so I didn't give him one. I told her to be careful and she quickly told me to worry more about myself since I was at the store alone. She left, and I saw the creepy guy approach the window again. Thankfully, he didn't look in, just hung around it like he was waiting for someone. After a while, a daughter of a family friend comes in with her girlfriend, and we quietly make small talk. Like the last woman, I warned them that the lighter guy was still roaming around and he could be dangerous. Before they get to tell me anything, a woman was talking with the guy from the gas pumps, spotted them while scanning family friend's items, and hurried in and told me to call the cops. Obviously, not familiar with the area I worked in and hearing three different people telling me what numbers to call, I was shaking and in near tears. My family friend said she would call while I calmed down. Another girl had run out at this point, and I don't blame her. Family friend's girlfriend told me that lighter guy threatened to throw rocks through the window and hurt slash rob me. After about three minutes of pacing and trying not to cry, I saw my mom's truck pull in. I bolted to her, telling her what was going on. She calmed down and walked me back to the entrance. As this happened, creepy guy had climbed the hill and crossed the street to Bojangles and sat near the front door. The cops arrived. The man from the pumps gave his statement, I gave mine. And finally, family friend gave hers, which included the threats. From what was said, he was about to break into my car. The man that stayed with me stopped him, but that didn't stop the creep from roaming still. After we talked to the cops, they sped to Bojangles and confronted the lighter guy. After arguing, a quit pat down and more arguing, the man was put in the back of the cop car. Lighter guy, I knew you were probably on something, but please, let's not meet ever again. To set this story, I bike 5 miles one day, 5 days a week to my job, and I've been for 8 months. I honestly love it. It forces me to get exercise, and it's cheap transportation. I take the main road with a lot of traffic, so I've never felt unsafe. I also only ride on the sidewalk, since it's safer. One day, coming home, I was passing by an area with a lot of construction going on. To give you a better visual, I ride on the sidewalk along a busy road. As I'm biking, I see a man in a black pickup truck parked as if he's about to pull out of the area, but he's waiting for a spot to open in traffic. He then sees me and reverses to let me by. I remember thinking, oh great, he's letting me by, and I wouldn't have to ride around behind his car to get to the other side. But as I'm getting closer, he does a stop motion with his hand, and he's wearing a safety vest, so I assume he works there, and there might be a problem up ahead, like a pothole, etc., so I stop. He spoke with authority like as if he's an officer stopping me or something and asked if I bike for transport or leisure. I was a little confused since that's a weird question but I tell him for transport, I bike to my job. He then says, do you bike for leisure? I'm asking because I bought a bike and I'm looking for a riding buddy. I'm not freaking out or anything. I feel a little calm since there are a bunch of cars passing by us so we're not secluded but I don't know this man. He's a complete stranger and I was under the impression he worked there and was stopping me for something important. I tell him not really because I'm too tired on my days off and use them to get errands and stuff done. He says, oh I get it. Well there's a bike marathon happening soon if you want to go with me. I'm Shane by the way. What's your name? 
I tell him my name and say, oh, I don't know, I might be busy then. I'm a little awkward in social situations with people I don't know, and this whole interaction was just off, so I don't really know what to say. He changes the subject and starts looking at my bike. He points at it and asks if it's a hybrid. I say yes, and he says, can I see it? And starts getting out of his car. This is where it starts getting weird. He tells me he's seen me riding before and I thought I was cute. He's also looking at my bike and commenting on it and saying stuff like, oh, that's nice, it's aluminum, and I'm just feeling weird on the inside. I'm also sitting on my bike ready to get the f out of there. He then asks if I have a boyfriend and I tell him yes I do. He lets out a big groan and says, oh man, really? Because if we go biking together, it would be kind of a date thing. I tell him yeah, sorry, and he goes, are you sure? Are you ready to kick him to the curb or what? I just want to get out of here at this point, but he parked his car literally in front of the sidewalk so it wouldn't be that easy to speed by him. He seemed upset and kept asking if I'm sure I have one and how long we've been together. I said, a couple years. Well, I'm crunched for time and have to go, bye, and sped off. After that, I had a mini vacation and was off for five days after that, but now I'm back to riding to work again and I haven't seen him since. This probably happened maybe three or four weeks ago. So creepy older man who tricked me and blocked me on my bike, let's not ever meet again. This was back in 2014. I had moved off campus and into a really nice part of town. I was a junior in college and this was my first time living on my own. Campus was only two miles away so I would often walk back home from campus. I would take the bus or catch a ride with a friend to campus. I walked home because my schedule ending never quite matched up with the bus schedule and my friend finished two hours before my daily schedule did. I was used to walking the two miles to my apartment. I never thought anything of it because I walked through the busy area of my town, along the second main road. So there were always people around. My apartment was actually a stone throw from the most popular frozen custard shop in the area. Every night the parking lot would be packed. So I'm walking home like usual. I get to the frozen custard shop and notice there's a lot of people tonight. It was just something I always noticed and paid attention to. All of a sudden this huge red truck pulls up beside me. I'm cut off guard because I have headphones in. It takes about 30 minutes to an hour to walk home, so I'm normally listening to music or talking on the phone. I stop and take my headphones out and look at the truck. This man dressed like a country singer was sitting in the driver's seat. He looks at me and asks where the mall is. I put him in the direction to the mall. He said, I've been down that way. I'm a photographer and I'm supposed to be doing a photo shoot at a bar behind the mall. I've lived in this town going on three years now. I know where all the bars are located. Makes it easy when all of them are on the same street. I explained to him, there's no bars by the mall. They're all on Philly Street. He continued to insist on a bar being behind the mall. All of a sudden he just changes. He looked at me and asked me to step back. So I did. He looked me over and asked how tall I was. I told him 5'7". He then asked me, I'm doing that photo shoot. Would you like to be a model for it? I told him I don't like getting my photos taken. He insisted, telling me I was beautiful and would look great. Almost like he's given up on the tactic, he moves to another. He then asked me where I live. I told him not far. He wanted more info. I pointed in the vague vicinity of my apartment, making a point not to actually point at it. This dude then asked me if I wanted a ride. I told him no, it's not far, I'll be fine. He kept insisting I let him give me a ride home. I kept telling him no, stepping farther away from his truck. He then out of nowhere asked me how he could get to the mall. I told him, go down this road, at the light turn left. The mall will be on your left. He thanked me and started to drive off. I walked slowly to my apartment. I watched his truck get to the light. Instead of turning left like I said, he went straight. Going straight leads into a small residential area that you need to know this town well to get through. I lived in that town from 2012 to 2017 and still can't figure my way through that area. I made sure that that truck was completely out of sight before I hightailed it to my apartment and locked the door. My dog didn't quite understand what was going on. All he really knew was he had to go to the bathroom pretty bad. I tried to distract him for 5 or 10 minutes to make sure the coast was clear. My heart sunk when I did finally take him out. The same red truck was parked near the parking lot behind my apartment building. The truck didn't belong there. I'm one that memorizes all the vehicles that are normal for the area. No one had a red truck like that. I went back in and texted people describing the man and the truck to them in case something happened to me. I did not go back out for hours. When I did, the truck was gone. I never saw the man or the truck ever again. To the man who probably tried to abduct me in front of the most popular venue in town on my way home, I hope I never see you again. Okay, before I get into the story, there's a few things I need to explain about my country, South Africa, for you to fully understand the story. In South Africa, it's normal to have high brick walls with electric gates, electric fences, alarms, etc. The crime here is hectic. It's also pretty normal to have big gardens. My family and I are big animal lovers, so at the time we had six dogs. Two Sharpays, two German short hair pointers, and two Dachshunds. With that being said, our dogs roam freely in and out of the garden, as it's obviously enclosed. We usually leave the veranda door open during the day for them to do their thing. Another thing about South Africa, 
it's normal to have a live-in domestic worker, maid, and gardener. Like, the average family usually employs them. It's not only for wealthy people, which seems to be a thing in other countries. For the story, our DW is Ellie, and our gardener is Vince. So, this happened in 2007 when I was just 9 years old. My older brother who was 10 and I had just gotten our first cell phones that day. My dad's surprising us after work. You may think it's a bit young, but it was used for emergencies or to communicate with our parents. Anyways, it's an important piece of info for the story. We don't usually leave our veranda door open at night, due to security reasons, but I remember it being a hot summer night that night. So of course, this night of all nights, the veranda door was wide open and the dogs were doing their thing in the garden. My brother and I were in my parents' room setting up our new cell phones, all excited. Ellie's daughter Anne, who was like an older sister to us, 18 years old, was helping my brother and I. My dad was somewhere in the house and my mom was in the bath. I specifically remember Anne having a comment about how the dogs would not shut up and how annoying it was. That's when I noticed it too. Sure, they'd bark but it was usually the dog shuns that yapped, with the bigger dogs just chilled. Plus, it would only happen for a few minutes, then they'd get over it. Something was different that night, as even the bigger dogs were barking nonstop. My dad appeared in his room and mentioned to us that he too noticed the dogs' incessant barking and he was going to check if everything was okay. No alarm bells went off in my head and I don't believe my dad thought anything was amiss either because my brother asked to investigate with them and my dad agreed. I was obviously too engrossed in my new Sony Ericsson. My dad ventured out to our garden with my brother in tow when my dad had noticed the dogs were all grouped, growling and going nuts at a dark corner behind our in-the-ground swimming pool. The best way I can describe it is that our garden beyond our pool hits like a slight decline so we have a few steps leading down the hill to the bottom end of our garden. We usually have a lamp that lights it up, but my dad had noticed how the lamp seemed to be off, which confused him because he could have sworn it worked the other night. Either way, my dad said he got this gut-wrenching feeling because of this and because of how out of the character the dogs were acting. He called after them, they'd usually come running, but tonight, they all just seemed to look at him, then turn back around and continue to go crazy at this dark corner down the steps. My dad told my brother to go back inside the house and get a torch sort of using it as an excuse for my brother to not come out with him because of this awe feeling. When my brother went back inside, my dad slowly approached the steps. He noticed how the dog seemed to be snapping at whatever it was, hiding just out in the view in the darkness. As he got to the steps, he noticed the lamp was smashed. Confused, he inched the steps and as he put two and two together, he was too late. My dad, being an ex-vet and an avid hunter, felt something cold against his temple and immediately knew it was a gun. Out of the darkness stepped four of the men in balaclavas. All armed. Shocked, he stood frozen on the steps. The man holding the gun to his head was instantly aggressive and asked him where my brother was. That he saw my dad come out with my brother, but my brother went back into the house. My dad said something came over him before he knew what he was saying he responded with, he's gone inside to press the panic button. As he said it, he saw how all these guys started to panic. They started speaking in an African language called Zulu. Assuming my dad couldn't understand, it's not common for white people to speak it, but my dad had actually grown up on a farm where he learned it fluently because of the farm workers. The aggressive guy holding the gun said, in Zulu, the cops will be here any minute. Let's just kill this f grab what we can, and go. The others seemed apprehensive, and a smaller guy seemed really on edge, and continued to say how he can't go back to jail again, and they need to get the f out of there before the cops show, which would be any minute. He was panicking. My dad then fed on this guy's fear. My dad then interrupted them, speaking English, pretending to not understand what they were saying, and said that we usually have armed response vehicles that drove in our area, and since my brother pushed the panic button so long ago, they'll probably be here any second. And that did it. My dad watched as their plan unraveled before them. The smaller scared guy started freaking out all the other guys, saying that they need to leave ASAP or else they'd get caught. He seemed to make the others more nervous and lose confidence until they started full on bickering amongst themselves. Their plan slowly turning to as a third guy had put it. The aggressive one pointing the gun to my dad's head slowly lowered it as they started fighting, losing focus on my dad and shifting his focus onto his crew. My dad then used this as an opportunity to slowly back up the steps and turn to dart to the house. As luck would have it, as my dad ran into the veranda door, my oblivious brother was heading out with a torch. My dad scooped him up under his arm mid-ran and sprinted into the house, not even closing the door behind him. Silly I know, but I think he just wanted to get my brother inside as quick as possible without even thinking. Anne and I were obviously also oblivious to everything. When my dad rushed to the bedroom door, slammed it shut and told us to go upstairs into the attic, quote unquote, there's five guys outside with guns, they're here to hurt us, get upstairs now. My heart sank. I remember my body automatically responding and me sprinting to the stairs with Anne right behind. My mom ran out of the bathroom in a towel, not too far behind. We sat there in darkness and silence. I swear you could hear a pin drop. I think we were all just wanting to hear something below us in the rooms. My mom cursed saying she didn't have a phone, neither did my dad. But ha, 
and my hand was my brand new Sony Ericsson. No better emergency to use it than now, right? My mom dials the police and I kid you not, they ask where we live, we explain and they told us it wasn't in their jurisdiction. Sorry, click, the line goes dead. We're now not only ourselves, but we're flabbergasted too. My mom starts cursing like a sailor again and that's when my dad realizes. He didn't close the veranda door and what about Ellie and Vince, who are in the rooms, blissfully unaware of the danger they're in. He gets his firearm in the safe in the attic and tells us whatever we hear, do not come downstairs. To stay hidden no matter what. Now I'm sobbing, begging my dad to not leave us, but he tells us he has to go get Eli and Vince before something bad happens to them. Now there's even more tears, as reality hits that there's two other people still in danger. Anne's understandably in hysterics because she's also fearing for her mom downstairs. My dad disappears and the air is thick with tension. We can still hear the dogs going crazy, indicating that those men were still on our property. My mom then calls another number, the armed security that drives around the area, and they say they'll be over in about 10 to 15 minutes. They sit away and stay hidden until they ring our bell at the gate. We all wait in silence, fearing that we'll hear a gunshot or anything indicating these men are in our house. But there was just silence. The only sound was the dog's barks outside. After what seemed like hours, most likely a couple minutes, we heard stomping coming up from the stairs and my heart rate quickened. I remember shutting my eyes and praying that it was just my dad with Ellie and Vince. Luckily, it was. We all hid for a while, no one dared to speak. The dogs seemed to have calmed down considerably, but we were still barking every now and then. The gate intercom rang, and my dad told us to wait while he checked if it was just the security company, and sure enough, it was. He opened up and the nightmare was over. I remember standing up and my knees buckling from the adrenaline my body endured. The armed security somehow notified the right police, and everyone investigated the garden. They found that there was actually seven pairs of footprints, and that these guys bent the spikes on our wall and just climbed over. We got an electric fence shortly after, so there must have been two other guys hiding in the shadows that my dad hadn't seen, which is actually creepy in its own right. Thank goodness nothing happened to my family, and I'm forever thankful for my dad's quick thinking regarding the panic button. Also, I'm so glad my dad understands Zulu and can manipulate the situation to benefit us. This takes place in the early 80s. I grew up in the suburbs in a very friendly townhouse complex. We all knew our neighbors. My first friends were the kids that lived in other townhouses. To describe my home, all townhomes are attached. They're also very tall and slender. I had six flights of stairs to go from the basement to the bedrooms on the top floor. We had a tiny driveway, and then there was the small roadway. On the other side was a raised flower bed that ran the length of the side of the townhouse wall across the street. The most important thing was a very bright street light in the middle of the planter. It shined ominously right into our front windows at night, and it had enough light to illuminate shapes above the kitchen counter on the third floor kitchen, just the top part of bodies. You didn't need to turn on the kitchen lights at night if you needed to get something. One night I had a sleepover with my friend who lived diagonal to me. Us scouts had stayed up late in which of the kitchen for snacks. I peered out into the street to see an unfamiliar guy walking by on the roadway. There was no sidewalks. I noted to my pal that there was a weirdo walking by because he didn't seem right. He was tall and lanky with long 80s hair. With our familiarity with people in the neighborhood, we didn't recognize him. Our complex roadway did lead to a street, but it wasn't used as a shortcut because it was a long way to get around the neighborhood, so you didn't see others often, especially at night. As soon as I commented weirdo, he walked by our house. Only a couple of minutes later, he walked by again, going in the direction he came on the roadway. This time, we saw him out of the corners of our eyes coming along. Being scared kids, we immediately ducked as we were visible to the street. Up until then, we didn't think anything more of it but our instincts told us to hide, so we did. My friend said we were overreacting after a few minutes being crouched down, so we carefully peered over the counter. Weirdo hadn't walked by. He was now standing in front of the flower planter looking up at our house. To this day, I remember that bright street light illuminating him from behind very ominously. He looked like a horror film killer come to life. We hit the floor again thoroughly freaked out. I don't know how long we were there for. I could only hear the sound of our breathing for some time, until I thought I heard the squeak of the garage door handle. It was one of those old rusty ones that opened outward. I thought I was dreaming until I heard for the second time that rusty handle squeak. He was trying to get in now. My friend and I were frozen in fear. Luckily, my dad always locked the garage. The squeaking stopped. Even though my friend and I could have run upstairs or shut it to my parents, we were rooted on the spot thinking if we moved he'd get us somehow. We thought that was it as it was suddenly quiet. But a few minutes later I heard the swoosh of the screen door and telltale sound of the front door handle being pressed down. The first screen door was never locked, but thank god the wooden door always was. The noise repeated a few times. The metal scratching of the screen door hinge and the click of the front door latch. I wanted to piss my pants, and my friend looked like crying. Again, we were too silly enough to move or do anything to help ourselves. 
We just shook in terror and hoped he'd go away. He stopped trying to get in after about five minutes, and all we heard after that was silence. About eight minutes later on the kitchen floor, we moved to stand up. I thought we were still pretty crouched down and invisible. That wasn't the case. This time we heard a clear voice. The other kitchen window near the pantry had its screen window open. Hey, I'm thirsty. Can I get a glass of water? My friend and I stared at each other in disbelief. He was still there. We didn't move, but someone had to eventually. My friend being the braver one decided to peek out the screen window while trying not to be seen. He must have heard her. I know you're there. Come on and let me in. I won't hurt you. This was the moment we decided to flee up those two flights of stairs to my bedroom. I always had an active imagination like most kids. I really hated that my bedroom was the very first one at the top of my stairs. My parents were at the back. Therefore, in mind, I would be the first one to be murdered if someone broke in, and that fear was certainly tenfold that very night. My friend and I hunkered down on my bed, deep under the covers, shaking. We did not sleep at all, waiting for the click of a door or worse. We thought we heard him try again, but at that point we weren't sure if we were hearing things. Until the day I moved out, I never really felt totally comfortable in my bedroom ever again. I'm a 21 year old female and this story took place when I was around 11. I remember this day clearly because it was the first time I was ever allowed to walk to school and back by myself. Up until the age of 14, I lived in what we thought was a safe place in Chautauqua County, New York. Everyone knew everyone here. If you thought you would get away with something, then be prepared to have your ear chewed off by the time you get home. There was this one day though, it was a cold winter day and school unfortunately was still open so all the neighborhood kids had to walk through knee-high inches of snow just to get to school. It took me longer to leave the house as I was used to walking with my older sister to school since she knew the routes better than me. I always used to make fun of her for being paranoid and taking a different route every day from school, but after that day, I learned that was what saved my life. As I was waiting by the door to leave, my mom came up to me and told me that I should ride with her to drop me off because my sister was too sick to go today. Being a brat, I made a big deal about walking by myself because I was almost 12 years old and all my friends' parents let them walk alone. She looked at me for a long while, then told me to make sure I pay attention to cars. I got hit by a car and almost died when I was 9, so the worry that showed on her face was well warranted. I hurriedly nodded and headed out the door to go to school. My sister didn't like to dilly dally, so she was always in a rush to get to school early, but seeing as it was just me, I thought it would be a good idea to take my time. I would play in the brown slush that was on the left side of the road, and even made funny looking snowballs to see how far I could throw them. Halfway to school I noticed a white van following behind me. Being the playful child I was, if I had not been bending down and making another snowball, I wouldn't have noticed it slowly creeping up the street. I told myself I was being stupid, but continued more hurriedly to school. Once I got to school, I took a quick glance over my shoulder and saw the van a few feet behind me. It wasn't until I was on school grounds that it drove away fast by me. I thought that would be the end of it, but throughout the day when I would stare out the window, the van would be there. I assumed that it never really left, just parked. Many adults would try to convince me years later that maybe it wasn't the same one, but I knew it was. The van had a bright yellow smile emoji sticker on it. I couldn't see who was in the van, but through the tinted glass, I knew they could see me. It was now the end of the day and I wasn't ready to go home. It was too late to call my mom, because she was at work and my sister was homesick. I had to suck it up and start walking home. I tried to blend in with a group of kids, but most of them were car riders, and the others didn't live near me. Remembering what my sister told me, I took another route home. I didn't memorize this route clearly, but I decided anything was better than being spotted by that van. I made it to my main street, but realized my mistake too late. The route I took led back to the main street where I walked to school. Hidden behind a row of cars was the white van with a smiley emoji sticker. I tried to stay calm and walk past in, but once I heard the van door slightly click open, I ran. I could hear the rush of two pairs of heavy footfalls behind me. They were getting closer, so I did what any normal kid would do. I cut corners. I cut into someone's backyard until I was directly inside of my house and forced myself into the thick snow to make it to the door. My heart was racing, not because I was running, but because I could still hear them behind me. I made it to the door and banged with all my might until someone came to the door. My sister looked confused, but one look at my face and she pulled me inside and locked the doors. The van was still outside. Truthfully, it stayed out there until my brother got home. Me and my sister don't talk about it, but we both knew how close it was to me going missing. Whoever you are that attempted to kin at me and do God knows what else, let's not ever meet again. When I was 20 years old, so 6 years ago, I worked as a delivery girl for a pretty popular pizzeria in my area. Initially, I worked the late morning to mid afternoon shift, but when the guy who delivered for the night shift ended up getting fired due to him losing his license because of a DUI, I was placed on the night shift since my boss hired a family friend who could only work my shift for whatever reason. I really didn't want this shift because you never know if people who order late at night actually want a pizza or if they have other intentions in mind. Unfortunately, my boss isn't the nicest of people 
and essentially told me if I wasn't willing to work the night shift, I was fired. I wasn't exactly in a position where I could be out of work, albeit temporarily, so I reluctantly worked the shift. The first month of this shift, I went by without any issues, until I had to deliver a pizza to a house that just barely made our delivery radius. I punched it in on my GPS, and the house was located in a pretty suburban part of the city. I arrive and it's about 11pm. The block was extremely quiet, decently lit, and mostly littered with modern townhouses, but the house I delivered to was a duplex. I ring the doorbell and wait for about 30 seconds. No answer. I ring it again and wait another 30 seconds. Still no answer. I'm standing there getting pretty nervous that something's about to go down, but thankfully a man opens the door. He looked like he was in his late 40s. He was pretty tall, maybe a little over 6 foot, and he was very skinny. I tell him his pizza is here and he just stands there staring at me. I asked him if he was okay and he responded by saying, Yeah, I'm fine, sorry. I got off work not too long ago and I'm just zoning out a bit. Fair enough, I suppose. He hands me the money. I hand him the pizza and as I'm making change, he says, You're really beautiful, you know that? Not really thinking too much into it, I thanked him for the compliment and gave him his change. I said goodnight and he did too. I walked back to my car and finished my deliveries for the night. A few days later, I get a delivery order to the same place. I head over there around the same time as last time and ring the doorbell. He answers the door very excitedly and says, Hey, it's you again. How are you? I told him I was tired and I can't wait to go home to which he chuckled and said, I know that feeling pretty well, as he was pulling out his wallet. As he's counting his money, he asked me what my name is. Being kinda tired at this point and not really thinking straight, I stupidly told him my name. As I'm making a change, he asked if he could have my number, as he'd love to hang out with someone as gorgeous as I am. I've literally only met this guy like twice to deliver a pizza. I had no idea who this guy was, and I'm positive he barely knew who I was as well. Another thing to mention is I looked way younger than I was at that time. I was told by numerous people that I still looked like I was 15, and I was hoping he thought differently as he wasn't hitting on what he thought was a teenager. I'm just standing there awkwardly for a few seconds before I muster out, Sorry, I have a boyfriend. He gets upset and says, Oh, okay, I see. We stand there in silence before I tell him to have a good night, and walk back to my car. He says nothing and still stands at the doorway, staring at me, until he finally went back inside once I started my car. I got a pretty creepy vibe from this guy, and even brought it up to my co-workers, and they agreed it was pretty creepy. Except for my boss, who overheard everything and claimed I was making up stories and trying to gain sympathy for having to take the shift. A week later as I'm working the night shift, we get an order from the same guy again and this is when it finally hits the fan. I arrive at the house at around 10.30pm, and keep in mind that from my perspective on the road, it didn't look like a single light in the house was on. I get out of my car and I walk to the front door with the pizza box in my arms. As I'm approaching the door, it quickly swings open to reveal the man, except this time, he was wearing a suit and I jumped back. He laughs and said, Sorry if I scared you. I saw you out on the window, and I figured if I just opened the door now, so you wouldn't have to ring the bell. I was getting scared because as I mentioned before, there were no lights on in the house. So he was sitting in the dark this whole time. And if so, why? I nervously laugh and say, it's okay. He asked me if I liked his suit, which I said yes. He then asked me, would you like to go on a date with me tonight? I once again tell him I have a boyfriend, to which he chuckles. He gets close to me and says, there's no way a girl your age is in a serious relationship. You should really go on a date with me. He grabs the pizza box from me and throws it to the side and grabs me by my arms hard. I'm officially sweating bullets at this point and now I'm trying to cry from the fear that was overwhelming me. I start pleading with him, dude please, I just want to go home, I don't want to go on a date tonight. He just stares at me with the most sinister look I've ever seen on someone's face and says, I don't care, get inside now, we're gonna have a good time. He starts trying to pull me to the house and I'm trying to resist as hard as I can. After a bit of struggling he lets go of one of my arms and starts grabbing something out of his pocket which I presumed was a knife. I did something to this day that I'm still thankful worked as he was doing that. I used my free arm to punch him as hard as I could in the stomach. This stuns me for a few seconds and as he loosened his grip on me, allowed me to break free. I quickly run to my car and as I get in he runs at me and tries pulling me out of the car, holding the knife in the other arm and just starts yelling. I grab a half empty soda bottle I had in the cup holder and throw it and luckily it hits his head and he lets me go. I slam on the door and then all of a sudden he jumps right on the hood of my car and starts scratching and banging on my windshield with his knife. I put the car in reverse and quickly back out of the spot and quickly reverse down the road with him desperately trying to hold on. He's banging on my hood screaming, stop the car. I turn onto the next road as swiftly as possible and luckily, he falls off the hood of my car. I slammed the gas as hard as I could to get away from him as far as I could. In my panicked state, I drove a couple blocks down the street and kept making turn after turn onto other side blocks as I feared I was being followed. Eventually, I reached a red light and I slammed on the brakes and just sat at the intersection frozen 
from what had just happened. I began crying and violently shaking as I was just sitting there. It dawned on me that I came so close to losing my life and I couldn't help but feel like I shouldn't have been alive. Once the light turned green, I pulled over to the side and just sat there crying. Eventually, I get the energy to drive back to the pizzeria and almost immediately after I walk in, my coworker knew something was wrong after seeing me. I practically broke down in front of him and everyone else came to the front wondering what was going on. I fought my tears and explained everything that just happened. My coworker comforted me and my boss surprised me and began apologizing profusely for what had happened and for putting me on the night shift. He took me into the office and handed me the phone to call the cops. They arrived at the store and I gave them my statement, as well as taking pictures of any marks on myself as well as scratches on my car for the encounter as evidence. My coworker followed behind me as I drove home and I collapsed on my bed and strangely enough, I managed to fall asleep. I quit my job the next day and luckily a friend of mine managed to hook me up with a new job at her clothing store. As far as the psycho goes, two days later I received an update from the police. The entire duplex is owned by the guy's brother who lived on the right side with his wife and the psycho lived on the left side of the duplex. I learned that he had been in and out of jail constantly at first for robberies and assaults. He had been released from jail about five months ago apparently. When they arrived at the house, he was long gone and his family had no idea where he ran off to, but the police insisted they would find him. And indeed they did, albeit not alive. I spent the next two months in fear that he would find me and finish what he had in mind, but the police contacted me and updated me on the case. Apparently, he fled to another city nearby and attempted to kidnap a teenager walking alone late at night on the street. Luckily, somebody happened to be looking out the window at the right time, called the cops, and the police caught him by trying to force her into his car. He manages to flee and the police chase after him. He blew a red light near a busy boulevard and a van slammed right into the driver's side of his car. By some sort of miracle, the driver of the van only sustained minor injuries, while the psycho succumbed to his wounds long before the ambulance even arrived. I thanked the officers for everything they did and for informing me, so I walked out of the station. I walk down the street and I light up a cigarette as I'm taking in everything that I'd just been told. I don't wish death on people, but after hearing about his death, I felt relieved. I felt relieved that he couldn't hurt anyone anymore. I was relieved that I wouldn't have to ever encounter him again and that I wouldn't have to go through with charging him and reliving what happened that night. Who knows where I'd be if he managed to pull me into his house. I grew up in Ohio in the 70s, and me and my childhood friend Joe were outside all the time when we could manage it. Joe lived on a farm that bordered a pretty big forest, and my parents would drop me off in the morning and we'd stay in the woods all weekend. We'd only come out for school. We loved pretending that we were frontiersmen. We'd build shelters, traps, practice making fire with sticks, the whole nine yards. When we got to be in high school, we got this notion to pull a stand by me. This was based on the movie on the same name that just came out. The idea was that we'd walk the railroad tracks out in the country, but instead of looking for a dead body, we'd find cool bridges to fish from and to camp little ways off the tracks. Of course, we knew this was dangerous and we'd likely be trespassing, but we were kids. We had a lot of fun. We did find beautiful rivers. We discovered bridges no one went to. We fished. We hid from trains. At night, we camped in woods just near the tracks and made small hidden fires. Nothing bad ever happened. It was idyllic. In fact, it was so fun we did it multiple times. Never had a problem. After high school, me and Joe went our own ways. We both left home, but always stayed in touch and always tried to coordinate visits so we would see each other occasionally. Well, one summer in the mid-90s, it worked out that we were both in town for about a week. We would do stuff with family in the day, and at night, we'd either catch drinks at a bar or sit outside Joe's house around a fire and talk about the old days. One night, me and Joe got to talking about our stand-by me trips. Well, nostalgia and beer are a heck of a mix. Soon, we decided to take a day, walk the rails, camp one night, and walk home. The day came, we started out early morning. We had my wife drop us off in our old spot where we used to start, right outside our hometown. She thought this was absolutely crazy and made sure to mention it. When she pulled away, Joe suggested that instead of walking the usual route, we take the opposite direction, just to be adventurous. We knew the land well, we had a map, and so I gave it a screw it, and off we set. The day went fine. It was fun and a little sad, but in a good way. We found a bridge and sat on the edge, smoked a joint and moved on. We had no fishing gear, but we brought some canned food and other stuff. Before night started to set in, we picked a spot to camp. It was a thick forested area, trees on every side of the train tracks, so you felt like you were in a tunnel. We had brought small hammocks to sleep on, but before we set them up, we decided to do a little scouting of the perimeter. Now, this is what we used to do in the old days too. 
We'd walk the area around a little bit just to make sure some dude's house wasn't just over a hill and we were actually camping in their yard. We walked maybe a hundred or so feet into the woods and up a small incline. We figured if we didn't see anything from up top of the short hill, we'd be fine. But when we got to the top, we saw an old building down at the bottom, about a hundred yards into the woods. It was barely visible. We pondered over what to do. We both assumed it was a sugar shack or something, because there didn't appear to be any clear road into it. From where we were, there didn't look to be anyone in it either. All was quiet. No movement could be seen. No lights. We decided to walk a little closer, just to make sure. We came down the hill very slowly, and as we neared the building, we saw it and it wasn't a sugar shack at all. It was an old church. It looked like it had been abandoned for years. It was a squat, sagging building whose wooden planks were almost black from years of moss and rot. A cross still stood on top of the place, also weathered black. None of the windows had glass, and there were no doors, just open doorways. We got close enough to see inside. There were rows of pews in a built-up section in front for a preacher to stand. We didn't go all the way in. We didn't want to. Beyond all that, there was no sign of anyone else. No footprints, no paths, no roads. It was an abandoned church. We left immediately and went back up the hill to our spot that we had picked to camp. Having a hill between us and the church made us feel better, but we were still a little uneasy. We chalked it up just to the natural creepiness seeing a church in the middle of the woods would elicit. Besides, at this point it was dusk and we just decided to rake up our hammocks and go to sleep and move on at early morning. Night set in, and as we lay in our hammocks and just talked, we began to hear something in the direction of the church. Our conversation about it went a little like this. Do you hear that? What is that? It sounds like people singing. And it did sound just like singing. We both slid right out of our hammocks and hunkered down, straining to hear more. We listened for a minute or two, and the singing continued, but it wasn't getting louder. Finally, we decided to creep back up the hill and see if we could spy where the sound was coming from. We could still move very quietly in the woods from the old days. It was second nature to us. The moon was barely out, but it provided enough light so you wouldn't walk right into a tree, but it was near pitch black. We didn't use flashlights as we crept slowly up the hill, and we didn't talk. When we got to the top, we saw light in the distance. It was coming from the church, and the singing was coming from inside. Joe and I put our heads close together and had a hushed conversation that boiled down to, can you believe this? The light looked to be a candlelight from the way it flickered, and though we tried, we couldn't make out what was being sung. It sounded like church music, but in another language. We sat and watched for a while, trying to see who was in there, but we only saw occasional shadows. We had no intention of getting closer either. We had about a football field length between us, and we aimed to keep it that way. The singing continued for a bit, and then it stopped. After that, a booming male voice began to chant. I was already freaked out, but this voice thoroughly scared the crap out of me. It sounded like some Old Testament preacher you see in movies, but again, it was like he was speaking in a different language because we couldn't understand a single word. Eventually, it got to where the single male voice would say something, and then a bunch of voices would answer in song. This lasted for a while, and then they all broke into this long, sustained wail that just kept getting louder. It got so loud and so disturbing that I covered my ears. Then it stopped. At this point, I was just getting ready to say, let's get the heck out of here, when Joe put a hand on my shoulder and hissed, they're coming out. We were far enough away that we couldn't really make them out very well, but what we could see was a line of figures walk out the open doorway, all holding hands in single file. We could see some of them had flashlights. They began to sing again, and the light from the flashlights began to move toward us and the hill. We booked it back down to our campsite, grabbed our stuff, and ran to the tracks. Once there, we ran down the tracks in the direction we had come from. After a few minutes, we stopped and looked back. We saw lights coming down the hill, and they were moving erratically like whoever was holding them was shaking them. We continued to run in spurts and walk as fast as we could. We eventually stopped seeing the lights and came to a road. By our map, we knew a small town that was about 15 minutes down it, and we walked there, got to a 24-hour gas station, and called my wife to come get us. My wife and other friends all just thought it was kids messing around, but I heard those voices and they sure as hell didn't sound like any kids to me. Not sure who those people were, but it was definitely the most creepiest thing that happened to me out in the woods. So, this happened about five years ago while I was nine months pregnant. I was Christmas shopping at the mall with my then seven and 15 year old daughters one Saturday night in a very safe city with very low crime rate. There was an Applebee's connected to the mall and we ended our shopping pretty late and the mall stores were starting to close so I took my kids to the connected Applebee's for a late dinner. We finished up eating at about 10 p.m. and leave out the Applebee's entrance into the practically deserted parking lot with shopping bags in tow 
As we got to the car, I was in the middle of maneuvering the shopping bags in my arms to find my keys. When a 50 ish year old looking guy starts walking up from somewhere in the parking lot with shaggy gray and white hair and a faded flannel shirt and old jeans. I noticed him briskly approaching when he was about 40 feet away and he said, Give me all your money now. My blood ran cold and I stared at him owlishly and shakingly said, What? He then said he was just kidding and came up and stood right next to my daughters who were standing on the other side of the car, waiting for me to unlock the door to let them in. He then starts making small talk with me and my girls. He's asking things like if they were being good girls for Santa, how old they were, if we got all of our Christmas shopping done, what kind of things did we get, etc. He didn't seem drunk, high, slow, or anything at all. He was very coherent and seemed sound of mind. Mind you, I was a heavily pregnant woman, alone with my two daughters in a mostly deserted parking lot at 10 o'clock at night was being approached by a stranger who came and stood right next to my kids on the other side of the car, just shooting the breeze, talking to me and my kids with his hands in his pockets and occasionally looking over his shoulder. I didn't want to aggravate him, so I was politely conversing with him and trying to look calm and nonchalant while trying to disguise my frantic hands digging inside of my giant purse for my car keys. This exchange went on for about a couple of minutes while he periodically kept looking over his shoulder. I was silently panicking and trying to politely keep the situation from escalating by calmly and nonchalantly talking to him while also trying in vain to find my car keys to get us out of there. They were in there hiding good. I felt that at any moment he was going to pull a knife or gun or rob me and my kids were right next to him, away from their mother on the other side of the car and I couldn't find my car keys to get my kids into the safety of the car. He kept trying to engage them in conversation, and I could see that my oldest daughter was a little weirded out. She kept glancing at me to gauge my assessment and reaction to the situation. Being that he was only talking and acting friendly, and I was doing my best to stay calm, they were oblivious to the alarming situation we were all in. And being 9 months pregnant, and that I was no match for this full grown man, especially if he was hiding a weapon on him. While still desperately digging for my keys, I tried to politely give him hints that the conversation was over by saying things like, It was nice chatting with you, but I gotta get these kids to bed. And, It was nice meeting you, and telling my girls to say that it was nice meeting him too. My polite attempts to get this guy to leave wasn't working because he kept sidestepping my attempts and asking them what their favorite school subjects are and how nice young ladies they were, etc. While I was struggling with the shopping bags and digging in my giant cluttered purse for my car keys, my outgoing 7 year old was completely oblivious to how not okay the situation was, because he was being friendly and because of the whole, I'm with mommy so I'm safe child mentality. So she started to talk about what she picked out for dad for Christmas, and started enthusiastically talking about kid stuff and asking him if he knew what Minecraft was, etc. and keeping this creep from leaving us alone by keeping him engaged in conversation. They didn't realize that I was becoming desperate to get them out of there. Then I suddenly felt this sinking feeling of dread when I realized that I may have lost my car keys in the mall, and that we were stuck outside with this strange man who kept looking over his shoulders and was showing no signs of walking away, and I was thinking that he was waiting for the perfect moment to pounce. All he had to do was grab one of my girls and threaten their life, knowing it would make me do whatever he wanted as long as he wouldn't hurt them. I started to feel my adrenaline start to spike, and my heart and stomach started doing flip-flops, and I felt like at any moment something was about to go down, as the gravity of realizing that there were no other people or witnesses around, and that they were totally alone with him at that moment, the odds were stacked against us, and that he has his chance. He all of a sudden was all like, okay, it was nice talking to you, see you later, and walked off in the same direction as which he came. It wasn't until then, I found my car keys and locked the car and told my kids to get in fast and I got in too and locked the doors and started the car and drove out of there. My 15 year old lightheartedly and jokingly said, okay, that was weird, and laughed. I was overwhelmed with relief and then I was confused over what just happened. I thought to myself, why the heck would a guy of seemingly sound mind think it was totally acceptable to go out of his way just to approach a woman and her kids in a deserted parking lot late at night just to chit chat? But being that nothing bad happened, I brushed it off and joked about it too. When we got home, my husband greeted us and asked us how shopping went and I said it went well and my 15 year old told him what happened in the parking lot and how weird it was and was kind of joking about it. I started joking too saying how I was mentally having a panic attack while trying to look calm and I started making fun of myself by telling my husband how I was attempting to inconspicuously rummage through my purse to find my car keys. My husband went completely white and I acknowledged his horrified look of alarm and I assured him that albeit creepy, the guy was talking and eventually left on his own. Now, my father-in-law is a retired sheriff deputy and my husband went through police academy training after graduating high school. He decided to go to business school instead of becoming a cop. And being that the knowledge he gained from that, plus growing up with a cop for my dad, I found out why my husband looked absolutely horrified when I told him about the details. What my husband told me completely rattled me to the bone. 
My husband told me that he was 100% sure the reason why that guy was hanging around us and chit chatting was because he was waiting for me to unlock my car. And the reason why he was standing next to our kids was because once I unlocked the car and the kids started to get inside, he was most likely going to force himself into the car with the kids and hold a knife or gun to them to gain leverage on me to force me to cooperate, knowing that I wouldn't abandon my kids which would force me to get into the car with him and then do whatever he wanted me to do, which most likely would be to drive to a remote location to do whatever knows what. And being that he wasn't wearing a mask, suggests that his intentions were to also leave no witnesses to identify him. I then remembered that he was positioned by the backseat passenger door where my 7 year old was, standing by waiting to get in. My husband then told me that the most likely reason why the guy ended up leaving was because it took so long for me to find my keys and the longer it took, the more anxious and spooked it made him. And that whole time, me trying to search for my car keys in my purse saved me from potentially being abducted. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I recently discovered this sub and immediately thought of this experience that happened to me two summers ago while I was cat sitting and house sitting for an older couple I met in a French class I was taking. This couple lived near a busy corner with a bookshop, coffee shop, a grocery store, and a movie theater in a nice neighborhood of a big city. For all these reasons and more, I was pretty excited to house sit there. My own apartment, where I lived with my boyfriend and my own cat, was about a 10 minute drive to 40 minute walk further up the street in a quiet, residential area with nothing much around it. Now, my own cat is vocal and super social. Because of this, we try never to leave him alone at night because he will literally cry for us all night. We're always slightly paranoid that he's going to get us evicted due to noise complaints from neighbors. We lived on the top floor and you could literally hear him crying from the bottom floor and outside if the door to the building is open. So my boyfriend and I decided that he should stay at the apartment with our cat while I was house sitting. My boyfriend drops me off at the house and I settle in with my luggage. Look around the surprisingly large three story house and then decide to walk over to the grocery store to pick up some food for the next few days. As I'm walking home with my bag of groceries, I notice this man, extremely tall and gaunt, with a head full of long, shaggy hair, walking parallel across the street watching me. I'm only about two houses away from the place where I'm staying, so I sit down on the edge of the wall as though I'm taking a break and call my mom, trying to keep an eye on him surreptitiously from the corner of my eye. This man stops behind a pole across the street and continues to watch me. I tell my mom this guy seems to think that a pole hides him from my view, but that I can see him from there, standing still as a statue, just watching me. I don't want him to know where I'm staying, so we continue chatting and eventually, I turn my full gaze on the man to let him know that I see him watching me. For a moment he doesn't react at all, then he just sort of meanders on down the small street and I watch him turn the corner and disappear from my view. I tell my mom and gather my groceries and walk cautiously down the street, keeping an eye out for him as I near the place I'm house sitting and don't see him. I dart in through the back door next to the garage as quickly as I can and breathe a sigh of relief once I'm inside. I tell my mom everything's good and I put away the groceries and forget about the entire incident. The couple has a beautiful library, so I continually spend the rest of the afternoon and well into the evening just perusing their walls of books and selecting a few to bring upstairs to the guest bedroom on the third floor. I'm playing some music and just enjoying the quiet downtime all to myself. I finally get sleepy, text my boyfriend goodnight, and fall asleep. I wake up shortly thereafter, after a terrifyingly realistic dream that this gaunt man has walked into the room, trailing his fingertips along my body. The room is dark, all the window blinds shut, and my body goes completely still. Half positive that it wasn't a dream, and that he had somehow broken in, it was waiting in the shadow. I quietly reach underneath my pillowcase for my phone, I always keep my phone tucked under my pillow, and it's not there. My panic rises, and my mind overreacts. He's here and he's playing a game with me. He took my phone. He's somewhere in the house. I desperately begin to pat around my bed as quietly as possible, searching beneath the other pillow for my phone. Not there. I think, surely he'll hear me if I get out of my bed to look. But I suddenly remember that I left my laptop next to me on the bed and I open it, quickly sending text after text to my boyfriend through iMessage until he wakes up. I tell him I can't find my phone, had a bad dream, and I'm super anxious. With him awake and responding, I get the courage to flip on the lamp and get out of bed. I search around the floor, thinking my phone must have fallen while I was sleeping. Nope, not on the floor. Finally, as I search the bed frantically, I find it atop the covers on the other side of the bed. Weird, but I suppose I must have knocked it across the bed or something. I don't sleep well the rest of the night, hearing noises from across the three floors of the creaky stairs and house. 
thinking anyone could break in through the patio door across from my room. All they'd have to do is get to the balcony and wake up the next morning exhausted. The next day, I'm sitting in the living room at their piano practicing. I'm an opera singer, and I was mostly excited about this house sitting because I'd get the chance to sing without worrying about apartment neighbors complaining, with the blinds open. There are some kids riding their bikes, neighbors with dogs, the usual. I'm enjoying my afternoon when I notice there's an odd, run-down, dilapidated, dark house nearly diagonal to this one, which doesn't fit in at all with the otherwise nice neighborhood. Gaunt Man walks out of it and sits on the porch. My stomach drops. I call my boyfriend and tell him that the creepy guy apparently lives across the street. I shut the blinds facing that way so that he can't see me and retreat to the other side of the house with the kitchen. I spend the rest of the day chilling, convincing myself that I'm overreacting, that everything is fine and I don't need to worry. Nonetheless, come nightfall, the house seems just way too large, with too many entrances and the bottom floor is so far away that I worry the noise wouldn't carry up to the top floor if someone did break in. Naturally, I cannot sleep at all. I end up retrieving a knife from the kitchen and stashing it under my pillow. Noises keep me up. Creaks, odd sounds. Around 11pm, I call my boyfriend and beg him to come stay with me, assuring him that our cat could survive one night without us. He drives over and pulls into the garage. I come unlock the hall door from the garage to let him inside. I still don't sleep well, but at least I get some sleep with him here, feeling a little safer. He gets a little weirded out about the knife under the pillow and tells me to put it back where I got it. I stash it in the bedside drawer, just in case. The next day, I pull it together and tell him he doesn't need to stay. I'm clearly overreacting. Then comes nightfall and the prolifera of odd noises. I decide I can't stay in the guest room at the top floor anymore because I feel like I can't hear anything. I go down to the second floor and try to sleep on the couch in their media room. George of the Jungle is on TV and I try to fall asleep while watching that. Instead I get more and more paranoid that I won't be able to hear anything over the movie and end up switching the movie off. I try to fall asleep again. Now I'm sure that I can hear noises from both above and below me. Not the cat who, every night, hid in a tote bag in their bedroom on the second floor and never made a sound except to hiss at me when we crossed each other's paths. I get no sleep, patrolling the entire house all night, finally falling asleep as the night sky tinged grey with dawn. The next day was my birthday, and his little sister was flying up from across the country to spend a week with us. He couldn't stay the night with me anymore because she was still quite young and needed adult supervision, and I insisted that she stay at our place rather than have them come to the house I was at. Fortunately, my best friend had just returned from her trip, and we decided to have a birthday sleepover. I feel a little paranoid, but again, I'm able to get some sleep with someone else there and wake up a little more refreshed. She leaves, and I sit in the kitchen, which faces the street where Gaunt Man first saw me. Gaunt Man is across the street, walking and watching. I duck down against the wall below the window, placing my phone at the gap between the blinds with only the top of my head showing. Gaunt Man gets closer, still watching as I hit record on the video. I get several seconds of him watching the house until he suddenly seems to notice the top of my head or the phone and snaps his own gaze back to the sidewalk below him and walks on. My heart is pounding. Now he knows that I've watched him watching me again. Probably saw the phone recording or taking a photo and he lives right across the street, where he often sat on his porch for hours smoking with a couple of other men, facing my direction. The next few nights were a blur of me wandering around the house, checking closets and other closed spaces upon returning from going out, placing chairs against entrances so that I'd hear them scrape if they got moved, half sleeping in the media room, double checking windows, exhausted until the couple of hours of sleep I would get when the sky would tinge grey and I'd felt I'd survive the most dangerous part of the night. My best friend found out I wasn't sleeping at all and offered to stay with me for the last night. Boyfriend's little sister was still there so he couldn't. I accepted her offer, feeling foolish and overdramatic, but thankful. We stayed back in the guest room on the top floor, watching Parks and Rec quietly with the subtitles on, so that I could still hear the rest of the house. It was around 1am or so when a shrill, piercing siren suddenly echoed throughout the house. My best friend and I sat up in bed, paralyzed for a moment with fear and confusion. Did they say anything about an alarm? She asked me. No, I responded, hesitantly wondering if I had missed something in the notes they had left. We stared at each other for another long moment. What should we do? She asked. I don't know, I said. We should shut the door and lock it, right? She was the closest to the door. She shut it quickly and locked it. I moved the nightstand in front of it, a pathetic barricade. The siren continued to wail throughout the house. Should we call the police? I asked, my heart pounding into my mouth, opening the blinds with my hands and trying to peer through the dark street below. There was a window to the bathroom with the access from the balcony patio. I checked it, just to make sure yet again that it was shut and locked. We should probably call the police. Or should we? She had already begun to call the police. 
telling them that we were house sitting and an alarm had just gone off. We were concerned about a man who had been watching me over the past few days and we were alone in the house. The police got our address and said that they would arrive soon. Suddenly, the alarm stopped. With the alarm off, we gathered the courage to remove the nightstand from the door and unlock it. I had Pepper Mace gripped tightly in my hand as we swung the door open, ready to confront whatever was out there. Nothing. No one. I checked the giant glass door a few steps away that led to the balcony patio. Locked. We made our way down the stairs, cautious, quiet. We finally made it down to the bottom floor when there was pounding at the front door. I hurriedly made it over to the door, removing the chair I had placed in front of it as quickly as I could, letting in two policemen. They identified themselves to the door. They came inside, asked me a few questions about this man, and then decided it was probably just a harmless homeless man. I didn't tell them that he lived across the street because I thought they'd accuse me of overreacting. Quote unquote, he was just walking home, not following you or watching you. End quote. They couldn't find a security system and told us that it was the fire alarm that had gone off, but they couldn't figure out why. After checking the house and finding no one, they left. I emailed the owners the next day to tell them what happened, and that we had called the police to come check it out. They apologized that it happened, and thought it was strange. I left the next day and politely declined house sitting for them when they asked again a few months later. We moved out of the city and across the country last summer. My boyfriend only recently told me that he and my dad, who had come up to help us move, had seen Gauntman walking across the street from our apartment and that last week before we moved. So Gauntman, even if you weren't stalking and watching me, Let's not ever meet again. A couple years ago, one of my closest friends relocated cross country with his long term girlfriend to a work job he couldn't refuse. Only issue he had was that he did not want to fly his dogs out with them when they made the move since they'd be staying in a hotel for the first month. He was also a bit reticent to fly them out due to health concerns for both pets. By the time he located a home to rent, he was missing his dogs and made the request of his sister, another close friend, and myself to drive them to him in LA. Now we're Chicago folks, so the trip would be a long one, however. With the three of us to foot the near 30 hour drive, it would be a piece of cake. We left early and drove long hours. Along the way, it was decided between my friend and I that if we'd foot the majority of the drive ourselves, and if we needed to, we'd let our friend's sister do some driving. We were on a bit of a time crunch due to a snafu with the rental agreement, so we didn't have the luxury to stop very often past an 8 hour stay at a Denver LA Quinta Inn. As for the journey itself, it was relatively smooth, Baron getting pulled over right before entering Utah for driving for 2 miles in the left lane of an empty highway. Whoops. From that point, we made it through Utah, Arizona, and Nevada without much trouble until we entered California in need of gas. I had been driving for the majority of the first day and tagged my buddy in after being pulled over. I remained in the shotgun seat as navigator, searching through the GPS for a fuel stop. We kept our eyes peeled for road signs and discovered a sign pointing to Yermo Ghost Town or something along those lines, which had a mobile station. How wonderful. It was convenient too, as it was located almost directly off of the interstate. We rolled in on a little more than fumes when we approached the pumps. Normally, we let the dogs out at every rest stop, but having stopped not long before then, and with both dogs sleeping snugly in the back, I decided to pump gas without anyone else leaving the vehicle. My buddy pulled us up on the opposite side of a beat up green sedan with a short, plump gentleman who just turned in to approach the shop. I noticed a few other hoopties at the pumps, all unoccupied, and there were a couple of other cars parked up near the station, most likely belonging to the employees, so nothing seemed out of the ordinary until I swiped my credit card. The pump rejected my first swipe attempt, which I chalked up to a misread. I swiped again, and the pump reads out, please see attendant. I was annoyed, but we needed gas. I tapped on the window and told my buddy what I was doing and asked if anyone needed anything. After taking their orders for Gatorade and Marlboro Reds, I walked up to the store and made a mental note of how strange this gas station was. Kinda quiet, especially for one right off the interstate, but that's no matter. As I walked in though, more weirdness. First thing I noticed is that there are some boxes of chips just left on the floor, like someone was stocking shelves and just quit. As I veered to my right, I noticed that immediately there is no one milling about in this place. With the six cars beside my own out there, I felt like I would see someone. Things got even weirder when I realized that there was no one behind the counter, no customers or workers. And then it dawned on me. What had happened to the gentleman who was at the pump adjacent to mine? Surely they can't all be in the bathroom. This is where I began to feel this gnawing cessation in my stomach. Something isn't right. I have always been a person who felt like I could trust my instincts, and those instincts were screaming at me just to get out of there. I want to run, but I hold back. I would look suspicious booking it out of a gas station that was empty and decide to just play it cool. Natural. 
Don't let your body language let on to how badly you're freaking out in your head. I was probably inside of this gas station for only a couple minutes when I left, but I stopped just before exiting to listen for something. Anything. A flushing toilet would have been a good sound, but nothing. As I exit the shop and see my car, I begin to feel dread. It's like that moment in a movie where the hero is about to make it to the end of their trial, but the celebratory fanfare disappears, and in that silence, something comes and strikes them down. I am about 25 yards from the car when I see this gentleman come out from around the side of the shop opposite of me. This is not the same man as I saw while pumping gas. He was larger and had a peculiar look on his face. The best way I could describe it, it was like Nick Cage's smile from Face Off before the titular act had occurred. I continued walking towards my car, but when I turned back to look at him, he was now walking towards me with a purpose. At this point, I noped my way back to the car with increased urgency in my step. And of course, my friend has the door to the car locked like a complete douche clown. There is also the 95 pound golden retriever sitting in my seat. Apparently, my travel companions did not notice how freaked out I was, or the creepy gentleman still walking in my direction. I punched the window and told him to unlock the door, to which he only half rolls down the window to tell me the dog was in my seat and they were afraid she'd jump out when I opened the door. I reached my hand in and threw the dog towards the back seat as hard as I could while my friend is just now realizing how freaked out I am. He started the car and drove off quickly. I took one last look back and saw the guy had stopped about a pump away from where we were, still with that same look on his face. We found another gas station further down the road, this time with a ton of people inside and out. After thoroughly creeping out my friends with the story as I pumped gas, we made our way back to the interstate, which meant passing that gas station again. It's been about 15 minutes since we pulled out initially, and we go silent as we notice that those very same cars are still sitting in the same spots where we had left them. After thoroughly freaking out for a few miles, I received a phone call from my credit card company about a $100 charge at a mobile station. The lady on the phone was really helpful in fixing the situation for me and was as entirely creeped out by the situation as we were. In the end, we made it to LA and had a great vacation, but it still bothers me as to what was going on at this little gas station off the highway and what was that smiling man story. So, crazy smiling man and whoever else was lying in wait at the Yermo Ghost Town exit mobile station, let's not meet. I lived in New Mexico for several years before moving to the Midwest. My friend, Amy, and I, both females, would spend many days exploring the remote corners of the New Mexico, discovering abandoned ghost towns and enjoying the quiet, desolate beauty of the desert. One afternoon in March 2010, we were traveling from Ruidoso to Albuquerque. Always up for exploring, we took a back road rather than traveling the more direct highway. One leg of our journey had us on NM55. It's a remote, teeny tiny two-lane highway. We loved those types of roads, up until that day. This part of New Mexico's flat and desolate desert, you can see for miles, and there's virtually nothing except dirt and rock between towns, and towns can be miles apart. So we were on NM55 going north. After a few minutes, we saw a white pickup truck up ahead of us, going the same direction. Suddenly, he stopped his truck sideways in the middle of the highway, blocking both lanes. We were about a mile away from him and as we got closer, we began to get uneasy. We could see no reason for him to do this. We were the only other vehicle out there and we began wondering if we should turn around rather than come up to him and have to stop. We were about a half a mile away from him when he pulled over to the opposite side of the highway but his truck was still pointed the direction we were going. We tried to relax a little. Surely, this guy was a rancher or something. Maybe he was checking something on his land. As we passed him, we noticed a few things. One, there was only one person in the truck, a middle-aged guy who never took his eyes off us, and two, he was talking into a walkie-talkie. A few seconds after we passed him, he pulled back onto the highway and started following us, but he never got too close. He would get to within a few car lengths and then drop back a little and then speed back up again to within a few car lengths. We were getting nervous. We realized how alone we really were. We had seen no other traffic on that road and we hadn't told anyone about our great idea to take this detour. We checked our cell phones and neither one had signal. Typical for remote New Mexico, but scary given our present situation. Amy was driving and speeding up while I frantically checked the map, hoping to find a road that would have more traffic. There was no other road. We had to travel this one to get to the next town, Mountain Air. Turning around to go back the other way didn't seem like a good option. After a few minutes, we saw another pickup truck coming towards us. He was going very, very slowly, maybe 20 miles per hour, if that. This pickup was old and beat up, whereas the one that was behind us was newer. Amy had us up to 75 miles per hour, which wasn't typical for us on these 55 mile per hour highways, and we blew by the old pickup. 
As we passed it, we saw that it was another middle-aged guy, and he was talking into a walkie-talkie. After the white pickup passed him, he pulled a U-turn and pulled in behind it. As we watched all of this, we could see the white pickup truck guy talking into his walkie-talkie. No doubt these two knew each other. We were being deliberately followed, and for the first and only time in my life, I felt hunted. They stayed right behind us. We watched for obstacles in the road. We truly thought old beat up pickup guy had set up a trap in the road and our vehicle would be disabled somehow. We talked about driving into the fields, we were in an SUV, but this was obviously their territory and we were afraid of what would happen if we went off road and got cornered. So we stayed on the highway. By now, white pickup truck guy was right on top of us. We could see him talking into the walkie talkie and he stayed right on our bumper. And old beat up pickup truck guy was right on top of him. The three of us sped down the highway. The white pickup inched closer. His maneuvering and edging closer made it apparent that he was trying to bump us. I watched helplessly as he got to within inches of our back bumper. Amy floored it. We were passing 80 miles per hour and edging up to 90. The road was flat and deserted, but any little thing going wrong would have been catastrophic. We absolutely were not going to slow down or stop if we could help it. The white pickup pulled into the opposite lane and started to gain speed. The only thing we could think of was that he wanted to pass us and get in front of us. If he got in front of us and his buddy was behind us, then we'd be boxed in and trapped. We looked frantically at the rocky desert on both sides of us. Our only option was to off-road it. As we topped a small incline, we saw a sign that said Salinas Pueblo Missions National Monument, and it pointed towards a road on the left. And right at that moment, a blue pickup truck pulled out of the road and onto the highway in front of us. As we came up on the blue pickup, we saw the plate said US Park Service. We looked at each other and then looked behind us. Both pickup trucks did U-turns and went the other way. We followed the blue pickup to Mountain Air and then made our way to Albuquerque. I don't know exactly what those guys' intentions were, but they weren't good. There is something seriously wrong out there. I notified the state police and they said they would keep an eye on things. So let's not ever meet, or have anyone else ever meet, these guys. This story occurred roughly 14 years ago, when I was 12 years old and living in east side of an Australian rainforest. When I say rainforest, our house was on a 40 acre property surrounded by bush. The house itself was owned by a Swiss man named Hans. Occasionally, he would come down with his tractor and slash the long grass surrounding our house so we could access slightly more of the property in the summer. We lived about a 40 minute drive from the small town center. This meant that if we needed groceries, medical attention, or to contact our parents, say while we were at school, it would be a 40 minute drive before anything could be done. The house sat on the side of a large mountain, roughly three fourths of the way up so naturally most of the land we called home was strewn with valleys, nooks and hideaways. We had trails we could walk and they led to a stream and a small waterfall. It was a truly beautiful place but considerably scary to me and my small siblings, one brother and one sister slightly younger than me. We knew our neighbors on both sides of the property. But because of the location of our house was pretty remote, our nearest neighbors were roughly a 10 minute drive away. One was a lovely old lady who used to wave to us when we got off the school bus before we made the trek to our house every day. I think our parents asked for her to keep an eye on us. The other was a middle aged man and his family. He was a real jerk who excavated around the bottom border where our properties met and continuously interrupted the stream and waterfall's clear flowing water supply. Lots of strange and creepy stuff happens when you're living in the middle of nowhere but one in particular involved a guy I certainly don't want to meet again. Being pretty removed from people, it was extremely rare that we ever got visitors we didn't know were coming. When people we didn't recognize turned up, it was usually because they were lost and needed directions. One day though, a man in a car came roaring down our driveway. I remember running inside to tell my dad someone weird was here. He immediately walked outside to see who this unwanted guest was. My dad goes outside to see what all the commotion is about while my mom keeps us inside being protective. The man has a large red fur dog in the back of his car that looks like a German Shepherd cross. It snarled at my dad but immediately cowered when this stranger told it to shut up. Our own dog named Millie was snarling and going ballistic while speed chained up to the house. Hi, my name is John. The way the man spoke was like he was a salesman, a really slick and smooth guy who on the outside seemed friendly but with the overtone of wanting something. My dad immediately responded with, So what are you doing out here then, John? The man was taken aback, obviously not used to dealing with someone as hostile as my dad. They then talked for a while and I could hear my dad talking with a sense of confusion about whatever this man had to say. I did however overhear my dad say, What are you thinking? Just call the cops. I found out later that the lovely old lady next to us had died. 
Apparently John was on the other side of her property and went to visit and found her dead. He also asked my dad if they should move the body to make it easier for police to investigate. This is obviously why my dad was telling the man to call the police immediately. Anyway, later that night the police showed up to take a statement from my dad and John, who was hanging around our house until the police arrived. I remember my dad pulling an officer aside and explaining that John wanted to move the body when he first arrived. The police left without any more questions as it looked like she had died from natural causes. John was still at our house. I found him to be a very unsettling person. The way he smiled, the dark of his eyes. He was unfamiliar, but acting like he was one of us. I remember it was a school night and I was trying to watch TV and he was playing songs on his guitar with my mom and my dad at the table. I was angry because he was ruining my shows and I told my mom I wanted him to go and I thought he was weird. She smiled and told me she felt the same and told me I should go to bed. The next day things seemed normal. Went to school, came home. Not seeing the familiar friendly face of the old woman stung a bit on my way past her house. It felt strange and I hoped that she knew her family loved her before she passed. I was a bit sad on the walk home. Until halfway down the driveway, I noticed John's car again and parked out the front of our house. I walked closer and was greeted by his dog, Rusty. He walked outside with my dad and I heard him call Rusty to his car as he was leaving. Apparently he was borrowing tools from my dad. He left and waved goodbye like he was someone that I was going to miss. Again, that sense of overfamiliarity made me feel uncomfortable. I didn't know this man. I didn't like this man and I was hoping he would never come down to our driveway again. My dad then pulled me aside and asked me what I thought of John. I labeled him a weirdo and told my dad I was hoping he wouldn't come back. For the second night in a row, when John returned dad's tools, he was sitting in our house playing guitar and annoying everyone. My mom and my dad were visibly unimpressed by the situation. I heard my mom and dad argue about him hanging around until eventually my dad told him he needed to leave as it was time for us to go to bed. He insisted it was early and tried to make an excuse to stay. I found that very odd. I was polite enough to know when someone didn't want me around so why didn't this man? Or if he did know, why wouldn't he leave? After ushering him out, my mom and my dad had a big talk in their room and my dad told us all that he didn't like John and that he was going to ask him not to come over anymore and if we saw John again, immediately to tell him. The next day was a Saturday so we were going to blow up our cheap inflatable pool and go for a swim as it was getting pretty warm. Around 11 a.m., the sound of a car thundering down the driveway alerts me and I go outside. I run back inside to tell my dad that John is back. Just like the first time I ever laid eyes on John, my dad goes outside and we stay inside with my mom, watching and listening through a screen door. John again with his weird, overfamiliar smile and dark eyes greets my dad and is met with, Look, I don't know who you are, but I don't want you coming around here anymore. You scare my kids and my wife and I don't want you to come back. You understand? I didn't hear John's reply from his tone, but it sounded like he was confused and tried to reason with my dad. My dad wasn't having it and told him to go or he would call the cops. As he was leaving, my dad said, don't come back or you'll be sorry. This is where things truly get weird. As my dad lays this subtle threat on the man, his face completely changes one of rage. He glares at us in the house, sticks up his finger and speeds out of the driveway shouting profanities and churning up gravel, spraying it towards our house. My dad came back and told us we wouldn't be seeing John anymore, and if we did, we were going to call the police. I was relieved. This odd man made me feel uncomfortable in my own home, and the way he reacted when he left confirmed the feeling I got from him when I first saw him. I can't remember if it was the Sunday or the Monday after that day, but John did come back. He tried to reason with my dad and say sorry for whatever caused us to not like him. Before he even got out of his car, my dad said, if you don't turn around and leave, I'm going to smash your face in. He did just that. My dad then called the police to inform them of what happened. Apparently they were going to go and talk to John. I didn't hear any more of what happened to that conversation. A few weeks went by with no sightings or happening with John and we all felt like things were back to normal. This was until our mailbox had been tipped out of the ground and smashed, or possibly run over. I remember asking my dad what happened but he wasn't about to give me any ideas. He later told me that he knew it was John after the way their last conversation ended. The next weekend after the mailbox incident, we went into town to get groceries and a fast food dinner as a bit of a treat, and when we came home down the driveway, my dad immediately stopped my mom from proceeding and said that something was wrong. Next to the carport where we parked our car at the back of the house, there was a window that opened to the bathroom. My dad must have spotted the window was missing. As we drove down, he got increasingly more tense until we all noticed the window was missing. I remember being confused in the backseat and not really knowing what was going on until I saw it. 
A man, dark eyes, and overfamiliar coming from the window that led to the shower. My dad was exploding with rage and he told my mom to rush down the driveway. The man proceeded to escape the window and run down the back of our property into thick shrubbery. My dad only being on one leg, let Millie loose as she was going ballistic tied up to the house. She raced down the grass engulfed hill into the darkness. She came back with nothing. My dad went out with his flashlight and couldn't find anything either. I'm not sure if anyone slept that night. None of our possessions have been stolen or even moved. We must have caught this man just as he was entering our house. The police came the next day and searched for fingerprints with no avail. My father was furious and again alerted them to John and his strange behavior. They told us they would look into it once again. That was the last time we heard from John that year. I had almost completely forgotten about him and had the summer off to enjoy myself and get ready for high school. The school I went to was pretty large considering where we were but everyone seemed to know each other pretty well, including the teaching staff. Within my first week at the school, we were introduced to all the teachers and teacher aides. I was caught completely unaware when that overfamiliar, dark-eyed man from the previous year was introduced as a teacher aide. Except instead of John, he was introduced as Gregory something. I went into a little bit of a spin as I was trying to make sense of all of it. I was 100% sure that this man named Greg something was the same man who had introduced himself to my family as John. At that moment, so many things rushed into my head. What if he killed the old lady? What if he didn't live close by? What if he wanted to move the body so he could frame my dad? If he lied about something as critical as his name, what else was he lying about? What if police never even made contact with him? I was sitting there for a good 10 minutes trying to piece it together until the teacher called my name to bring me back to reality. That is when he noticed me. The look on his face when he saw mine was one I'll never forget. He immediately recognized me. He looked shocked. His eyes were wide and he said nothing, just staring at me. I could sense that he was now the one feeling uncomfortable and on edge. Later that day, I rushed home to tell my dad who I had found. He was shocked and repeatedly asked if I was sure. He went to the school the next day and discovered the man had put in for an indefinite leave yesterday and may not return. When we learned of the news, my dad told me to watch out and let him know should John or Greg ever return. So John, Greg, whoever you are, let's not ever meet again. When I was 14, I was asked to babysit my three younger cousins, aged 8, 4, and 1 in an extremely rural mountainous part of Pennsylvania. My aunt and uncle had a wedding to go over to about an hour away and wouldn't be back until very late. Their house was situated on a steep mountainside. Their back deck had a 15 foot drop onto a rocky hill below leading down to a river. Their closest neighbors were about a half a mile away. The closest main road was a mile away and at night there were no lights to be seen anywhere around them. Basically it was in the middle of nowhere and you would have to know where you're going to get there. You don't just accidentally end up there. My aunt and uncle left us with some pizza and their cell phone number next to their landline. This was the early 2000s and I didn't have a cell phone, but even if I did, I wouldn't get reception there anyway, and headed out. The baby was already asleep. The four year old wasn't feeling well and was quietly watching TV in the living room as he dozed off, and the eight year old was playing guitar here with me up on the loft. The loft overlooked the living room to the left, where I could keep an eye on the four-year-old and there was a huge window that overlooked the driveway to the right. The description of the driveway is an important detail to the story. The road that led to their house ran straight into their forked driveway. It was a dead-end road. The house was as far as you could go. Go to the left driveway, there is a large open carport and that's where my aunt and uncle and anyone who ever visited parked. The right driveway led down a very short but very steep hill to a large leveled out area and ended against the garage door that opened to the basement of the house. It was never used as a garage, but served as my uncle's man cave, and where he spent most of his time. Right beside the garage door, a normal door with a window so you could see right in, but this driveway was exclusively used by the kids as a play area because it was the only flat, yard-like area on the property, and being on a mountainside, there isn't much room to safely play otherwise. No cars ever drove down there, ever. There are too many toys and bikes in the way, and friends and family knew this. It was about 10 p.m., pitch black outside, no moon to illuminate the area either. My cousin and I were still playing Guitar Hero when headlights caught the corner of my eye, and not my aunt's minivan headlights. Huge truck headlights with those roof lights you often see on jeeps or other off-road trucks. Not only that, the truck was going down the right driveway, the kids play area. This was not my aunt and uncle. This was not anyone they knew. Panic and dread filled my body. I was a small teenage girl, alone in an isolated house on a mountain at night with three children in my care. In a terrified voice, I asked my cousin, who is that Jake? Do you know whose truck that is? And then he looked panicked. No, I've never seen that truck before, he replied. 
I quickly ushered him downstairs, still unsure what to do, but the two little ones were sleeping down there and I wanted to make sure they were safe. I checked on the baby and then grabbed the phone to call 911, and then I started to hear the metal garage door being shaken violently. No one ever opened that garage door. More panic fills me. I hear them try the door beside it, the metal door knob jiggling. No one was actually knocking, it's not like they were checking to see if my uncle was down there. Plus, the lights were out. It was dark down there. They knew no one was down there. They were definitely breaking in. The door leading to the basement steps was right next to the phone, so I could clearly hear all this going on. I quickly turned the little lock on the doorknob, just in case they did make it into the basement. My heart was practically jumping out of my chest. I'm talking to the 911 dispatcher as my 8 year old cousin clings to my arm. The operator is calm and trying to call me, but I knew it would be at least 30 minutes until a police officer could get up there. Assuming they didn't get totally lost on this mountainside in the pitch dark, I just kept thinking, we are dead, this is how I die. The operator asked for the number my aunt and uncle left me so she could have another dispatcher call them to let them know the situation. I turn around to grab the paper with the number on it and to my absolute horror, I see a man peering in a large sliding glass door. A huge, burly, but what had to been a 6 foot 4 man with long scraggly red hair and a big red bushy beard, and what made it worse, he was grinning at me. Grinning in a way that still scares me to this day. Meanwhile, I had to have looked like a terrified deer in the headlights. I was shaking so hard I could barely hold the phone. There was a second man behind him I couldn't see as well. I have no idea what he looked like, but he was equally as tall but a bit more lanky than the larger man at the sliding glass door. I screamed, oh god they're here, and before the 911 operator could say anything, my 8 year old cousin goes, Mr. Jim? His voice was very confused. It wasn't like my cousin was happy or even relieved to see him. I asked, do you know who that is? But before my cousin can answer, I turned my attention to the man in the door. I'm on the phone with the police, I shouted. I'm grateful he didn't try that door, because I do not think it was locked. The man stared at me hard for a moment, eyebrows furrowed, like deciding what he wanted to do next. But he then just backed away into the darkness. What seemed like an eternity later, I saw the truck lights back up out of the driveway and then back down the road until they disappeared. I was still really scared, and so was my cousin. He had only met that guy a few times, an acquaintance of his dad. It wasn't like it was a close family friend, and obviously, because again, he went down the wrong driveway. Visitors never go down that way. The 911 operator asked for a description of the man, then told me they'd gotten in touch with my aunt and uncle and they were on their way home. She stayed on the phone with me until the police officer showed up a bit later to make sure that the men were gone and they stayed with us until my aunt and uncle got home so they could ask them some questions. My uncle was furious, not at me for calling them home early but at this Mr. Jim guy. My aunt was mad at my uncle and told him to tell Jim to never come back. I didn't know at the time, but my uncle had a drug problem. I don't know what Mr. Jim or his accomplice were doing, or what they would have done if I wasn't on the phone with the police, but that grin was not a friendly one. It was sinister. And again, he also had to have known my uncle was not there, because the basement was dark. He would have seen through the windowed basement door. He had also tried lifting the garage door, something not even my uncle did. He intended to break into the basement, that much is clear to me. There is no other explanation. I never did babysit for them again, and I don't think I ever even went back up there because not long after, my aunt divorced my uncle and moved out. So Mr. Jim, the grinning mountain man who tried to break into the house where I was babysitting, let's not meet again. A few years back, my girlfriend and I, having hiked several other parts of the Appalachian Trail, decided we wanted to give the southern portion of Virginia's trail a shot. It is about 166 miles long, it runs through George Washington and Jefferson National Forest from Roanoke County to Parisburg and Gills County. This is definitely one of the more remote and less traveled parts of the trail, which is exactly what we were looking for. We gathered our gear and made our way to the start of the Virginia Creeper Trail to begin our journey. We had planned our journey to end at Damascus and figured that by the time we got there, we would be more than ready to get home to our own beds. It was early October and the changing of the leaves and colors were amazing. The air was crisp and cool, perfect hiking weather with beautiful scenery. The majority of the trip was pretty uneventful, just your typical hike, but our last couple of nights is where things got weird. On this portion of the trail, you are supposed to camp on the trail or a designated shelter. We didn't really want to run into other people and didn't want anyone coming up on us in the middle of the night. We decided to ignore those suggestions and find our own little spot off the trail. A little searching around and we found a spot a little ways off the trail in the middle of a small clearing. It was perfect. We set up camp, cooked some food, talked for a while, then snuggled up and went to sleep for the night. Somewhere around 2am, I was awoke by my girlfriend shaking me awake telling me, Get your gun, someone is outside walking around our tent. 
She informed me that she woke up to what sounded like someone right outside the tent, running a knife or something along the side while circling us. When hiking, I carry a 1911 with me. You never know exactly who or what you might run into when on such a long hike in a remote location. I got the 1911 out of my pack, and then we sat silently, listening for any sounds. A few minutes of nothing, but the breeze blowing through the trees, and then I heard branches snapping. It sounded like it was a bipedal, based on the way the steps were paced. I turned on the flashlight and flooded the area with light. I thought I saw someone move behind a tree. I yelled out and told them to go away and that I was armed. I kept the light on the area with my gun drawn and slowly approached towards the area where I thought I saw the figure. Then, from my right, I hear what sounds like someone running away through the woods. I spin and face my light that way, and then from the original spot, hear who or whatever was there take off into the woods. There's no way I'm giving chase, so I return to the campsite. I tell my girlfriend about what happened, and I end up sitting guard outside the tent, in the darkness until daybreak. In the morning, I looked around a bit for signs of who or whatever it was, and I discovered a boot print in some soft, moist dirt not far from our tent. It wasn't mine, and it wasn't my girl's. This freaked me out as it confirmed that someone, perhaps more than one, was skulking around our tent in the dark. I kept it to myself because I didn't want to freak my girl out any more than she already was. At this point, we were pretty deep in and still had two days left. That day we walked a little faster than normal and covered as much ground as possible. When it came time to set up camp, I found a spot near a cliff where we could place the tent in a small overhang and prevent anyone from coming up behind us. The whole day up to this point, I had a feeling we were being followed. I had no confirmation of this as I hadn't seen or heard anyone else, but it was just a gut feeling. We set up camp and made some food, then retreated to the tent. I assured my girl that if I slept at all, it would be with one eye open. After a while, she drifted off to sleep and I stayed awake listening to the sounds of the woods at night. I was awake for a few hours, just waiting to see if anything was going to happen. At some point, I guess my exhaustion caught up with me and I drifted off. I woke sometime later to what sounded like someone going through our stuff outside the tent. I grabbed my gun and woke my girlfriend, shushing her to be quiet. From that faint glow of the fire, I could see someone's silhouette against the tent. There was really someone out there. I yelled out to them something along the lines of, We are armed, get out of here. They dropped what they were doing and bolted. I came out of the tent, gun drawn and ready to shoot someone. Our stuff was strewn all about. They had rummaged through quite a bit of our stuff. I walked to the edge of the woods in the direction of whoever was out there had fled. There was a creek nearby and I walked to the edge, where there was a small trail running alongside it. Down the creek I could see a light. It looked like a lantern the way it flickered. Then I saw three more emerge from the other side of the woods. I told my girlfriend to start packing up whatever she could and that we are leaving now. We packed up everything of value, left the tent and a few other items and headed back onto the trail, in the middle of the night. I kept hearing people talking off in the woods and hearing branches snap from quite some ways. I kept looking behind us every few seconds to make sure nobody was coming up behind us. It was completely nerve wracking. If something happened, we were still a long ways from anywhere and quite literally on our own. Since we hadn't seen another hiker the entire time we had been out there, I really felt we were in serious danger. We had been walking for quite some time when I heard something in the woods behind us. As we rounded a corner, I turned around and saw someone step out onto the trail and just stand there watching us. It was just as the sun was coming up and barely any light. I couldn't make out any features, just the silhouette. I stopped and looked at them for a second and asked them who they were and what they wanted. They just stood there silently, watching us and then turned and walked back into the woods. We picked up the pace and kept going, looking back every so often. We didn't see them again, but my gut told me they were still there for quite a ways. We eventually reached the end of the trail and got to where we had parked my girlfriend's car, extremely exhausted. We made it out of the Virginia woods without becoming a meal for some group of people of whatever knows what. I have no idea who they were or what they wanted. Maybe it was just someone messing with us, I don't know. But I'll never know because I will never be returning to find out. This happened over a decade ago, somewhere in northern Michigan during the summer. My friend Kathy, my boyfriend's half-sister May, and I drove down from our hometown to visit friends, and we were on our way back home in Kathy's bad little car. By bad, I'm talking this thing had engine problems, overheating problems, ignition problems, it was constantly falling apart. More than once, it had stalled or just stopped working in the middle of the street while we were trying to get somewhere, but Kathy thought we'd be fine since we hadn't had any problems with it on the way to our friend's house. It's a little past midnight and we're roughly an hour away from home. There's nobody on the road, dense woods on every side, no street lights, no moon. I can barely see past the windshield because I have a form of albinism, which leaves me legally blind in my left eye and with really awful vision in my right eye. My death perception is terrible, and I can't see more than a few feet ahead of me at most, 
but usually I can make out lights and other cars when they pass, and sometimes street signs and people when they are close enough. We drove down this narrow, hilly road, and on the descent down a hill, the car makes a strange sound. Kathy starts braking, and we get to the bottom of the hill. The car quits working. Kathy swears and turns on the hazard lights. She and I get out of the vehicle and help pop the hood, which causes a bunch of smoke to fly out. After the smoke mostly clears, Kathy tries to figure out what went wrong this time. We stand in the dark for at least 45 minutes, maybe longer, before we realize she couldn't fix the car and needed a tow truck. These were the days of the MapQuest printouts and brick phones, so we couldn't whip out our smartphone and look up the closest tow truck. I decided to call my boyfriend Caleb to come pick us up and suggest we come with a tow truck to pick up the car when it was daylight. May and Kathy agree, so I take out my cruddy Nokia and called my boyfriend. It's then I realize, no service. I ask May and Kathy if either of them have service, they both check and shake their heads. May gets a bit panicky, and we all hold our phones up, trying to get a signal to no avail. It's really hot, and after failing to get any kind of service, we are all feeling a bit spooked and uncomfortable. May begs us to do something because she is more afraid than Kathy and I. Kathy attempts to call May down, and I wonder if the thick woods and hills are blocking out our reception. I tell May and Kathy to wait by the car, and walk away from them up the hill we had just come down, holding my phone out. Still no signal. I walk further and further away until I reach the top of the hill. I can't see the outline of our car anymore, but I can still hear May at a distance. Even at the top of the hill, I don't get a signal. I know it's gotta be the trees in the way, so I get the idea of climbing up a tree and calling from there just to see if it works. In hindsight, this was not my brightest idea, but me being an idiot. I saunter off into the woods in search of a climbable tree. At this point, I just want to go home, and this is the only thing on my mind. I find a nice tree with low branches and lift my body upwards towards the trunk. I climb the branches higher and higher, and about midway up the tree, I feel my pack of cigarettes fall out of my shorts pocket. I'm kind of annoyed, but figured I can just look for them when I climb back down. I take my phone out and hold it up once I get near the top. I have service. Relieved, I call Caleb, but he doesn't pick up, so I call again until he does. He answers in a sleepy, but pissed voice, but I'm having none of that and simply explain our situation. He asks where we are, and I give him the name of the road and my best guess as to how far along we are on it. He says he will be on his way and tells me to go back and wait with May and Kathy, then he yells at me for being stupid and climbing a tree in the dark with my bad depth perception. I assure him that I'm fine, he's skeptical but says okay, and we hang up. I start climbing down the tree, but my hand touches a big glob of sap, so I stop and try to wipe the sticky goop off of my shirt. I'm already sweaty and gross, so I'm not too happy about the sap. While I'm failing at getting rid of this crud off my hands, I hear the strangest sound from somewhere below me. Swish, swish, swish. I completely freeze, not being able to place what the sound is, but it's moving pretty fast. I stare down into the darkness below me, but can't see anything. Just hear this noise continuing. It comes closer and closer, and then I hear it right below my tree. Swish. And then it stops, right under my tree. I hold onto the branches as tight as I can and wait. I hear leaves shuffling and twigs snapping, and after a while that stops, and the weird noise starts again, but it's heading away from me deeper into the woods. I wait until I can no longer hear the sound, then finish climbing down and jump out of the tree. It's completely silent now, besides the sounds of the woods, so I grew up around on the ground for my cigarettes. I don't find them, so I make my way out of the woods and back towards the road. I jog down the hill, and when I reach the bottom, I notice May and Kathy are not standing outside the car anymore, and the hazard lights are off. I walk over to the car, and May rolls on the window a little bit, and whispers in a panicked voice, Elizabeth, where were you? I point back over my shoulder towards the hill, and started to explain that I called her brother, but Kathy yelled, what are you doing? Get back in the car. I give them a weird look, but Maya unlocks and opens the door and I crawl into the back seat with her, slamming it behind me. Kathy slams the locks and double checks them while May rolls up the window and makes sure the rest are rolled up. One of the windows has never closed all the way, but there's less than a finger space, so it's not too big of a deal, but May's freaking out about it and Kathy has lost her cool as well. I am still confused and ask what the heck is going on. Maya tells me that a bit after I went up the hill, some weird person came out of the woods and ran really funny up the hill in the direction I went. They got freaked out and turned the lights off and got in the car. They thought he had got me. I am honestly scared at this point because if I hadn't stopped to wipe sap off my hands, I most likely would have got out of the tree at the time I heard the weird noise. I just knew it was that person. I tell them my story and everybody in the car is super scared, but are relieved that Caleb is on his way. We only have to play the waiting game now. We sit on the road for what seems like forever. The dread we were feeling made time seem like it was going slower than normal. Kathy and May are looking out the windows, surveying the area, and I'm just sitting there hoping Caleb will hurry up and come rescue us. 
Suddenly, I hear May whine, what is that, and she starts crying. Kathy snaps her head to where May is looking and stifles a gasp. I look where they are facing, I see nothing but the dark. But then I hear it through the small opening in the window. Swish, swish, swish. May ducks down, as though doing that will make her invisible, and Kathy hides her head behind the steering wheel. I follow their lead and sort of hunch down at my seat, but the noise comes straight up to the window. I can almost make out the silhouette of a tall, skinny man, and then he presses his face against May's window, and I finally see him. Nobody screams. You'd think we would, but it didn't happen. We all just stared at each other. He looks in at us for a while until Kathy switches her brights on hoping it would scare him off, but it did nothing. The dude just walked to the front of the car and stood in front of the headlights. Maybe he thought he could block us from leaving? I don't know. I couldn't make out his features very well, but the guy had to be somewhere a bit over 6 feet and no older than 30 years old. He had the face of your average Joe, nothing special. Nothing really sinister or particularly creepy that you notice about him if you run into this dude in broad daylight. Dark shaved hair, pale skin, long face. May said he had light colored eyes and stubble with eyebrows that made him look like he was always concerned, but there was no way I could make that out, so I had to take her word for it. What was really weird was it was like 80 degrees, and this dude was wearing corduroys, which is what the sound was, corduroys making that swishy sound when you walk, and an oversized sweater with abnormally long sleeves. The sleeves went over his hands and flopped back and forth as he paced around in front of the car. I'm not sure how long he was in front of the car, but it was a while. Then good old corduroy starts doing something really bizarre. He bends his arms up towards his face, which I can only describe as looking like a praying mantis because of the way his sleeves were hanging, and then he begins walking circles around the car, rhythmically taking two steps forward, one step back like Willy Wonka but on speed or something. This is where I noticed the swish sound matched up exactly to the same sound I heard when I was back in the tree. He was doing the two steps forward, one step back in the woods, when he was going after me, as though this wasn't weird enough. By now, May was sobbing and Kathy seemed like she had to vomit, so I felt like I had to be the brave one. I looked at the slight space in the open window, and when he orbited his way over there, I said, hey man, can you just stop? You're really freaking us out. Quarter Ward definitely had heard me, so he switched to a halt and looked back into the car through the windshield, straight at me. I asked him very firmly to leave, and he took an extended pause, smiled, then Willy Wonka his way out of my line of vision into the darkness. After a while, Kathy said he disappeared into the woods, and May was like, I can't believe that worked. We awkwardly laughed about what a weirdo he was and glad he left and whatever, and we went back to waiting for Caleb, somewhat reassured but still paranoid. But after some time, Kathy said, oh no, he's back. I couldn't see, but apparently he was doing this two steps forward, one step back parallel to us on the side of the road, and this time he had a big tree branch he was holding with his sweater covered hands. May got scared again, and I held her hand so she'd feel better about it, even though I was ready to piss myself. It was awful, because I didn't know if he was coming towards us, or if he was moving away, or whatever he was up to. It was kinda like when you knew there was gonna be a jump scare in a horror movie. Then I hear Corduroy switch back towards the Geo and on my window. He smacks it with the tree branch. May and I panic, and I scoot as close to her as possible. They see the dude back up into the woods, then come running back and slamming the branch back into my window, like he's jousty with no horse. Thankfully, the window didn't break. But it got terrifying hearing swish, 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 clonk after a while, and he did this repetitively. Kathy perks up in her seat and starts pointing at the road ahead. I see headlights. She blares the horn and flashes the lights. Lo and behold, it's our savior, Caleb. He brought his older brother, Alex, and they both get out of his car and head over to us. May's sobs turn into joyous laughter as her brothers approach. Now, Caleb and Alex have always been tall guys. Walking around with them was like walking around with high elves. It felt very safe. Caleb was 6 foot 8 and Alex is around 6 foot 5, so I thought two dudes taller than the corduroy jouster would make him leave, but nope. Caleb walks towards corduroy, trying to assess the situation, and Alex comes over to the car and taps on the window, tells Kathy to get out. She does and he walks over to his car, then he comes back and puts the car in neutral so he can push it off to the side of the road. May and I slowly get out and May makes a bolt for her brother's car. I help Alex push the car to the side while Caleb distracts the corduroy jouster by holding the end of his stick and telling him to go away. Corduroy yanks the branch away from Caleb and starts backing up by going two steps backward, one step forward, and disappears into the darkness down the street. I can't see him, but Caleb can. The dude backs up pretty far and then comes launching at Caleb who sprints the other way down the road, cause that stick could have really hurt him. He bumps past Alex, who had already got out of the car and was opening his car door, leaving me behind the car alone. Corduroy apparently changed directions and aimed the stick at me, but I couldn't really tell. I just hear everybody shout, Elizabeth. This startles me, and I jump to the side of the car. 
hearing Corduroy smash a stick into the back window with a loud thud and a swish. I take the long way around the car and sprint off into the road and feel Caleb grab my arm and tug me over Alex's car. I feel the wind has been knocked out of me and my legs don't seem to work, but Caleb manages to shove me in the back seat and scrambles into the passenger side. By now we are all safely in the car and Corduroy is standing like a mantis in front of the headlights again. He'd abandoned his stick and just stood there with no intention to move. Alex puts the car into reverse and slams on the gas, making me knock my head against the door. Then makes the sloppiest U-turn ever and nearly drives us into the woods, but gets us back onto the road. Everybody was in 100% panic mode as Alex tore away, far over whatever the speed limit was. Me and Kathy swear they saw Corduroy chasing behind us after Alex made the U-turn, but there was no way he was catching up. The next day, I went back there with Caleb, Kathy, and the dude from the tow truck place. There was no sign of Corduroy anymore, but when we approached the car, we saw that in the space where the window didn't close all the way were my cigarettes. The box was missing, but they were all neatly jammed in a row along the window space. I have no doubt it was the work of the Corduroy jouster. To this day, I wonder if he knew I was up the tree and took my cigarettes, or if he thought I dropped them and went further into the woods to look for me, or if he just found them later and decided to stick them through the window, because he was weird. I also still wonder what his intentions were. I still have so many unanswered questions on that night. Several years ago, I was in a bit of a financial pickle. I was 21, with a bad job history, a bad job, and bad credit. My living situation went sideways, and I had temporarily moved back home with my folks. As anyone who has ever had to move back home as an adult will tell you, this was a terrible situation. I was a rush to get back out on my own, which is why when my best friend, similar position in life at the time, told me that an apartment had opened up at her shady complex, I had actually jumped at it. If you're from around here, then you'll know that every apartment complex in that town is kind of shady. But for those of you who are not here, this place is a shady, non-town outside of another non-town, with more liquor stores than any other establishment, and several apartment complexes with no credit checks and same-day move-ins. A couple of months went by, and while the cops did occasionally show up in our parking lot and you had to watch your step for more than one broken bottle, it wasn't the worst place to live. I worked the night shift at a large retailer, shuffling around freight in the back, hating every minute of every shift. So one night, while I trudged up and down a ladder like a zombie at work, my cell phone fell out of my back pocket at the top of the ladder. I grabbed at it, obviously missing, and died a little as I saw it smack the ground and go black. No amount of restarting or shaking could fix it. The LCD was completely shot. Well that's just great, I thought to myself, and decided this was a good enough reason to go home mid-shift. Remember that thing I said about bad job history? Yeah, you can clearly see why. Driving home, at 3am on some random weekday, I turned onto the dark back road that led to my apartment building. I saw something faintly up ahead, in the road, and immediately think it's someone's dog. I pulled up slower, praying that I wasn't coming up on someone's dead pet, and saw that there was actually a teenage boy laying on the side of the road waving. There was a bike laying in the dirt next to him. The kid saw me and jumped, weaving toward the driver's side of my car. Now, I may have made a lot of poor decisions at this point in my life, but thankfully, I hadn't gone completely brain dead. I locked the car doors, but cracked the driver's side window. Are you okay? What happened? Let me get some help. I got hit by a car. They left me. I need help. The kid looked dazed and was cuffed up, but something about him also set my nerves on edge. I'm going to call for help, okay? I grabbed up my cell phone and then remembered the thing was basically useless due to its ladder plunge. My cell phone was broke, but I live nearby there, okay? I will get help. I hope he didn't think I was lying, but then I didn't care. The kid slammed his hand against my car. Just let me in. I need help now. I promise. I will get help and come back. Everything will be okay. I felt torn. I wasn't going to let this kid into my car, but at the same time, I couldn't blame him. If I was scared and hurt, I would probably be frantic too. The kid slammed his hand against the car again, and I started driving. I hadn't been exaggerating. It was a 30 second drive to my apartment. I didn't have a landline and I didn't want to somehow lead this kid to my empty apartment with no way of calling for help. I saw my best friend's boyfriend's car parked in her spot and immediately was thankful for the shrug of luck. I ran up the steps to her apartment and began banging on the door. Roy answered the door, probably expecting a crazy person. It was immediately even more alarmed to see me. What is going on? Why aren't you at work? I breathlessly explained that some kid had been hit by a car off the back road but my cell isn't working, and that I needed him to come back with me. Melanie, my best friend, emerged from her room, sleepy and equally confused. Roy immediately took charge, told us both to get into the car, and drove us back to the boy. The kid was still there, waving us down. Roy, a large man, Mel, and myself all got out of the car. Help. I need help. I'm here to help. My friend saw you and came and got me, okay? Calm down. 
I got jumped by this gang man, they beat me up and stole my backpack and rode off. The kid said frantically. I immediately became alarmed. That's not what he told me at all. I looked at Mel, my face clouding over. I thought you got hit by a car. Why did the gang jump you? What? Yeah, they beat me up and then someone hit me with a car. Plausible. I was still confused though. Roy also seemed very wary of this change in the story. Listen man, let me call an ambulance, okay? Can you tell me your name? The kid lost it. He screwed his face up and clenched his fist, hitting the side of his head. No, 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 no. Just let me in the car, man. Just take me to your house. Roy was done. That's not happening, kid. I'll call an ambulance, and the police, and I can wait with you till they get here, but we can't bring you back with us. The kid slapped the side of his head some more, and then in the most disturbing thing I've ever seen, grabbed fistfuls of his shaggy hair and began pulling it out of his scalp. The sound is still the most disgusting and alarming thing I've ever heard. Roy gave Mel and I the, let's get out of here face, and we jumped back in the car. I'm calling the police, okay? I will tell them you've been hurt and you need an ambulance. Roy began dialing, and the kids started stomping around and screaming. Take me to your house, just let me get in the car, why won't you take me home? The kid stood in the street, blood trickling from where he'd torn up his scalp. Roy got back in the driver's seat and spoke with the cops as the kid raged outside. He then came to the window, staring so intently at us that I felt like my skin had shriveled up and fallen off. He began kicking the tires, and Roy, clearly over it, drove off. The kid grabbed me frantically at the back of the car. Roy drove past our return around Peters Creek twice to avoid leading the kid to the apartment complex, and then back down our road. The kid was gone. The bike, the kid, just gone. No idea where he took off to. Clumps of his hair were still on the road. We never saw the kid again. We searched the papers and internet to see if he'd been picked up, or if any other strange things had taken place that night, but nothing else ever showed up. What confuses me still about all of it is why he would demand to come back with all three of us. One person could obviously be easily overtaken, but what were his plans for all three of us? In the early 80s, when I was 8, my family was visiting my uncle who lived in Backwoods, Missouri. He lived on a lot of land, and the only other people who really even lived on the street were relatives, so no one else ever just happened to be there. This meant no one ever really locked their doors, because random family members were always coming by for this or that. One night, while we were all there, my parents and aunt and uncle decided to go to a nearby town to go bowling, because bowling. My brothers, who were 11 and 12, my female cousins, 6 and 14, and I'm female, stayed home. It was still daylight when the adults left, but it started raining pretty hard and got dark quickly. We used to play this game that was essentially hide and seek in the dark house, but we called it Vampire. There was a thin little mattress on the living room floor that some of the kids would sleep on at night, so the person who was it would lie on the mattress and fold it over themselves like a coffin and count down to midnight. When they got to midnight, they were looking for you, again, all the lights are off, and you try to make it back to the coffin before you got caught. Because the house was in the country, it was pitch black at night. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. What this meant for the game was that, one, you couldn't tell where the vampire was looking, so you just had to make a break for it, and two, if you were extremely lazy, and I'm sure by now you can guess which one of us met those standards, you could hide in the living room with the coffin and get to base quickly. Ben, my 11 year old brother was it and was doing the normal countdown. I was hiding maybe 6 feet from him. As he's counting, there was a flash of lightning. I don't know if I was already looking at the living room window or if the lightning made me look, but with the backlight of the lightning, I see a man with his face against the window. He had his hands on each side of his face as if he's trying to peer in and looks exactly like the stereotypical creepster, heavy set, scraggly beard, etc. I could feel every hair on my body standing on end. Immediately, I began trying to convince myself that I didn't see what I saw, but then Ben sternly whispered, if anyone is hiding in here, stay still. I sort of croaked out a, I'm here, right as there was another flash of lightning. Creepster was still there, but was no longer trying to look in the window. Instead, he was now looking toward the front door. Ben and I immediately knew what was coming next. From where he was standing, Creepster was probably only 5 feet from the front door. Ben was the same distance, but there was a couch between him and the door. Ben leapt over the couch and locked the door right as Creepster started trying the handle. At this point, I guess Ben decided that it was best to let the Creepster know that people were home and that we knew he was there, because he flipped on the porch light and then started turning on the lights in the house. This is going to sound weird, but I was too terrified to panic. Having said that, I was relying completely on Ben to know and tell me what to do. He told me to go lock the other doors and was yelling for everyone else to come out and to lock all the windows. Honestly, the next few minutes were hazy in my mind. I remember everything up until this point extremely clearly. Then I remember the end very clearly, but I'm less clear about the middle. I know that I locked the side door and then the sliding glass door in the back of the house. 
When we talked about it over the years, some people remember us seeing him out the back door as well. I don't think I remember that. What I clearly recall is locking the sliding glass door and standing there frozen and hearing Ben in a very calm but firm voice say, close the curtain, listen to me, okay? Close the curtain. So I did. Ben can't remember that part and I just remember my fear in Ben's voice. So I'm not sure if I saw the creepster in the backyard or not. We tried to call the police, but my aunt and uncle had a stupid party line and it wouldn't work. Either from the storm or from a neighbor leaving it off the hook or whatever. For the second, they are the only people I've ever known with a party line, so this wasn't normal to me either. But for those of you who don't know what that is, in really rural areas, multiple people on the street would actually share a phone line. It would have different rings for different households, but you could pick up on the phone and listen to your neighbor's conversation. We also tried to summon help on my uncle's CB radio, but couldn't reach anyone. My uncle was a hunter, so he had a gun rack full of rifles in his room, but my older cousin was on an out of town hunting trip and took them with him. All we could find was a BB gun that looked like a real rifle. I vividly remember Ben putting me on phone duty and Scott, my older brother, on CB duty, while he stood watch at the little square window on the front door with a BB gun. Maybe 30 minutes later, Ben said, he's back. He's coming up the driveway. The rest of us froze in fear, but Ben opened the front door and stepped out on the porch, pointed the gun and said, get out of here right now. Then we hear our cousin Kyle, who lived on the road a bit, say, you know that's a BB gun, right? Even though Kyle was only 15, I remember that we felt like we had been saved when he showed up. Kyle seemed really skeptical of our story, like we were playing a trick on him, even though we had no idea that he was coming, but he stayed with us until our parents came home. Honestly, I don't remember if we even told our parents what happened when they got home. There was definitely no police involvement though. We just went on with our trip, but we never played vampire again without some mention of that night. Alright, but that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But as always, have a nice day.